Section thirteen of Pamela or Virtue Rewarded. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pamela or Virtue Rewarded by Samuel Richardson. Section thirteen. This, my dear father and mother, is the issue of your poor Pamela's fruitless enterprise and who knows if i had got out at the back door whether i had been at all in a better case moneyless friendless as i am and in a strange place but blame not your poor daughter too much nay if ever you see this miserable scribble all bathed and blotted with my tears let your pity get the better of your reprehension but i know it will and i must leave off for the present for, oh, my strength and my will are at this time very far unequal to one another. But yet I will add that, though I should have praised God for my deliverance, had I been freed from my wicked keepers and my designing master, yet I have more abundant reason to praise him that I have been delivered from a worse enemy, myself. I will conclude my sad relation it seems mrs jukes awaked not till daybreak and not finding me in bed she called me and no answer being returned she relates that she got out of bed and ran to my closet and missing me searched under the bed and in another closet finding the chamber door as she had left it quite fast and the key as usual about her wrist for if i could have got out of the chamber door there were two or three passages and doors to them all double locked and barred to go through into the great garden so that to escape there was no way but out of the window and of that window because of the summer parlour under it for the other windows are a great way from the ground she says she was excessively frightened and instantly raised the swiss and the two maids who lay not far off and finding every door fast she said i must be carried away as st peter was out of prison by some angel it is a wonder she had not a worse thought she says she wept and wrung her hands and took on sadly running about like a mad woman little thinking i could have got out of the closet window between the iron bars and indeed i don't know whether i could do so again but at last finding that casement open they concluded it must be so and ran out into the garden and found my footsteps in the mould of the bed which i dropped down upon from the leads and so speeded away all of them that is to say mrs jukes colbrand and nan towards the back door to see if that was fast while the cook was sent to the out offices to raise the men and make them get horses ready to take each a several way to pursue me but it seems finding that door double locked and padlocked and the heel of my shoe and the broken bricks they verily concluded i was got away by some means over the wall and then they say mrs jukes seemed like a distracted woman till at last nan had the thought to go towards the pond and there seeing my coat and cap and handkerchief in the water cast almost to the banks by the agitation of the waves she thought it was me and screaming out ran to mrs jukes and said oh madam madam here's a piteous thing mrs pamela lies drowned in the pond thither they all ran and finding my clothes doubted not i was at the bottom and they all swiss among the rest beat their breasts and made most dismal lamentations and mrs jukes sent nan to the men to bid them get the dragnet ready and leave the horses and come to try to find the poor innocent as she it seems then called me beating her breast and lamenting my hard hap but most what would become of them and what account they should give to my master while every one was thus differently employed some weeping and wailing some running here and there nan came into the wood-house and there lay poor i so weak so low and dejected and withal so stiff with my bruises that i could not stir nor help myself to get upon my feet 
and I said with a low voice, for I could hardly speak, Mrs. Anne, Mrs. Anne, the creature was sadly frightened, but was taking up a billet to knock me on the head, believing I was some thief, as she said. But I cried out, Oh, Mrs. Anne, Mrs. Anne, help me for pity's sake, to Mrs. Jukes, for I cannot get up. Bless me, said she. What, you, madam? Why, our hearts are almost broken, and we were going to drag the pond for you, believing you had drowned yourself. Now, said she, you'll make us all alive again. And without helping me, she ran away to the pond, and brought all the crew to the wood-house. The wicked woman, as she entered, said, Where is she? Plague of her spells and her witchcrafts. She shall dearly repent of this trick, if my name be Jukes and coming to me took hold of my arm so roughly, and gave me such a pull as made me squeal out, my shoulder being bruised on that side, and drew me on my face. O oh, cruel creature, said I, if you knew what I have suffered, it would move you to pity me. Even Colbrand seemed to be concerned, and said, Fie, madam, fie, you see she's almost dead, you must not be so rough with her. The coachman Robin seemed to be sorry for me, too, and said with sobs, What a scene is here! Don't you see she is all bloody in her head, and cannot stir? Curse of her contrivance, said the horrid creature. She has frightened me out of my wits, I'm sure. How the devil came you here? Oh, said I, ask me now no questions, but let the maids carry me up to my prison, and there let me die decently and in peace for indeed I thought I could not live two hours. The still more inhuman tigress said, I suppose you want Mr. Williams to pray by you, don't you? Well, I'll send for my master this minute. Let him come and watch you himself for me, for there's no such thing as holding you, I'm sure. So the maids took me up between them and carried me to my chamber, and when the wretch saw how bad I was, she began a little to relent while every one wondered, at which I had neither strength nor inclination to tell them, how all this came to pass, which they imputed to sorcery and witchcraft. I was so weak, when I had got upstairs, that I fainted away with dejection, pain, and fatigue, and they undressed me and got me to bed, and Mrs. Jukes ordered Nan to bathe my shoulder and arm and ankle, with some old rum warmed, and they cut the hair a little from the back part of my head and washed that, for it was clotted with blood from a pretty long but not a deep gash, and put a family plaster upon it, for if this woman has any good quality it is, it seems, in a readiness and skill to manage in cases where sudden misfortunes happen in a family. After this I fell into a pretty sound and refreshing sleep, and lay till twelve o'clock tolerably easy, considering I was very feverish and aguishly inclined, and she took a deal of care to fit me to undergo more trials, which I had hoped would have been happily ended, but Providence did not see fit. She would make me rise about twelve, but I was so weak I could only sit up till the bed was made, and went into it again, and was, as they said, delirious some part of the afternoon, but having a tolerable night on Thursday, I was a good deal better on Friday, and on Saturday got up and ate a little spoon-meat, and my feverishness seemed to be gone, and I was so mended by evening that I begged her indulgence in my closet to be left to myself, which she consented to, it being double-barred the day before, and I assuring her that all my contrivances, as she called them, were at an end. But first she made me tell the whole story of my enterprise, which I did very faithfully, knowing now that nothing could stand me in any stead or contribute to my safety and escape. And she seemed full of wonder at my resolution, but told me frankly that I should have found it a hard matter to get quite off, for that she was provided with a warrant from my master, who is a justice of peace in this county as well as in the other, to get me apprehended if I had got away, on suspicion of wronging him, let me have been where I would. Oh, how deep laid are the mischiefs designed to fall on my devoted head! Surely, surely I cannot be worthy of all this contrivance, 
this too well shows me the truth of what was hinted to me formerly at the other house that my master swore he would have me oh preserve me heaven from being his in his own wicked sense of the adjuration i must add that now the woman sees me pick up so fast she uses me worse and has abridged me of paper all but one sheet which i am to show her written or unwritten on demand and has reduced me to one pen yet my hidden stores stand me instead but she is more and more snappish and cross and tauntingly calls me mrs williams and anything she thinks will vex me sunday afternoon mrs jukes has thought fit to give me an airing for three or four hours this afternoon and i am a good deal better and should be much more so if i knew for what i am reserved but health is a blessing hardly to be coveted in my circumstances since that but exposes me to the calamity i am in continual apprehensions of whereas a weak and sickly state might possibly move compassion for me oh how i dread the coming of this angry and incensed master though i am sure i have done him no harm just now we heard that he had liked to have been drowned in crossing the stream a few days ago in pursuing his game what is the matter that with all of his ill usage of me i cannot hate him to be sure i am not like other people he has certainly done enough to make me hate him but yet when i heard his danger which was very great i could not in my heart forbear rejoicing for his safety though his death would have ended my afflictions ungenerous master if you knew this you surely would not be so much my persecutor but for my late good lady's sake i must wish him well and oh what an angel would he be in my eyes yet if he would cease his attempts and reform well i hear by mrs jukes that john arnold is turned away being detected in writing to mr williams and that mr longman and mr jonathan the butler have incurred his displeasure for offering to speak in my behalf mrs jarvis too is in danger for all these three probably went together to beg in my favour for now it is known where i am mrs jukes has with the news about my master received a letter but she says the contents are too bad for me to know they must be bad indeed if they be worse than what i have already known just now the horrid creature tells me as a secret that she has reason to think he has found out a way to satisfy my scruples it is by marrying me to this dreadful coal-brand and buying me of him on the wedding-day for a sum of money was ever the like heard she says it will be my duty to obey my husband and that mr williams will be forced as a punishment to marry us and that when my master has paid for me and i am surrendered up the swiss is to go home again with the money to his former wife and children for she says it is the custom of those people to have a wife in every nation but this to be sure is horrid romancing yet abominable as it is it may possibly serve to introduce some plot now hatching with what strange perplexities is my poor mind agitated perchance some sham marriage may be designed on purpose to ruin me but can a husband sell his wife against her own consent and will such a bargain stand good in law monday tuesday wednesday the thirty-second thirty-third and thirty-fourth days of my imprisonment nothing offers these days but squabblings between mrs jukes and me she grows worse and worse to me i vexed her yesterday because she talked nastily and told her she talked more like a vile london prostitute than a gentleman's housekeeper and she thinks she cannot use me bad enough for it bless me she curses and storms at me like a trooper and can hardly keep her hands off me you may believe she must talk sadly to make me say such harsh words indeed it cannot be repeated as she is a disgrace to her sex and then she ridicules me and laughs at my notions of honesty and tells me impudent creature as she is what a fine bedfellow i shall make for my master and such like 
with such whimsical notions about me. Do you think this is to be borne? And yet she talks worse than this impossible, quite filthily. Oh, what vile hands am I put into! Thursday I have now all the reason that can be to apprehend my master will be here soon, for the servants are busy in setting the house to rights, and a stable and coach-house are cleaning out, that have not been used some time. I asked Mrs. Jukes, but she tells me nothing, nor will hardly answer me when I ask her a question. Sometimes I think she puts on these strange wicked airs to me purposely to make me wish for what I dread most of all things, my master's coming down. He talk of love? If he had any the least notion of regard for me to be sure, he would not give this naughty body such power over me. And if he does come, where is his promise of not seeing me without I consent to it? But it seems his honour owes me nothing. So he tells me in his letter. And why? Because I am willing to keep mine. But indeed he says he hates me perfectly. But it is plain he does, or I should not be left to the mercy of this woman, and what is worse to my woeful apprehensions. Friday, the thirty-sixth day of my imprisonment. I took the liberty yesterday afternoon, finding the gates open, to walk out before the house, and ere I was aware had got to the bottom of the long row of elms, and there I sat myself down upon the steps of a sort of broad stile, which leads into the road and goes towards the town, and as I sat musing upon what always busies my mind, I saw a whole body of folks running towards me from the house, men and women as in a fright. At first I wondered what was the matter, till they came nearer, and I found they were all alarmed, thinking I had attempted to get off. There was first the horrible Colbrand, running with his long legs, well nigh two yards at a stride. Then there was one of the grooms, poor Mr. Williams' robber. Then I spied Nan half out of breath, and the cook maid after her, and lastly came waddling as fast as she could, Mrs. Jukes, exclaiming most bitterly as I found against me. Colbrand said, Oh, how have you frighted us all, and went behind me lest I should run away, as I suppose. I sat still to let them see I had no view to get away, for besides the improbability of succeeding, my last sad attempt has cured me of enterprising again and when Mrs. Jukes came within hearing, I found her terribly incensed, and raving about my contrivances. Why, said I, should you be so concerned? Here I have sat a few minutes, and had not the least thought of getting away, or going farther, but to return as soon as it was duskish. She would not believe me, and the barbarous creature struck at me with her horrid fist, and I believe would have felled me, had not Colbrand interposed and said he saw me sitting still, looking about me and not seeming to have the least inclination to stir. But this would not serve. She ordered the two maids to take me each by an arm, and lead me back into the house and upstairs, and there have I been locked up ever since, without shoes. In vain have I pleaded that I had no design, as indeed I had not the least and last night I was forced to be between her and Nan, and I find she is resolved to make a handle of this against me, and in her own behalf. Indeed, what with her usage and my own apprehensions of still worse, I am quite weary of my life. Just now she has been with me, and given me my shoes, and has laid her imperious commands upon me, to dress myself in a suit of clothes out of the portmanteau which I have not seen lately, against three or four o'clock, for she says she is to have a visit from Lady Darnford's two daughters, who come purposely to see me, and so she gave me the key of the portmanteau. But I will not obey her, and I told her. I would not be made a show of, nor see the ladies. She left me, saying it would be worse for me if I did not. But how can that be? Five o'clock is come, and no young ladies, 
so that I fancy. But hold, I hear their coach, I believe. I'll step to the window. I won't go down to them. I am resolved. Good sirs, good sirs, what will become of me? Here is my master come in his fine chariot. Indeed he is. What shall I do? Where shall I hide myself? Oh, what shall I do? Pray for me. But, oh, you'll not see this. Now, good God of heaven, preserve me, if it be thy blessed will. 7 o'clock. Though I dread to see him, yet do I wonder I have not. To be sure something is resolved against me, and he stays to hear all her stories. I can hardly write, yet, as I can do nothing else, I know not how to forbear, yet I cannot hold my pen. How crooked and trembling the lines! I must leave off till I can get quieter fingers. Why should the guiltless tremble so when the guilty can possess their minds in peace? Saturday morning. Now let me give you an account of what passed last night, for I had no power to write, nor yet opportunity till now. This vile woman held my master till half an hour after seven, and he came hither about five in the afternoon, and then I heard his voice on the stairs as he was coming up to me. It was about his supper, for he said, I shall choose a boiled chicken with butter and parsley, and up he came. He put on a stern and majestic air, and he can look very majestic when he pleases. Well, perverse Pamela, ungrateful runaway, said he for my first salutation, you do well, don't you, to give me all this trouble and vexation. I could not speak, but throwing myself on the floor, hid my face, and was ready to die with grief and apprehension. He said, Well may you hide your face, well may you be ashamed to see me, vile forward one as you are. I sobbed and wept, but could not speak, and he let me lie, and went to the door, and called Mrs. Jukes. There, said he, take up that fallen angel. Once I thought her as innocent as an angel of light, but I have now no patience with her. The little hypocrite prostrates herself thus, in hopes to move my weakness in her favour, and that I'll raise her from the floor myself, but I shall not touch her. No, said he, cruel gentleman as he was, let such fellows as Williams be taken in by her artful wiles. I know her now, and see, she is for any fool's turn that will be caught by her. I sighed as if my heart would break, and Mrs. Jukes lifted me up upon my knees, for I trembled so I could not stand. Come, said she, Mrs. Pamela, learn to know your best friend. Confess your unworthy behavior, and beg his honor's forgiveness for all your faults. I was ready to faint, and he said, She is mistress of arts, I assure you, and will mimic a fit ten to one in a minute. I was struck to the heart at this, but could not speak presently, only lifted up my eyes to heaven, and at last made shift to say, God forgive you, sir. He seemed in a great passion, and walked up and down the room, casting sometimes an eye upon me, and seeming as if he would have spoken, but checked himself, and at last he said, When she has acted this her first part over, perhaps I will see her again and she shall soon know what she has to trust to. And so he went out of the room, and I was quite sick at heart. Surely, said I, I am the wickedest creature that ever breathed. Well, said the impertinent, not so wicked as that neither, but I am glad you begin to see your faults. Nothing like being humble. Come, I'll stand your friend and plead for you, if you'll promise to be more dutiful for the future. Come come added the wretch this may be all made up by to-morrow morning if you are not a fool be gone hideous woman said i and let not my affliction be added to by thy inexorable cruelty and unwomanly wickedness she gave me a push and went away in a violent passion and it seems she made a story of this and said i had such a spirit there was no bearing it I laid me down on the floor, and had no power to stir, till the clock struck nine, and then the wicked woman came up again. You must come downstairs, said she, to my master, that is, if you please, spirit. Said I, 
I believe I cannot stand. Then said she, I'll send Monsieur Colbrand to carry you down. I got up as well as I could, and trembled all the way downstairs, and she went before me into the parlour, and a new servant that he had waiting on him instead of John withdrew as soon as I came in, and by the way he had a new coachman too, which looked as if Bedfordshire Robin was turned away. I thought, said he, when I came down, you should have sat at table with me when I had not company. But when I find you cannot forget your original, but must prefer my menials to me, I call you down to wait on me while I sup, that I may have some talk with you, and throw away as little time as possible upon you. Sir, said I, you do me honour to wait upon me, and I never shall, I hope, forget my original. But I was forced to stand behind his chair, that I might hold by it. Fill me, said he, a glass of that burgundy. I went to do it, but my hand shook so that I could not hold the plate with the glass in it and spilt some of the wine. So Mrs. Jukes poured it for me, and I carried it as well as I could, and made a low curtsy. He took it and said, Stand behind me, out of my sight. Why, Mrs. Jukes, said he, you tell me she remains very sullen still and eats nothing. No, said she, not so much as will keep life and soul together. And is always crying, you say, too. Yes, sir, answered she. I think she is, for one thing or another. I said he, your young wenches will feed upon their tears, and their obstinacy will serve them for meat and drink. I think I never saw her look better, though, in my life, but I suppose she lives upon love. This sweet Mr. Williams and her little villainous plots together have kept her alive and well, to be sure. For mischief, love, and contradiction are the natural elements of a woman. Poor I was forced to hear all this and be silent, and indeed my heart was too full to speak. And so you say, said he, that she had another project, but yesterday to get away? She denies it herself, said she but it had all the appearance of one. I'm sure she made me in a fearful pucker about it, and I'm glad your honour is come with all my heart, and I hope, whatever be your honour's intention concerning her, you will not be long about it, for you'll find her as slippery as an eel, I'll assure you. Sir, said I, and clasped his knees with my arms, not knowing what I did, and falling on my knees, have mercy on me, and hear me concerning that wicked woman's usage of me. He cruelly interrupted me and said, I am satisfied she has done her duty. It signifies nothing what you say against Mrs. Jukes, that you are here, little hypocrite, as you are, pleading your cause before me, is owing to her care of you, else you had been with the parson. Wicked girl, said he, to tempt a man to undo himself, as you have done him, at a time I was on the point of making him happy for his life. I arose, but said with a deep sigh, I have done, sir, I have done, I have a strange tribunal to plead before. The poor sheep in the fable had such an one, when it was tried before the vulture on the accusation of the wolf. So Mrs. Jukes said he, You are the wolf, I the vulture and this the poor innocent lamb on her trial before us oh you don't know how well this innocent is read in reflection she has wit at will when she has a mind to display her own romantic innocence at the price of other people's characters well said the aggravated creature this is nothing to what she has called me i have been a jezebel a london prostitute and what not but I am contented with her ill names, now I see it is her fashion, and she can call your honour a vulture. Said I, I had no thought of comparing my master, and was going to say on, but he said, Don't prate, girl. No, said she, it don't become you, I am sure. Well, said I, since I must not speak, I will hold my peace. But there is a righteous judge who knows the secrets of all hearts, and to him I appeal. See there, said he, now this meek good creature is praying for fire from heaven upon us. 
oh she can curse most heartily in the spirit of christian meekness i'll assure you come saucy face give me another glass of wine so i did as well as i could but wept so that he said i suppose i shall have some of your tears in my wine when he had supped he stood up and said oh how happy for you it is that you can at will thus make your speaking eyes overflow in this manner without losing any of their brilliancy you have been told i suppose that you are most beautiful in your tears did you ever said he to her who all this while was standing in one corner of the parlour see a more charming creature than this is it to be wondered at that i demean myself thus to take notice of her see said he and took the glass with one hand and turned me round with the other what a shape what a neck what a hand and what a bloom on that lovely face but who can describe the tricks and artifices that lie lurking in her little plotting guileful heart tis no wonder the poor parson was infatuated with her i blame him less than i do her for who could expect such artifice in so young a sorceress i went to the farther part of the room and held my face against the wainscot and in spite of all i could do to refrain crying sobbed as if my heart would break he said i am surprised mrs jukes at the mistake of the letters you tell me of but you see i am not afraid anybody should read what i write i don't carry on private correspondences and reveal every secret that comes to my knowledge and then corrupt people to carry my letters against their duty and all good conscience come hither hussy said he you and i have a dreadful reckoning to make why don't you come when i bid you fie upon it mrs pamela said she what not stir when his honour commands you to come to him who knows but his goodness will forgive you he came to me for i had no power to stir and put his arms about my neck and would kiss me and said well mrs jukes if it were not for the thought of this cursed parson i believe in my heart so great is my weakness that i could not forgive this intriguing little slut and take her to my bosom oh said the sycophant you are very good sir very forgiving indeed but come added the profligate wretch i hope you will be so good as to take her to your bosom and that by to-morrow morning you'll bring her to a better sense of her duty could anything in womanhood be so vile i had no patience but yet grief and indignation choked up the passage of my words and i could only stammer out a passionate exclamation to heaven to protect my innocence but the word was the subject of their ridicule was ever poor creature worse beset he said as if he had been considering whether he could forgive me or not no i cannot yet forgive her neither she has given me great disturbance has brought great discredit upon me both abroad and at home has corrupted all my servants at the other house has despised my honourable views and intentions to her and sought to run away with this ungrateful parson and surely i ought not to forgive all this yet with all this wretched grimace he kissed me again and would have put his hand into my bosom but i struggled and said i would die before i would be used thus consider pamela said he in a threatening tone consider where you are and don't play the fool if you do a more dreadful fate awaits you than you expect but take her upstairs mrs jukes and i'll send a few lines to her to consider of and let me have your answer pamela in the morning till then you have to resolve and after that your doom is fixed so i went upstairs and gave myself up to grief and expectation of what he would send but yet i was glad of this night's reprieve he sent me however nothing at all and about twelve o'clock mrs jukes and nan came up as the night before to be my bedfellows and i would go to bed with some of my clothes on which they muttered at sadly and mrs jukes railed at me particularly indeed i would have sat up all night for fear 
if she would have let me for i had but very little rest that night apprehending this woman would let my master in she did nothing but praise him and blame me but i answered her as little as i could he has sir simon telltale alias darnford to dine with him to-day whose family sent to welcome him into the country and it seems the old knight wants to see me so i suppose i shall be sent for as samson was to make sport for him here i am and must bear it all End of section 13section fourteen of pamela or virtue rewarded this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org pamela or virtue rewarded by samuel richardson section fourteen twelve o'clock saturday noon just now he has sent me up by mrs jukes the following proposals so here are the honourable intentions all at once laid open they are my dear parents to make me a vile kept mistress which i hope i shall always detest the thoughts of but you'll see how they are accommodated to what i should have most desired could i have honestly promoted it your welfare and happiness i have answered them as i am sure you'll approve and i am prepared for the worst for though i fear there will be nothing omitted to ruin me and though my poor strength will not be able to defend me yet i will be innocent of crime in my intention and in the sight of god and to him leave the avenging of all my wrongs time and manner i shall write to you my answer against his articles and hope the best though i fear the worst but if i should come home to you ruined and undone and may not be able to look you in the face yet pity and in spirit the poor pamela to make her little remnant of life easy for long i shall not survive my disgrace and you may be assured it shall not be my fault if it be my misfortune to mrs pamela andrews the following articles are proposed to your serious consideration and let me have an answer in writing to them that i may take my resolutions accordingly only remember that i will not be trifled with and what you give for answer will absolutely decide your fate without expostulation or farther trouble this is my answer forgive sir the spirit your poor servant is about to show in her answer to your articles not to be warm and in earnest on such an occasion as the present would show a degree of guilt that i hope my soul abhors i will not trifle with you nor act like a person doubtful of her own mind for it wants not one moment's consideration with me and i therefore return the answer following let what will be the consequence one if you can convince me that the hated person has had no encouragement from you in his addresses and that you have no inclination for him in preference to me then i will offer the following proposals to you which i will punctually make good one as to the first article sir it may behoove me that i may not deserve in your opinion the opprobrious terms of forward and artful and such like to declare solemnly that mr williams never had the least encouragement from me as to what you hint and i believe his principal motive was the apprehended duty of his function quite contrary to his apparent interest to assist a person he thought in distress you may sir the rather believe me when i declare that i know not the man breathing i would wish to marry and that the only one i could honour more than another is the gentleman who of all others seeks my everlasting dishonour two i will directly make you a present of five hundred guineas for your own use which you may dispose of to any purpose you please and will give it absolutely into the hands of any person you shall appoint to receive it and expect no favour in return till you are satisfied in the possession of it two as to your second proposal let the consequence be what it will i reject it with all my soul money sir is not my chief good may god almighty desert me whenever it is and whenever for the sake of that 
I can give up my title to that blessed hope which will stand me instead at a time when millions of gold will not purchase one happy moment of reflection on a past misspent life. 3. I will likewise directly make over to you a purchase I lately made in Kent, which brings in two hundred and fifty pounds per annum, clear of all deductions. This shall be made over to you in full property for your life, and for the lives of any children to perpetuity that you may happen to have, and your father shall be immediately put into possession of it in trust for these purposes, and the management of it will yield a comfortable subsistence to him and your mother for life, and I will make up any deficiencies if such should happen to that clear sum, and allow him fifty pounds per annum besides for his life and that of your mother for his care and management of this your estate three your third proposal sir i reject for the same reason and am sorry you could think my poor honest parents would enter into their part of it and be concerned for the management of an estate which would be owing to the prostitution of their poor daughter forgive sir my warmth on this occasion but you know not the poor man and the poor woman my ever dear father and mother if you think that they would not much rather choose to starve in a ditch or rot in a noisome dungeon than accept of the fortune of a monarch upon such wicked terms i dare not say all that my full mind suggests to me on this grievous occasion but indeed sir you know them not nor shall the terrors of death in its most frightful form i hope through god's assisting grace ever make me act unworthy of such poor honest parents for i will moreover extend my favour to any other of your relations that you may think worthy of it or that are valued by you for your fourth proposal i take upon me sir to answer as the third if i have any friends that want the favour of the great may they ever want it if they are capable of desiring it on unworthy terms five i will besides order patterns to be sent you for choosing four complete suits of rich clothes that you may appear with reputation as if you were my wife and will give you two diamond rings and two pair of earrings and diamond necklace that were bought by my mother to present to miss tomlins if the match that was proposed between her and me had been brought to effect and i will confer upon you still other gratuities as i shall find myself obliged by your good behaviour and affection five fine clothes sir become not me nor have i any ambition to wear them i have greater pride in my poverty and meanness than i should have in dress and finery believe me sir i think such things less become the humble-born pamela than the rags your good mother raised me from your ring sir your necklace and your earrings will better befit ladies of degree than me and to lose the best jewel my virtue would be poorly recompensed by those you propose to give me what should i think when i looked upon my finger or saw in the glass those diamonds on my neck and in my ears but that they were the price of my honesty and that i wore those jewels outwardly because i had none inwardly six now pamela will you see by this what a value i set upon the free will of a person already in my power and who if these proposals are not accepted shall find that i have not taken all these pains and risked my reputation as i have done without resolving to gratify my passion for you at all adventures and if you refuse without making any terms at all six i know sir by woeful experience that i am in your power i know all the resistance i can make will be poor and weak and perhaps stand me in little stead i dread your will to ruin me is as great as your power yet sir will i dare to tell you that i will make no free will offering of my virtue all that i can do poor as it is i will do to convince you that your offers shall have no part in my choice and if i cannot escape the violence of man i hope by god's grace i shall have nothing to reproach myself for not doing all in my power to avoid my disgrace and then i can safely appeal to the great god my only refuge and protector with this consolation 
that my will bore no part in my violation seven you shall be mistress of my person and fortune as much as if the foolish ceremony had passed all my servants shall be yours and you shall choose any two persons to attend yourself either male or female without any control of mine and if your conduct be such that i have reason to be satisfied with it i know not but will not engage for this that i may after a twelve months cohabitation marry you for if my love increases for you as it has done for many months past it will be impossible for me to deny you anything and now pamela consider well it is in your power to oblige me on such terms as will make yourself and all your friends happy but this will be over this very day irrevocably over and you shall find all you would be thought to fear without the least benefit arising from it to yourself and i beg you'll well weigh the matter and comply with my proposals and i will instantly set about securing to you the full effect of them and let me if you value yourself experience a grateful return on this occasion and i'll forgive all that's past seven i have not once dared to look so high as to such a proposal as your seventh article contains hence have proceeded all my little abortive artifices to escape from the confinement you have put me in although you promised to be honourable to me your honour well i know would not let you stoop to be so mean and so unworthy a slave as the poor pamela all i desire is to be permitted to return to my native meanness unviolated what have i done sir to deserve it should be otherwise for the obtaining of this though i would not have married your chaplain yet would i have run away with your meanest servant if i had thought i could have got safe to my beloved poverty i heard you once say sir that a certain great commander who could live upon lentils might well refuse the bribes of the greatest monarch and i hope as i can contentedly live at the meanest rate and think not myself above the lowest condition that i am also above making an exchange of my honesty for all the riches of the indies when i come to be proud and vain of gaudy apparel and outside finery then which i hope will never be may i rest my principal good in such vain trinkets and despise for them the more solid ornaments of a good fame and a chastity inviolate give me leave to say sir in answer to what you hint that you may in a twelve months time marry me on the continuance of my good behaviour that this weighs less with me if possible than anything else you have said for in the first place there is an end of all merit and all good behaviour on my side if i have now any the moment i consent to your proposals and i should be so far from expecting such an honour that i will pronounce that i should be most unworthy of it what sir would the world say were you to marry your harlot that a gentleman of your rank in life should stoop not only to the base-born pamela but to a base-born prostitute little sir as i know of the world i am not to be caught by a bait so poorly covered as this yet after all dreadful is the thought that i a poor weak friendless unhappy creature am too full in your power but permit me sir to pray as i now write on my bended knees that before you resolve upon my ruin you will weigh well the matter hitherto sir though you have taken large strides to this crying sin yet are you on this side the commission of it when once it is done nothing can recall it and where will be your triumph what glory will the spoils of such a weak enemy yield you let me but enjoy my poverty with honesty is all my prayer and i will bless you and pray for you every moment of my life think oh think before it is yet too late what stings what remorse will attend your dying hour when you come to reflect that you have ruined perhaps soul and body a wretched creature whose only pride was her virtue and how pleased you will be on the contrary if in that tremendous moment you shall be able to acquit yourself of this foul crime 
and to plead in your own behalf that you suffered the earnest supplications of an unhappy wretch to prevail with you to be innocent yourself and let her remain so may god almighty whose mercy so lately saved you from the peril of perishing in deep waters on which i hope you will give me cause to congratulate you touch your heart in my favour and save you from this sin and me from this ruin and to him do i commit my cause and to him will i give the glory and night and day pray for you if i may be permitted to escape this great evil your poor oppressed broken spirited servant i took a copy of this for your perusal my dear parents if i shall ever be so happy to see you again for i hope my conduct will be approved of by you and at night when sir simon was gone he sent for me down well said he have you considered my proposals yes sir said i i have and there is my answer but pray let me not see you read it is it your bashfulness said he or your obstinacy that makes you not choose i should read it before you i offered to go away and he said don't run from me i won't read it till you are gone but said he tell me pamela whether you comply with my proposals or not sir said i you will see presently pray don't hold me for he took my hand said he did you well consider before you answered i did sir said i if it be not what you think will please me said he dear girl take it back again and reconsider it for if i have this as your absolute answer and i don't like it you are undone for i will not sue meanly where i can command i fear said he it is not what i like by your manner and let me tell you that i cannot bear denial if the terms i have offered are not sufficient i will augment them to two-thirds of my estate for said he and swore a dreadful oath i cannot live without you and since the thing is gone so far i will not and so he clasped me in his arms in such a manner as quite frightened me and kissed me two or three times i got from him and run upstairs and went to the closet and was quite uneasy and fearful in an hour's time he called mrs jukes down to him and i heard him very high in passion and all about me and i heard her say it was his own fault there would be an end of all my complaining and perverseness if he was once resolved and other most impudent aggravations i am resolved not to go to bed this night if i can help it lie still lie still my poor fluttering heart what will become of me almost twelve o'clock saturday night he sent mrs jukes about ten o'clock to tell me to come to him where said i i'll show you said she i went down three or four steps and saw her making to his chamber the door of which was open so i said i cannot go there don't be foolish said she but come no harm will be done to you well said i if i die i cannot go there i heard him say let her come or it shall be worse for her i can't bear said he to speak to her myself well said i i cannot come indeed i cannot and so i went up again into my closet expecting to be fetched by force but she came up soon after and bid me make haste to bed said i i will not go to bed this night that's certain then said she you shall be made to come to bed and nan and i will undress you i knew neither prayers nor tears would move this wicked woman so i said i am sure you will let master in and i shall be undone mighty piece of undone she said but he was too much exasperated against me to be so familiar with me she would assure me ay said she you'll be disposed of another way soon i can tell you for your comfort and i hope your husband will have your obedience though nobody else can have it no husband in the world said i shall make me do an unjust or base thing she said that would be soon tried and nan coming in what said i am i to have two bedfellows again these warm nights yes said she slippery one you are till you can have one good one instead of us said i mrs jukes don't talk nastily to me 
I see you are beginning again, and I shall affront you, maybe, for next to bad actions are bad words, for they could not be spoken if they were not in the heart. Come to bed, purity, said she. You are a nun such, I suppose. Indeed, said I, I can't come to bed, and it will do you no harm to let me stay all night in the great chair. Nan, said she, undress my young lady. If she won't let you, I'll help you. And if neither of us can do it quietly, we'll call my master to do it for us. Though, said she, I think it an office worthier of Monsieur Colbrand. You are very wicked, said I. I know it, said she. I am a Jezebel, and a London prostitute, you know. You did great feats, said I, to tell my master all this poor stuff, but you did not tell him how you beat me. No, Lambkin, said she, a word I had not heard a good while. That I left for you to tell, and you was going to do it if the vulture had not taken the wolf's part and bid the poor innocent lamb be silent. I, said I, no matter for your fleers, Mrs. Jukes, though I can have neither justice nor mercy here, and cannot be heard in my defence. Yet a time will come, maybe, when I shall be heard, and when your own guilt will strike you dumb. I, spirit, said she, and the vulture, too. Must we both be dumb? Why, that lambkin will be pretty. Then, said the wicked one, you'll have all the talk to yourself. Then how will the tongue of the pretty lamb can bleat out innocence and virtue and honesty till the whole trial be at an end? You're a wicked woman, that's certain, said I. And if you thought anything of another world, could not talk thus. But no wonder. It shows what hands I'm got into. Ay, so it does, said she. But I beg you'll undress and come to bed, or I believe your innocence won't keep you from still worse hands. I will come to bed, said I, if you will let me have the keys in my own hand, not else, if I can help it. Yes, said she, and then, hey, for another contrivance, another escape. No, no, said I, all my contrivances are over, I'll assure you. Pray, let me have the keys, and I will come to bed. She came to me, and took me in her huge arms as if I was a feather, said she, I do this to show you what a poor resistance you can make against me if I please to exert myself. And so, Lambkin, don't say to your wolf I won't come to bed. And set me down and tapped me on the neck. Ah, said she, thou art a pretty creature, tis true, but so obstinate, so full of spirit, if thy strength was but answerable to that, thou wouldst run away with us all, and this great house too on thy back. But undress, undress, I tell you. Well, said I, I see my misfortunes make you very merry, and very witty, too. But I will love you, if you will humour me with the keys of the chamber doors. Are you sure you will love me? said she. Now speak your conscience. Why, said I, you must not put it so close. Neither would you, if you thought you had not given reason to doubt it. But I will love you as well as I can. I would not tell a willful lie, and if I did, you would not believe me, after your hard usage of me. Well, said she, that's all fair, I own. But, Nan, pray pull off my young lady's shoes and stockings. No, pray don't, said I. I will come to bed presently, since I must. And so I went to the closet and scribbled a little about this idle chit-chat, and she, being importunate, I was forced to go to bed but with some of my clothes on, as the former night. And she let me hold the two keys, for there are two locks, there being a double door. And so I got a little sleep that night, having had none for two or three nights before. I can't imagine what she means, but Nan offered to talk a little once or twice, and she snubbed her and said, I charge you, wench, don't open your lips before me. And if you are asked any questions by Mrs. Pamela, don't answer her one word while I am here, but she is a lordly woman to the maid servants, and that has always been her character. Oh, how unlike good Mrs. Jarvis in everything! Sunday morning, a thought came into my head. I meant no harm, but it was a little bold, for seeing my master dressing to go to church, and his chariot getting ready, I went to my closet, and I writ. 
the prayers of this congregation are earnestly desired for a gentleman of great worth and honor who labors under a temptation to exert his great power to ruin a poor distressed worthless maiden and also the prayers of this congregation are earnestly desired by a poor distressed creature for the preservation of her virtue and innocence mrs jukes came up always writing said she and would see it and straight all that ever i could say carried it down to my master he looked upon it and said tell her she shall soon see how her prayers are answered she is very bold but as she has rejected all my favours her reckoning for all is not far off i looked after him out of the window and he was charmingly dressed to be sure he is a handsome fine gentleman what pity his heart is not as good as his appearance why can't i hate him but don't be uneasy if you should see this for it is impossible i should love him for his vices all ugly him over as i may say my master sends word that he shall not come home for dinner i suppose he dines with this sir simon darnford i am much concerned for poor mr williams mrs jukes says he is confined still and takes on much all his trouble is brought upon him for my sake this grieves me much my master it seems will have his money from him this is very hard for it is three fifty pounds he gave him as he thought as a salary for three years that he has been with him but there was no agreement between them and he absolutely depended on my master's favour to be sure it was the more generous of him to run these risks for the sake of oppressed innocence and i hope he will meet with his reward in due time alas for me i dare not plead for him that would raise my oppressor's jealousy more and i have not interest to save myself sunday evening mrs jukes has received a line from my master i wonder what it is for his chariot is come home without him but she will tell me nothing so it is in vain to ask her i am so fearful of plots and tricks i know not what to do everything i suspect for now my disgrace is avowed what can i think to be sure the worst will be attempted i can only pour out my soul in prayer to god for his blessed protection but if i must suffer let me not be long a mournful survivor only let me not shorten my own time sinfully this woman left upon the table in the chamber this letter of my master's to her and i bolted myself in till i had transcribed it you'll see how tremblingly by the lines i wish poor mr williams release at any rate but this letter makes my heart ache yet i have another day's reprieve thank god mrs jukes i have been so pressed on williams affairs that i shall set out this afternoon in sir simon's chariot and with parson peters who is his intercessor for stamford and shall not be back till to-morrow evening if then as to your ward i am thoroughly incensed against her she has withstood her time and now would she sign and seal to my articles it is too late i shall discover something perhaps by him and will on my return let her know that all her ensnaring loveliness shall not save her from the fate that awaits her but let her know nothing of this lest it put her fruitful mind upon plots and artifices be sure trust her not without another with you at night lest she venture the window in her foolish rashness for i shall require her at your hands yours etc i had but just finished taking a copy of this and laid the letter where i had it and unbolted the door when she came up in a great fright for fear i should have seen it but i being in my closet and that lying as she left it she did not mistrust oh said she i was afraid you had seen my master's letter here which i carelessly left on the table i wish said i i had known that why sure said she if you had you would not have offered to read my letters indeed said i i should at this time if it had been in my way do let me see it well said she i wish poor mr williams well off 
i understand my master is gone to make up matters with him which is very good to be sure added she he is a very good gentleman and very forgiving why said i as if i had known nothing of the matter how can he make up matters with him is not mr williams at stamford yes said she i believe so but parson peters pleads for him and he is gone with him to stamford and will not be back to-night so we have nothing to do but to eat our suppers betimes and to go to bed ay that's pure said i and i shall have good rest this night i hope so said she you might every night but for your own idle fears you are afraid of your friends when none are near you ay that's true said i for i have not one near me so i have one more good honest night before me what the next may be i know not and so i'll try to take in a good deal of sleep while i can be a little easy therefore here i say good night my dear parents for i have no more to write about this night and though his letter shocks me yet i will be as brisk as i can that she mayn't suspect i have seen it tuesday night for the future i will always mistrust most when appearances look fairest oh your poor daughter what has she not suffered since what i wrote on sunday night my worst trial and my fearfullest danger oh how i shudder to write you an account of this wicked interval of time for my dear parents will you not be too much frightened and affected with my distress when i tell you that his journey to stamford was all abominable pretence for he came home privately and had well nigh effected all his vile purposes and the ruin of your poor daughter and that by such a plot as i was not in the least apprehensive of and oh you'll hear what a vile and unwomanly part that wicked wretch mrs jukes acted in it i left off with letting you know how much i was pleased that i had one night's reprieve added to my honesty but i had less occasion to rejoice than ever as you will judge by what i have said already take then the dreadful story as well as i can relate it the maid nan is a little apt to drink if she can get at liquor and mrs jukes happened or designed as is too probable to leave a bottle of cherry brandy in her way and the wench drank some of it more than she should and when she came in to lay the cloth mrs jukes perceived it and fell a rating at her most sadly for she has too many faults of her own to suffer any of the like sort in anybody else if she can help it and she bid her get out of her sight when we had supped and go to bed to sleep off her liquor before we came to bed and so the poor maid went muttering upstairs end of section fourteen Section fifteen of Pamela or Virtue Rewarded. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pamela or Virtue Rewarded by Samuel Richardson. Section fifteen. About two hours after, which was near eleven o'clock, Mrs. Jukes and I went up to bed. I was pleasing myself with what a charming night I should have. We locked both doors and saw poor Nan as I thought. But, oh, it was my abominable master, as you shall hear by and by, sitting fast asleep in an elbow chair in a dark corner of the room, with her apron thrown over her head and neck. And Mrs. Jukes said, There's that beast of a wench fast asleep instead of being abed. I knew, she said, she had taken a fine dose. I'll wake her, said I. No, don't, said she. Let her sleep on. We shall be better without her. Ay, said I, so we shall. But won't she get cold? Said she, I hope you have no writing to-night. No, replied I. I will go to bed with you, Mrs. Jukes. Said she, I wonder what you can find to write about so much. "'and I am sure you have better conveniences of that kind, "'and more paper than I am aware of, 
and I had intended to rummage you if my master had not come down, for I spied a broken teacup with ink which gave me suspicion. But as he has come, let him look after you if he will, and if you deceive him it will be his own fault. All this time we were undressing ourselves, and I fetched a deep sigh. "'What do you sigh for?' said she. "'I am thinking, Mrs. Jukes,' answered I, "'what a sad life I live, and how hard is my lot. "'I am sure the thief that has robbed is much better off than I, "'bating the guilt, and I should, I think, "'take it for a mercy to be hanged out of the way, "'rather than to live in these cruel apprehensions.' So, being not sleepy and in a prattling vein, I began to give a little history of myself, as I did once before, to Mrs. Jarvis in this manner. Here, said I, were my poor honest parents. They took care to install good principles into my mind, until I was almost twelve years of age, and taught me to prefer goodness and poverty to the highest condition of life and they confirmed their lessons by their own practice, for they were, of late years, remarkably poor, and always as remarkably honest, even to a proverb. For as honest as Goodman Andrews was a byword. Well then, said I, comes my late dear good lady, and takes a fancy to me, and said she would be the making of me if I was a good girl and she put me to sing, to dance, to play on the spinet, in order to divert her melancholy hours, and also taught me all manner of fine needlework. But still this was her lesson. My good Pamela, be virtuous, and keep the men at a distance. Well, so I was, I hope, and so I did. And yet, though I say it, they all loved me and respected me, and would do anything for me, as if I were a gentlewoman." "'But then what comes next? "'Why, it pleased God to take my good lady, "'and then comes my master. "'And what says he? "'Why, in effect it is, "'be not virtuous, Pamela. "'So here I have lived about sixteen years "'in virtue and reputation, "'and all at once, when I come to know "'what is good and what is evil, "'I must renounce all the good, "'all the whole sixteen years innocent, "'which next to God's grace "'I owed chiefly to my parents.' and my lady's good lessons and examples, and choose the evil, and so in a moment's time become the vilest of creatures. And all this for what, I pray? Why, truly, for a pair of diamond earrings, a necklace, and a diamond ring for my finger, which would not become me. For a few paltry fine clothes, which when I wore them would make but my former poverty more ridiculous to everybody that saw me, "'especially when they knew the base terms I wore them upon. "'But, indeed, I was to have such a great parcel of guineas beside. "'I forget how many, for had there been ten times more, "'they would have not been so much to me "'as the honest six guineas you tricked me out of, Mrs. Jukes. "'Well, forsooth, but then I was to have I know not how many pounds a year for my life, "'and my poor father, he was the jest of it, was to be the manager for the abandoned prostitute his daughter. And then, there was the jest again, my kind forgiving virtuous master would pardon me all my misdeeds. Yes, thank him for nothing, truly. And what pray are all these violent misdeeds? Why, they are for daring to adhere to the good lessons that were taught me, and not learning a new one that would have reversed all my former for not being contented when I was run away with, in order to be ruined, but contriving, if my poor wits had been able, to get out of danger, and preserve myself honest. Then was he once jealous of poor John, though he knew John was his own creature, and helped to deceive me. Then was he outrageous against poor Parson Williams, and him has this good merciful master thrown into jail, and for what? Why, truly, for that being a divine and a good man, he had the fear of God before his eyes, and was willing to forego all his expectations of interest, and assist an oppressed poor creature. But, to be sure, I must be forward, bold, saucy, and what not, to dare to run away from certain ruin, and to strive to escape from an unjust confinement, and I must be married to the parson, nothing so sure. 
"'He would have had but a poor catch of me had I consented. "'But he, and you too, know I did not want to marry anybody. "'I only want to go to my poor parents, and to have my own liberty, "'and not to be confined by such an unlawful restraint, "'and which would not have been inflicted upon me, "'but only that I am a poor, destitute young body, "'and have no friend that is able to write me.' "'So, Mrs. Duke,' said I, "'here is my history in brief. "'And I am a very unhappy young creature, to be sure. "'And why am I so? "'Why, because my master sees something in my person "'that has taken his present fancy, "'and because I would not be undone. "'Why, therefore, to choose, I must and I shall be undone. "'And this is all the reason that can be given.' She heard me run on all this time while I was undressing without any interruption, and I said, Well, I must go to the two closets, ever since an affair of the closet at the other house, though he is so far away. And I have a good mind to wake this poor maid. No, don't, said she, I charge you. I am very angry with her, and shall get no harm there, and if she wakes she may come to bed well enough, as long as there is a candle in the chimney. So I looked into the closet, and knelt down in my own, as I used to do, to say my prayers, and this with my underclothes in my hand, all undressed, and passed by the poor sleeping wrench, as I thought in my return. But, oh, little did I think it was my wicked, wicked master, in a gown and petticoat of hers, and her apron over his face and shoulders. What meanness will not Lucifer make his votary stoop to, to gain their abominable ends? Mrs. Jukes by this time was got into bed on the farther side as she used to be, and to make room for the maid when she should awake, I got into the bed and lay close to her. And I said, Where are the keys? Though, said I, I am not so much afraid to night. Here, said the wicked woman, put your arm under mine, and you shall find them about my wrists, as they used to be. So I did, and the abominable designer held my hand with her right hand, as my right arm was still under her left. In less than a quarter of an hour, I said, There's poor Nan awake, I hear her stir. Let us go to sleep, said she, and not mind her. She'll come to bed when she's quite awake. Poor soul, said I. I'll warrant she will have the headache finally tomorrow for this. Be silent, she said, and go to sleep. You keep me awake, and I never found you in so talkative a humour in my life. "'Don't chide me,' said I. "'I will but say one thing more. "'Do you think Nan could hear me talk of my master's office?' "'No, no,' said she. "'She was dead asleep.' "'I'm glad of that,' said I, "'because I would not expose my master to his common servants, "'and I knew you were no stranger to his fine articles.' "'Said she, "'I think they were fine articles, "'and you were bewitched you did not close with them. "'But let us go to sleep.' So I was silent, and the pretended Nan, oh, wicked, base, villainous designer, what a plot, and what an unexpected plot was this, seemed to be awaiting. And Mrs. Dukes, a abhorrent creature, said, Come, Nan, what are you awake at last? Prithee come to bed, for Mrs. Pamela is in a talking fit, and won't go to sleep one while. At that the pretended she came to the bedside, and sitting down in the chair where the curtain hid her, began to undress. Said I, Poor Mrs. Anne, I warrant your head aches most sadly. How do you do? Says he, One word with you, Pamela. One word, hear me, but I must say one word to you. It is this. You see, now you are in my power. You cannot get from me, nor help yourself. Yet have I not offered anything amiss to you? But if you resolve not to comply with my proposals, I will not lose this opportunity. If you do, I will leave you. Oh, sir, said I, leave me, leave me, but, and I will do anything I ought to do. Swear then to me, said he, that you will accept my proposals. With struggling, fright and terror, I fainted away quite, and did not come to myself soon, so that they both, from the cold sweats that I was in, thought me dying. "'and I remember no more than that, "'when with great difficulty they brought me to myself. "'She was sitting on one side of the bed, with her clothes on, 
and he on the other side with his, and in his gown and slippers. Your poor Pamela cannot answer for the liberties taken with her in her deplorable state of death. And when I saw them there, I sat up in my bed, without any regard to what appearance I made, and nothing about my neck, and he soothing me, with an aspect of pity and concern. I put my hand to his mouth and said, Oh, tell me, yet tell me not, what have I suffered in this distress? And I talked quite wild, and knew not what, for to be sure I was on the point of distraction. He most solemnly, and with bitter imprecation, vowed that he had not offered the least indecency, that he was frightened at the terrible manner I was taken with the fit, that he should desist from his attempt, and begged but to see me easy and quiet, and he would leave me directly, and go to his own bed. <gasps> then said I, take with you this most wicked woman, this foul Mrs. Jukes, as an earnest that I might believe you. "'And will you, sir,' said the wicked wretch, "'for a fit or two, give up such an opportunity as this? "'I thought you had known the sex better. "'She is now, you see, quite well again.' "'This I heard more she might say, "'but I fainted away once more at these words, "'and at his clasping his arm about me again. "'And when I came a little to myself, "'I saw him sit there, "'and the maid Nan holding a smelling bottle to my nose, "'and no Mrs. Jukes.' He said, taking my hand, Now will I vow to you, my dear Pamela, that I will leave you the moment I see you better, and pacified. Here's Nan knows, and will tell you my concern for you. I vow to God I have not offered any indecency to you, and since I found Mrs. Jukes so offensive to you, I have sent her to the maid's bed, and the maid shall be with you to-night. And but promise me that you will compose yourself, and I will leave you. But, said I, will not Nan also hold my hand, and will she not let you come in again to me? He said, By heaven, I will not come in again to-night. Nan, undress yourself, go to bed, and do all you can to comfort the dear creature. And now, dear Pamela, said he, give me but your hand, and say you forgive me, and I will leave you to your repose. I held out my trembling hand, which he was safe to kiss, and I said, God forgive you, as you have been just in my distress, as you will be just to what you promise. And he withdrew with a countenance of remorse, as I hoped, and she shut the doors, and at my request brought the keys to bed. This, my, my dear parents, was a most dreadful trial. I tremble still to think of it, and dare not recall all the horrid circumstances of it. I hope, as he assures me, he was not guilty of indecency but have reason to bless God, who, by disabling me my faculties, empowered me to preserve my innocence, and when my strength would have signified nothing, magnified himself in my weakness. I was so weak all day on Monday that I could not get out of my bed. My master showed great tenderness for me, and I hope he is really sorry, and that this will be his last attempt, but he does not say so neither. He came in the morning as soon as he heard the door open, and I began to be fearful. He stopped short of the bed and said, Rather than give you apprehensions, I will, I will come no farther. I said, Your honour, sir, and, that, and your mercy is all I have to beg. He sat himself on the side of the bed and asked kindly how I did, begged me to be composed, said I still looked a little wildly, and I said, "'Pray, good sir, let me not see this infamous Mrs. Jukes. "'I doubt I cannot bear her sight. "'She shan't come near you all this day "'if you'll promise to compose yourself. "'Then, sir, I will try.' "'He pressed my hand very tenderly and went out. "'What a change does this show! "'Or oh, may it be lasting! "'But, alas, he seems only to have altered his method of proceeding "'and retains, I doubt, his wicked purpose.' On Tuesday, about ten o'clock, when my master heard I was up, he sent for me down into the parlour. As soon as he saw me, he said, Come nearer to me, Pamela. I did so, and he took my hand, and said, You begin to look well again. I am glad of it. You little slut, how you did frighten me on the Sunday night. 
sir said i pray name not that night and my eyes overflowed at the remembrance and i turned my head aside said he place some little confidence in me i know what those charming eyes mean and you shall not need to explain yourself for i do assure you that as soon as i saw you change and a cold sweat bedew your pretty face and you fainted away i quitted the bed and mrs jukes did so too and i put on my gown and she fetched her smelling bottle and we both did all we could to restore you and my passion for you was all swallowed up in the concern i had for your recovery for I thought I never saw a fit so strong and violent in my life, and feared we should not bring you to life again. For what I saw you in once before was nothing to it. This, said he, might be my folly, and my unacquaintedness with what passion your sex can show when they are in earnest. But this I repeat to you, that your mind may be entirely comforted. Whatever I offered to you was before you fainted away, and that, I am sure, was innocent. Sir, said I, that was very bad, and it was too plain you had the worst designs. When, said he, I tell you the truth in one instance, you may believe me in the other. I know not, I declare, beyond this lovely bosom your sex, but that I did intend what you call the worst is most certain. Although I would not too much alarm you now, I could curse my weakness and my folly, which makes me own that I love you beyond all your sex, and cannot live without you. But if I am master of myself and my own resolution, I will not attempt to force you to do anything again. Sir, said I, you may easily keep your resolution, if you'll send me out of your way to my poor parents. That is all I beg. Tis folly to talk of it, said he. You must not, shall not go. "'and if I could be assured you were not attempted, "'you should have better usage, "'and your confinement should be made easier to you.' "'But to what end, sir, am I to stay?' said I. "'You yourself seem not sure you can keep your own present good resolutions. "'And do you think if I were to stay, when I could get away and be safe, "'it would not look as if either I confided too much in my own strength, "'or would tempt my ruin?' "'and if I were not in earnest to wish myself safe and out of danger? "'And then how long am I to stay? "'And to what purpose? "'And at what right must I appear to the world? "'Would that not censure me, though I might be innocent? "'And you will allow, sir, that if there be anything valuable or exemplary in a good name or fair reputation, "'one must not despise the world's censure if one can avoid it.' "'Well,' said he, I sent not for you on this account just now, but for two reasons. The first is that you promise me that for a fortnight to come you will not offer to go away without my express content. And this I expect for your own sake, that I might give you a little more liberty. And the second is that you will see and forgive Mrs. Jukes. She takes on much, and thinks that as all her fault was her obedience to me, it would be very hard to sacrifice her as she calls it, to your resentment. As to the first, said I, it is a hard injunction, for the reasons I have mentioned. And as to the second, considering her vile, unwomanly wickedness, and her endeavours you to instigate you more to ruin me, when your returning goodness seemed to have some compassion upon me, it is still harder. But to show my obedience to your commands, for you know, my dear parents, I might as well make a merit of my compliance, when my refusal would stand me in no stead. I will consent to both, and to everything else that you shall be pleased to enjoy, which I can do with innocence. That's my good girl, said he, and kissed me. This is quite prudent, and shows me that you don't take insolent advantage of my faith for you, and will perhaps stand you in more stead than you are aware of. So he rang the bell, and said, Call down Mrs. Jukes. She came down, and he took my hand and put it into hers, and said, Mrs. Jukes, I am obliged to you for all your diligence and fidelity to me. But Pamela, I must own, is not, because the service I employed you in was not so very obliging to her as I could have wished she would have thought it. And you were not to favour her, but obey me. 
but yet I'll assure you, at the very first word, she has at once obliged me by consenting to be friends with you, and if she gives me no great cause, I shall not, perhaps, put you on such disagreeable service again. Now, therefore, be you once more bedfellows and boardfellows, as I may say, for some days longer, and see that Pamela sends no letters nor messages out of the house, nor keeps a correspondence unknown to me, especially with that Williams. And as for the rest, show the dear girl all the respect that is due to one I must love, if she will deserve it, as I hope she will yet. And let her be under no unnecessary or harsh restraints. But your watchful care is not, however, to cease. And remember that you are not to disoblige me to oblige her, and that I will not, cannot, yet part with her. Mrs. Jukes looked very sullen, as if she would be glad still to do me a good turn, if it lay in her power. I took courage, then, to drop a word or two for poor Mr. Williams, but he was angry with me for it, and said he could not endure to hear his name in my mouth, so I was forced to have done for that time. All this time my papers, that I buried under the rose-bush, lay there still, and I begged for leave to send a letter to you. So I should, he said, if he might read it first, but this did not answer my design, and yet I would have sent you such a letter as he might see, if I had been sure my danger was over. But that I cannot, for he now seems to take another method, and what I am more afraid of, because, maybe, he may watch an opportunity, and join force with it on occasion, when I am least prepared. For now he seems to abound with kindness, and talks of love without reserve, and makes nothing of allowing himself in the liberty of kissing me, which he calls innocent, but which I do not like, and especially in the manner he does it. But for the master to do it at all to a servant has meaning too much in it, not to alarm an honest body. Wednesday morning. I find I am watched and suspected still very close and I wish I was with you, but that must not be, it seems, this fortnight. I don't like this fortnight, and it will be a tedious and dangerous one to me, I doubt. My master just now sent for me to take a walk with him in the garden, but I like him not at all, nor his ways, for he would have, all the way, his arm about my waist, and said abundance of fond things to me, enough to make me proud, if his design had not been apparent. After walking about, he led me into a little alcove on the farthest part of the garden, and really made me afraid of myself, for he began to be very teasing, and made me sit on his knee, and was so often kissing me that I said, "'Sir, I don't like to be here at all, I assure you. Indeed, you make me afraid.' And what made me the more so was what he once said to Mrs. Jukes, and did not think I heard him and which, although almost uppermost with me, I did not mention before, because I did not know how to bring it in, in my writing. She, I suppose, had been encouraging him in his wickedness, for it was before the last dreadful trial, and I only heard what he answered. Said he, I will try once more, but I have begun wrong, for I see terror does but add to her frost, but she is a charming girl, and may be thawed by kindness and I should have melted her by love, instead of freezing her by fear. Is he not a wicked sad man for this? To be sure I blush while I write it. But I trust that dear God, who has delivered me from the paw of the lion and the bear, that is, he and Mrs. Duke's violences, will soon deliver me from this Philistine, that I may not defy the commands of the living God. But, as I was saying, this expression coming into my thoughts— I was of opinion I could not be too much on my guard at all times, more especially when he took such liberties, for he professed honour all the time with his mouth, while his actions did not correspond. I begged and prayed he would let me go, and had I not appeared quite regardless of all he said, and resolved not to stay if I could help it, I know not how far he would have proceeded, for I was forced to fall down upon my knees. At last he walked out with me, still bragging of his honour and his love. "'Yes, yes, sir,' said I, "'your honour is to destroy mine, and your love is to ruin me. I see it too plainly.' 
"'But, indeed, I will not talk with you, sir,' said I, any more. "'Do you know,' said he, "'whom you talk to and where you are?' "'You may believe I had reason to think him not so decent as he should be. "'For I said, "'As to where I am, sir, I know it too well, "'and that I have no creature to befriend me, "'and as to whom I talk to, sir, let me ask you, "'what would you have me answer?' "'Why, tell me,' said he, "'what answer you would make?' "'It will only make you angry,' said I, "'and so I shall fare worse, if possible.' "'I won't be angry,' said he. "'Why then, sir,' said I, "'you cannot be my late good lady's son, "'for she loved me and taught me virtue. "'You cannot then be my master, "'for no master demeans himself so to his poor servant.' He put his arms round me and his other hand on my neck, which made me more angry and bold, and he said, "'What then am I?' "'Why,' said I, struggling from him and in great passion, "'to be sure you are Lucifer himself in the shape of my dear master, or you could not use me thus.' "'These are two great liberties,' said he, in anger, "'and I desire that you will not repeat them for your own sake. "'For if you have no decency towards me, I'll have none toward you.' I was running from him, and he said, "'Come back when I bid you.' So, knowing every place was alike dangerous to me, and I had nobody to run to, I came back at his call. And seeing him look so displeased, I held my hands together and wept, and said, "'Pray, sir, forgive me.' "'No,' said he, "'rather say, "'Pray, Lucifer, forgive me. "'And now, since you take me for the devil, "'how can you expect any good from me?' "'How rather can you expect anything but the worst treatment from me? "'You have given me a character, Pamela, "'and blame me not that I act up to it. "'Sir,' said I, "'let me beg you to forgive me. "'I am really sorry for my boldness, "'but indeed you don't use me like a gentleman, "'and how can I express my resentment if I mince the matter "'while you are so indecent?' "'Precise fool,' said he, "'what indecencies have I offered you?' I was bewitched I had not gone through my purpose last Sunday night, and then your licentious tongue had not given the worst name to little puny freedoms that show my love and my folly at the same time. But be gone, said he, taking my hand and tossing it from him, and learn another conduct and more wit, and I will lay aside my foolish regard for you and assert myself. Be gone, said he again with a haughty air. "'Indeed, sir,' said I, "'I cannot go till you pardon me, "'which I beg on my bended knees. "'I am truly sorry for my boldness. "'But I see how you go on. "'You creep by little and little upon me, "'and now soothe me and now threaten me, "'and if I should forbear to show my resentment "'when you offer incivilities to me, "'would that not be to be lost by degrees? "'Would it not show that I could bear anything from you?' "'if I did not express all the indignation I could express "'at the first approaches you make to what I dread? "'And have you not as good as avowed my ruin? "'And have you once made me hope you will quit your purposes against me? "'How then, sir, can I act? "'But by showing my abhorrence for every step that makes towards my undoing. "'And what is left to me but words?' "'And can these words be other than such strong ones "'as shall show the detestation for which, from the bottom of my heart, "'I have for every attempt upon my virtue? "'Judge for me, sir, and pardon me.' "'Pardon you,' said he, "'what, when you don't repent? "'When you have the boldness to justify yourself in your fault? "'Why don't you say you will never again offend me?' "'I will endeavour, sir,' said I, "'always to preserve that decency towards you which becomes me. "'But really, sir, I must beg your excuse for saying "'that when you forget what belongs to decency in your actions, "'and when words are all that are left me "'to show my resentment of such actions, "'I will not promise to forbear the strongest expressions "'that my distressed mind shall suggest to me, "'nor shall your angriest frowns deter me "'when my honesty is in question.' "'What then,' said he, "'do you beg pardon for? "'Where is the promise of amendment "'for which I shall forgive you?' "'Indeed, sir,' said I, "'I own that it must absolutely depend "'on your usage of me. 
for I will bear anything you can inflict upon me with patience, even to the laying down of my life, to show my obedience to you in other cases. But I cannot be patient, I cannot be passive, when my virtue is at stake. It would be criminal in me if I was. He said he never saw such a fool in his life, and he walked by the side of me some yards without saying a word, and seemed vexed and at last walked in, bidding me attend him in the garden after dinner. So, having a little time, I went up and wrote thus far. Wednesday night If, my dear parents, I am not destined more surely than ever for ruin, I have now more comfort before me than ever I knew, and am either nearer my misery or my happiness than ever I was. God protect me from the latter, if it be his blessed will. I have now such a scene to open to you that I know will alarm both your hopes and your fears as it does mine, and this it is. After my master had dined, he took a turn into the stables to look at his stud of horses, and when he came in he opened the parlour door where Mrs. Jukes and I sat at dinner, and at his entrance we both rose up, but he said, Sit still, sit still, and let me see how you eat your victuals, Pamela. "'Oh,' said Mrs. Dukes, "'very poorly indeed, sir.' "'No,' said I, "'pretty well, sir, considering.' "'None of your considering,' said he, "'pretty face, and tapped me on the cheek. "'I blushed, but was glad he was so good-humoured, "'but I could not tell how to sit before him, "'nor to behave myself. "'So he said, "'I know, Pamela, you are a nice carver. "'My mother used to say so.' "'My lady, sir,' said I, "'was very good to me in everything.' and would always make me do the honours of her table for her, when she was with her few select friends that she loved. "'Cut up,' said he, "'that chicken.' "'I did so. "'Now,' said he, and took the knife and fork, and put a wing upon my plate, "'let me see you eat that.' "'Oh, sir,' said I, "'I have eaten a whole breast of chicken already, and cannot eat so much.' "'But he said I must eat it for his sake, and he would teach me to eat heartily.' So I did eat it, but was much confused at his so kind and unusual freedom and condescension. And good lack, you cannot imagine how Mrs. Jukes looked and stared, and how respectable she seemed to me, and called me good madam, I'll assure you, urging me to take a little bit of tart. My master took two or three turns about the room, musing and thoughtful, as I had never before seen him, and at last went out saying, I am going into the garden. You know, Pamela, what I said to you before dinner. I rose and curtsied, saying, I would attend his honour, and he said, Do, good girl. Well, said Mrs. Jukes, I see how things will go. Oh, madam, as she called me again, I am sure you to be our mistress, and then I know what will become of me. Ah, Mrs. Jukes, said I, if I can but keep myself virtuous, tis the most of my ambition, and I hope no temptation shall make me otherwise. Notwithstanding I had no reason to be pleased with his treatment of me before dinner, yet I made haste to attend him, and I found him walking by the side of that pond, which, for want of grace and through a sinful despondence, had liked to have been so fatal to me, and the sight of which ever since has been a trouble and reproach to me. And it was by the side of this pond, and not far from the place where I had that dreadful conflict, that my present hopes, if I am not to be deceived again, began to dawn, which I presumed to flatter myself with being a happy omen for me, as if God Almighty would show your poor sinful daughter how well I did to put my affiance to his goodness, and not to throw away myself, because my ruin seemed inevitable to my short-sighted apprehension. So, he was pleased to say, Well, Pamela, I am glad you have come of your own accord, as I may say. Give me your hand. I did so, and he looked at me very steadily, and pressing my hand all the time, at last said, I will now talk to you in a serious manner. You have a good deal of wit, a great deal of penetration, much beyond your years, and, as I thought, your opportunities. You are possessed of an open, frank, and generous mind, and a person so lovely that you excel all your sex in my eyes. All these accomplishments have engaged my affection so deeply that, as I have often said, I cannot live without you. 
and I would divide, with all my soul, my estate with you to make you mine upon my own terms. These you have absolutely rejected, and that, though in saucy terms enough, yet in such a manner as to make me admire you all the more. Your pretty chit-chat to Mrs. Jukes the last Sunday night, so innocent and so full of beautiful simplicity, half disarmed my resolution before I approached your bed. And I see you so watchful over your virtue, that, though I hope to find it otherwise, I cannot but confess my passion for you is increased by it. But now what shall I say farther, Pamela? I will make you, through a party, my adviser in this matter, though not perhaps my definite judge. You know I am not a very abandoned profligate. I have hitherto been guilty of no very enormous or vile actions. This of seizing you and confining you thus may perhaps be one of the worst, at least to persons of real innocent. Had I been utterly given up to my passions, I should before now have gratified them, and not have shown that remorse and compassion for you which have reprieved you more than once when absolutely in my power, and you are as inviolate a virgin as you were when you first came into my house. But what can I do? Consider the pride of my condition. I cannot endure the thought of marriage even with a person of equal or superior degree to myself, and have declined several proposals of that kind. How, then, with the distance between us in the world's judgment, can I think of making you my wife? Yet I must have you. I cannot bear the thoughts of any other man supplanting me in your affections. And the very apprehension of that has made me hate the name of Williams, and use him in a manner unworthy of my temper. Now, Pamela, judge for me. And since I have told you thus candidly my mind, and I see yours is big with some important meaning, by your eyes, your blushes, and that sweet confusion which I behold struggling in your bosom, tell me, with like openness and candour, what you think I ought to do, and what you would have me do. It is impossible for me to express the agitations of my mind on this unexpected declaration, so contrary to his former behaviour. His manner, too, had something so noble and so sincere as I thought, but alas for me, I found I had need of all my poor discretion to ward off the blow which this treatment gave to my most guarded thoughts. I threw myself at his feet, for I trembled and could hardly stand. Oh, sir, said I, spare your poor servant's confusion. Oh, spare the poor Pamela. Speak out, said he, and tell me what I bid you. What do you think I ought to do? I cannot say what you ought to do, answered I. But I only beg that you will not ruin me, and if you think me virtuous, if you think me sincerely honest, let me go to my poor parents. I will vow to you that I will never suffer myself to be engaged without your approbation. Still he insisted upon a more explicit answer to his question, of what I thought he ought to do. And I did, as to my poor thoughts of what you ought to do, I must needs say that indeed I think you ought to regard the world's opinion, and afford doing anything disgraceful to your birth and fortune. And therefore, if you really honour the poor Pamela with your respect, a little time, absence, and the conversation of worthier persons of my sex, will effectually enable you to overcome a regard so unworthy your condition. And this, good sir, is the best advice I can offer. Charming creature, lovely Pamela, said he, with an ardour that was never before so agreeable to me. This generous manner is of a piece with all the rest of your conduct. But tell me still more explicitly what you would advise me to do in the case. Oh, sir, said I, take not advantage of my credulity, and in these my weak moments. But were I the first lady in the land instead of the poor abject Pamela, I would, I could tell you, but I can say no more. Oh, dear father and mother, now I know you will indeed be concerned for me, for now I am for myself, and now I begin to be afraid I know too well the reason why all his hard trials of me and my black apprehensions would not let me hate him. But be assured still by God's grace that I shall do nothing unworthy of your Pamela, 
and if I find that he is still capable of deceiving me, and that this conduct is only put on to delude me more, I shall think nothing in this world so vile and so odious. And nothing, if he be not the worst of his kind, as he says, and I hope he is not, so desperately guileful as the heart of man. He generously said, I will spare your confusion, Pamela, but I hope I may promise myself that you can love me preferably to any other man, and that no one in the world has any share in your affections, for I am very jealous of what I love, and if I thought you had a secret whispering in your soul that had not come up to a wish for any other man breathing, I should not forgive myself to persist in my affection for you, nor you if you did not frankly acquaint me with it. As I still continued on my knees on the grass border by the pond side, he sat himself down on the grass by me, and took me in his arms. "'Why hesitate, my dear Pamela?' said he. "'Can you not answer me with truth, as I wish? If you cannot, speak, and I will forgive you.' "'Oh, good sir,' said I, "'it is not that, indeed it is not, but a frightful word or two that you said to Mrs. Jukes when you thought I was not in hearing comes across my mind.' and makes me dread that I am more danger than I ever was in my life. "'You have never found me a common liar,' said he, too fearful and foolish Pamela. "'Nor will I answer how long I may hold in my present mind, for my pride struggles hard within me, I'll assure you, and if you doubt me I have no obligation to your confidence or opinion. But at present I am really sincere in what I say, and I expect you will be so too.' and answer directly my question. "'I find, sir,' said I, "'I know not myself, and your question is of such a nature that I only want to tell you what I heard, and to have your kind answer to it, or else what I have to say to your question may pave the way to my ruin and show a weakness that I did not believe was in me.' "'Well,' said he, "'you may say what you have overheard, for in not answering me directly you put my soul upon the rack.' and half the trouble I have had with you would have brought to my arms one of the finest ladies in England. Oh, sir, said I, my virtue is as dear to me as if I were of the highest quality, and my doubts, for which you know I have had too much reason, have made me troublesome. But now, sir, I will tell you what I heard, which has given me such great uneasiness. You talk to Mrs. Jukes of having begun wrong with me in trying to subdue me with terror and a frost and such like. You remember it well, and that you would, for the future, change your conduct and try to melt me, that was your word, by kindness. I fear not, sir, the grace of God supporting me, that any acts of kindness would make me forget what I owe to my virtue. But, sir, I may, I find, be made more miserable by such acts than by terror, because my nature is too frank or open to make me wish to be ungrateful. And if I should be taught a lesson I never yet learnt, with what regret should I descend to the grave, to think that I could not hate my undoer, and that at the last great day I must stand up as an accuser of the poor unhappy soul that I could wish it in my power to save. Exalted girl, said he, what a thought is that! Why now, Pamela, you excel yourself! "'You have given me a hint that will hold me long. "'But, sweet creature,' said he, "'tell me what is this lesson which you never yet learnt "'and which you are so afraid of learning?' "'If, sir,' said I, "'you will again generously spare my confusion, "'I need not speak it. "'But this I will say, in answer to the question "'you seem most solicitous about, "'that I know not the man breathing "'that I would wish to be married to, "'or had ever thought of with such an idea.' I had brought my mind so to love poverty that I hoped for nothing but to return to the best though the poorest of parents, and to employ myself in serving God and comforting them. And you know not, sir, how you disappointed those hopes and my proposed honest pleasures when you sent me hither. Well then, said he, I may promise myself that neither the parson nor any other man is any the least secret motive to your steadfast refusal of my offers? Indeed, sir, said I, you may, and as you are pleased to ask, I answer that I have not the least shadow of wish or thought for any man living. But, said he, for I am foolishly jealous, and yet it shows my fondness for you, 
"'Have you not encouraged Williams to think you will have him?' "'Indeed, sir, I have not. "'But the very contrary. "'And would you not have had him,' said he, "'if you had got away by his means? "'I had resolved, sir,' said I, "'in my mind otherwise. "'And he knew it. "'And the poor man, I, I charge you,' said he, "'say not a word in his favour. "'You will excite a whirlwind in my soul "'if you name him with kindness. "'And then you'll be borne away with the tempest.' "'Sir,' said I, "'I have done. "'Nay,' said he, "'but do not have done. "'Let me know the whole. "'If you have any regard for him, speak out, "'for it would end fearfully for you, for me, and for him, "'if I found that you disguised any secret of your soul from me "'in this nice particular. "'Sir,' said I, "'if I have ever given you cause to think me sincere,' "'Say, then,' said he, interrupting me with great vehemence, "'and taking both my hands between his, "'say that you now, in the presence of God, "'declare you have not any the most hidden regard "'for Williams or any other man.' "'Sir,' said I, "'I do. "'As God shall bless me and preserve my innocence, I have not.' "'Well,' said he, "'I will believe you, Pamela, "'and in time, perhaps, I may better bear that man's name.' "'and if I am convinced that you are not prepossessed, "'my vanity makes me assured "'that I need not fear a place in your esteem "'equal, if not preferable, to any man in England. "'But yet it stings my pride to the quick "'that you were so easily bought "'and such a short acquaintance "'to run away with that college novice. "'Oh, good sir,' said I, "'may I be heard one thing?' "'and though I bring upon me your highest indignation, "'I will tell you perhaps the unnecessary and imprudent, "'but yet the whole truth. "'My honesty, I am poor and lowly, "'and not entitled to call it honour, was in danger. "'I saw no means of securing myself from your avowed attempts. "'You had showed you were not stick at little matters, "'and from what, sir, could any body have thought of my sincerity, "'in preferring that to all other considerations?' "'If I had not escaped from these dangers, "'if I could have found any way for it, "'I am not going to say anything for him, "'but indeed, sir, I was the cause of putting him "'upon assisting me in my escape. "'I got him to acquaint me what gentry there were "'in the neighbourhood that I might fly to, "'and prevailed upon him, "'don't frown at me, good sir, for I must tell you the whole truth, "'to apply to one Lady Jones, to Lady Downford, "'and he was so good as to apply to Mr. Peters, the minister.' "'but they all refused me. "'And then it was he let me know "'that there was no honourable way but marriage. "'That I declined, and he agreed to assist me for God's sake. "'Now,' said he, "'you are going.' "'I boldly put my hand before his mouth, "'hardly knowing the liberty I took. "'Pray, sir,' said I, "'don't be angry. "'I have just done, I would only say, "'that rather than have stayed to be ruined,' I would have thrown myself upon the poorest beggar that ever the world saw, if I thought him honest. And I hope, when you duly weigh all matters, you will forgive me, and not think me so bold and so forward as you have been pleased to call me. Well, said he, even in this your last speech, let me tell you, shows more your honesty of heart than your prudence. You have not overmuch pleased me, but I must love you, and that vexes me not a little. But tell me, Pamela, for now the former question recurs. Since you so much prize your honour and your virtue, since all attempts against that are so odious to you, and since I have avowedly made several of these attempts, do you think it possible for you to love me preferably to any other of my sex? Ah, sir, said I, and here my doubt recurs, that you may thus graciously use me to take advantage of my credulity. "'Still perverse and doubting,' said he, "'cannot you take me as I am at present? "'And that I have told you is sincere and undesigning, "'whatever I may be hereafter.' "'Ah, sir,' replied I, "'what can I say? "'I have already said too much. "'If this dreadful hereafter should take place, "'don't bid me say how well I can. "'And then, my face glowing as the fire, "'I, all abashed, leaned upon his shoulder "'to hide my confusion.' He clasped me to him with great ardour, and said, Hide your dear face in my bosom, my beloved Pamela. Your innocent freedoms charm me. But then say, How well, what? 
"'If you will be good,' said I, "'to your poor servant, and spare her, "'I cannot say too much. "'But if not, I am doubly undone. "'Undone indeed!' "'Said he, "'I hope my present temper will hold, "'for I tell you frankly "'that I have known, in this agreeable hour, "'more sincere pleasure than I have experienced "'in all the guilty tumults "'that my desiring soul pelled me into, "'in the hopes of possessing you on my own terms. "'And, Pamela, you must pray for the continuance of this temper, "'and I hope your prayers will get the better of my temptations. "'This sweet goodness overpowered all my reserves. "'I threw myself at his feet and embraced his knees. "'What pleasure, sir, you give me at these gracious words!' is not lent your servants to express. I shall be too much rewarded for all my sufferings, if this goodness hold. God grant that it may, for your own soul's sake as well as mine. And oh, how happy should I be if... He stopped me and said, But my dear girl, what must we do about the world and the world's censure? Indeed, I cannot marry. Now was I again struck all of a heap. However, soon recollecting myself, Sir, said I, I have not the presumption to hope such an honour. If I may be permitted to return in peace and safety to my poor parents to pray for you there, it is all I present request. This, sir, after all my apprehensions and dangers, will be a great pleasure to me. And if I know my own poor heart, I shall wish you happy in a lady of suitable degree, I rejoice most sincerely in every circumstance that shall make for the happiness of my late good lady's most beloved son. Well, said he, this conversation, Pamela, has gone further than I intended. You need not be afraid at this rate of trusting yourself with me, but it is I that ought to be doubtful of myself when I am with you. But before I say anything further on this subject, I will take my proud heart to task. Until then, let everything be as if this conversation had never passed. Only let me tell you that the more confidence you place in me, the more you'll oblige me. But your doubts will only beget cause of doubts. And with this ambiguous saying, he saluted me with a more formal manner, if I may so say, than before, and lent me his hand, and so we walked toward the house side by side, him seemingly very thoughtful and pensive, as if he had already repented him of his goodness. What shall I do? What steps take, if all this be designing? Oh, the perplexities of these cruel doubtings! To be sure, if he be false, as I may call it, I have gone too far, much too far. I am ready on the apprehension of this to bite my forward tongue, or rather to beat my more forward heart to dictator to that poor machine. "'for what I have said. "'But sure at least he must be sincere for the time. "'He could not be so practised a dissembler. "'If he could, oh, desperately wicked is the heart of man. "'And where could he learn all these barbarous arts? "'If so, it must be native surely to the sex. "'But silent be my rash censuring, "'be hushed, ye stormy tumults of my disturbed mind. "'For have I not a father who is a man?' A man who knows no guile, who would do no wrong, who would not deceive or oppress to gain a kingdom? How then can I think it is native to the sex? And I must also hope my good lady's son cannot be the worst of men. If he is, hard the lot of the excellent woman that bore him. But much harder the hap of your poor Pamela, who has fallen into such hands. But yet I will trust in God and hope the best and so lay down my tired pen for this time. End of section 15 Section 16 of Pamela, or Virtue Rewarded This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pamela, or Virtue Rewarded, by Samuel Richardson, Section 16 Thursday morning Somebody rapped at our chamber door this morning, soon after it was light. Mrs. Jukes asked who it was. My master said, 
open the door mrs jukes oh said i for god's sake mrs jukes don't indeed said she but i must then said i and clung about her let me slip on my clothes first but he rapped again and she broke from me and i was frightened out of my wits and folded myself in the bedclothes he entered and said what pamela so fearful after what passed yesterday between us oh sir sir said i i fear my prayers have wanted their wished effect pray good sir consider he sat down on the bedside and interrupted me no need of your foolish fears i shall say but a word or two and go away after you went upstairs said he i had an invitation to a ball which is to be this night at stamford on occasion of a wedding and i am going to call on sir simon and his lady and daughters for the bride is a relation of theirs so i shall not be at home till saturday i come therefore to caution you mrs jukes before pamela that she may not wonder at being closer confined than for these three or four days past that nobody sees her nor delivers any letter to her in that space for a person has been seen lurking about and inquiring after her and i have been well informed that either mrs jervis or mr longman has written a letter with a design of having it conveyed to her and said he you must know pamela that i have ordered mr longman to give up his accounts and have dismissed jonathan and mrs jervis since i have been here for their behaviour has been intolerable and they have made such a breach between my sister davers and me as we shall never perhaps make up now pamela i shall take it kindly in you if you will confine yourself to your chamber pretty much for the time i am absent and not give mrs jukes cause of trouble or uneasiness and the rather as you know she acts by my orders alas sir said i i fear all these good people have suffered for my sake why said he i believe so too and there was never a girl of your innocence that set a large family in such an uproar surely but let that pass you know both of you my mind and in part the reason of it i shall only say that i have had such a letter from my sister as i could not have expected and pamela said he neither you nor i have reason to thank her as you shall know perhaps at my return i go in my coach mrs jukes because i take lady darnford and mrs peter's niece and one of lady darnford's daughters along with me and sir simon and his other daughter go in his chariot so let all the gates be fastened and don't take any airing in either of the chariots nor let anybody go to the gate without you mrs jukes i'll be sure said she to obey your honour i will give mrs jukes no trouble sir said i and will keep pretty much in my chamber and not stir so much as into the garden without her to show you i will obey in everything i can but i begin to fear ay said he more plots and contrivances don't you but i'll assure you you never had less reason and i tell you the truth for i am really going to stamford this time and upon the occasion i tell you and so pamela give me your hand and one kiss and then i am gone i durst not refuse and said god bless you sir wherever you go but i am sorry for what you tell me about your servants he and mrs jukes had a little talk without the door and i heard her say you may depend sir upon my care and vigilance he went in his coach as he said he should and very richly dressed which looks as if what he said was likely but really i have been used to so many tricks and plots and surprises that i know not what to think but i mourn for poor mrs jervis so here is parson williams here is poor naughty john here is good mrs jervis and mr longman and mr jonathan turned away from me mr longman is rich indeed and so need the less matter it but i know it will grieve him and for poor mr jonathan i am sure it will cut that good servant to the heart alas for me what mischiefs i am the occasion of or rather my master whose actions towards me have made so many of my kind friends forfeit his favour for my sake i am very sad about these things if he really loved me methinks he should not be so angry that his servants loved me too i know not what to think friday night i have removed my papers from under the rose-bush for i saw the gardener begin to dig near that spot and i was afraid he would find them mrs jukes and i were looking yesterday through the iron gate that fronts the elms and a gypsy-like body made up to us and said if madame you will give me some broken victuals i will tell both of you your fortunes i said let us hear our fortunes mrs jukes she said i don't like these sorts of people but we will hear what she'll say to us however i shan't fetch you any victuals woman but i will give you some pence said she but nan coming out she said fetch some bread and some of the cold meat and you shall have your fortune told nan this you'll think like some of my other matters a very trifling thing to write about but mark the discovery of a dreadful plot which i have made by it oh bless me what can i think of this naughty this very naughty gentleman now i will hate him most heartily 
thus it was mrs jukes had no suspicion of the woman the iron gate being locked and she on the outside and we on the inside and so put her hand through she said muttering over a parcel of cramped words why madame he will marry soon i can tell you at that she seemed pleased and said i am glad to hear that and shook her fat sides with laughing the woman looked most earnestly at me all the time and as if she had meaning then it came into my head from my master's caution that possibly this woman might be employed to try to get a letter into my hands and i was resolved to watch all her motions so mrs jukes said what sort of man shall i have pray why said she a man younger than yourself and a very good husband he'll prove i am glad of that said she and laughed again come madame let us hear your fortune the woman came to me and took my hand oh said she i cannot tell your fortune your hand is so white and fine i cannot see the lines but said she and stooping pulled up a little tuft of grass i have a way for that and so rubbed my hand with the mould part of the tuft now said she i can see the lines mrs jukes was very watchful of all her ways and took the tuft and looked upon it lest anything should be in that and then the woman said here is the line of jupiter crossing the line of life and mars odd my pretty mistress said she you had best take care of yourself for you are hard beset i'll assure you you will never be married i can see and will die of your first child out upon thee woman said i better thou hast never come here said mrs jukes whispering i don't like this it looks like a cheat pray mrs pamela go in this moment so i will said i for i have enough of fortune-telling and in i went the woman wanted sadly to tell me more which made mrs jukes threaten her suspecting still the more and away the woman went having told nan her fortune and she would be drowned this thing ran strongly in all our heads and we went after an hour to see if the woman was lurking about and took mr colbrand for our guard looking through the iron gate he spied a man sauntering about the middle of the walk which filled mrs jukes with still more suspicions and she said mr colbrand you and i will walk towards this fellow and see what he saunters there for and nan do you and madame stay at the gate so they opened the iron gate and walked towards the man and guessing the woman if employed must mean something by the tuft of grass i cast my eye that way whence she pulled it and saw more grass seemingly pulled up then i doubted not something was there for me and i walked to it and standing over it said to nan that's a pretty sort of wild flower that grows yonder near the elm the fifth from us on the left pray pull it for me said she it is a common weed well said i but pull it for me there are sometimes beautiful colours in a weed while she went on i stooped and pulled up a good handful of the grass and in it a bit of paper which i put instantly in my bosom and dropped the grass and my heart went pit a pat at the odd adventure said i let's go in mrs anne no said she we must stay till mrs jukes comes i was all impatience to read this paper and when colbrand and she returned i went in said she certainly there is some reason for my master's caution i can make nothing of this sauntering fellow but to be sure there was some roguery in the gipsy well said i if there was she lost her aim you see ay very true said she but that was owing to my watchfulness and he was very good to go away when i spoke to you i hastened upstairs to my closet and found the billet to contain in a hand that seemed disguised and bad spelling the following words twenty contrivances have been thought of to let you know your danger but all have proved in vain your friends hope it is not yet too late to give you this caution if it reaches your hands the squire is absolutely determined to ruin you and because he despairs of any other way he will pretend a great love and kindness to you and that he will marry you you may expect a parson for this purpose in a few days but it is a sly artful fellow of a broken attorney that he has hired to personate a minister the man has a broad face pitted much with the smallpox and is a very great companion so take care of yourself doubt not this advice perhaps you'll have had but too much reason already to confirm you in the truth of it from your zealous well-wisher somebody now my dear father and mother what shall we say of this truly diabolical master oh how shall i find words to paint my griefs and his deceit i have as good as confessed i love him but indeed it was on supposing him good this however has given him too much advantage but now i will break this wicked forward heart of mine if it will not be taught to hate him oh what a black dismal heart he must have so here is a plot to ruin me and by my own consent too no wonder he did not improve his wicked opportunities which i thought owing to remorse for his sin and compassion for me when he had such a project as this in reserve 
here should i have been deluded with hopes of a happiness that my highest ambition could have aspired to but how dreadful must have been my lot when i had found myself an undone creature and a guilty harlot instead of a lawful wife oh this is indeed too much too much for your poor pamela to support this is the worst as i had hoped all the worst was over and that i had the pleasure of beholding a reclaimed man and not an abandoned libertine what now must your poor daughter do now all her hopes are dashed and if this fails him then comes to be sure my forced disgrace for this shows he will never leave till he has ruined me oh the wretched wretched pamela saturday noon one o'clock my master has come home and to be sure has been where he said so once he has told truth and this matter seems to be gone off without a plot no doubt he depends upon his sham wicked marriage he has brought a gentleman with him to dinner and so i have not seen him yet two o'clock i am very sorrowful and still have greater reason for just now as i was in my closet opening the parcel i had hid under the rose-bush to see if it was damaged by lying so long mrs jukes came upon me by surprise and laid her hands upon it for she had been looking through the keyhole it seems i know not what i shall do for now he will see all my private thoughts of him and all my secrets as i may say what a careless creature i am to be sure i deserve to be punished you know i had the good luck by mr william's means to send you all my papers down to sunday night the seventeenth day of my imprisonment but now these papers contain all my matters from that time to wednesday the twenty-seventh day of my distress and which as you may now perhaps never see i will briefly mention the contents to you in these papers then are included an account of mrs jukes's arts to draw me in to approve of mr williams's proposal for marriage and my refusing to do so and desiring you not to incur to suit to me mr williams's being wickedly robbed and a visit of hers to him whereby she discovered all his secrets how i was inclined to get off while she was gone but was ridiculously prevented by my foolish fears etc my having the key of the back door mrs jukes is writing to my master all the secrets she had discovered of mr williams and her behaviour to me and him upon it continuance of my correspondence with mr williams by the tiles begun in the parcel you had my reproaches to him for his revealing himself to mrs jukes and his letter to me in answer threatening to expose my master if he deceived him mentioning in it john arnold's correspondence with him and a letter which john sent and was intercepted as it seems of the correspondence being carried on by a friend of his at gainsborough of the horse he was to provide for me and one for himself of what mr williams had owned to mrs jukes and of my discouraging his proposals then it contained a pressing letter of mine to him urging my escape before my master came with his half-angry answer to me your good letter to me my dear father sent to me by mr williams's conveyance in which you would have me encourage mr williams but leave it to me and in which fortunately enough you take notice of my being uninclined to marry my earnest desire to be with you the substance of my answer to mr williams expressing more patience etc a dreadful letter of my master to mrs jukes which by mistake was directed to me and one to me directed by like mistake to her and very free reflections of mine upon both the concern i express for mr williams being taken in deceived and ruined an account of mrs jukes's glorying in her wicked fidelity a sad description i gave a monsieur colbrand a person he sent down to assist mrs jukes in watching me how mr williams was arrested and thrown into gaol and the concern i expressed upon it and my free reflections upon my master for it a projected contrivance of mine to get away out of the window and by the back door and throwing my petticoat and handkerchief into the pond to amuse them while i got off an attempt that had like to have ended very dreadfully for me my further concern for mr williams's ruin on my account and lastly my overhearing mrs jukes brag of her contrivance to rob mr williams in order to get at my papers which however he preserved and sent safe to you these down to the execution of my unfortunate plot to escape are to the best of my remembrance the contents of the papers which this merciless woman seized for how badly i came off and what followed i still have safe as i hope sewed in my undercoat about my hips in vain were all my prayers and tears to her to get her not to show them to my master for she said it had now come out why i affected to be so much alone and why i was always writing and she thought herself happy she said she had found these for often and often had she searched every place she could think of for writings to no purpose before 
and she hoped she said there was nothing in them by what anybody might see for said she you know you are all innocence insolent creature said i i am sure you are all guilt and so you must do your worst for now i can't help myself and i see there is no mercy to be expected from you just now my master being come up she went to him upon the stairs and gave him my papers there sir said she you always said mrs pamela was a great writer but i never could get at anything of hers before he took them and without coming to me went downstairs to the parlour again and what with the gipsy affair and what with this i could not think of going down to dinner and she told him that too and so i suppose i shall have him upstairs as soon as his company is gone saturday six o'clock my master came up and in a pleasanter manner than i expected said so pamela we have seized it seems your treasonable papers treasonable said i very sullenly ay said he i suppose so for you are a great plotter but i have not read them yet then sir said i very gravely it will be truly honourable in you not to read them but to give them to me again to whom says he are they written to my father sir but i suppose you see to whom indeed returned he i have not read three lines yet then pray sir don't read them but give them to me again that i will not said he till i have read them sir said i you served me not well in the letters i used to write formerly i think it was not worthy your character to contrive to get them in your hands by that false john arnold for should such a gentleman as you mind what your poor servant writes yes said he by all means mind what such a servant as my pamela writes your pamela thought i then the sham marriage came into my head and indeed it has not been out of it since the gipsy affair but said he have you anything in these papers you would not have me see to be sure sir said i there is for what one writes to one's father and mother is not for everybody to see nor said he am i everybody those letters added he that i did see by john's means were not to your disadvantage i'll assure you for they gave me a very high opinion of your wit and innocence and if i had not loved you do you think i would have troubled myself about your letters alas sir said i great pride to me that for they gave to you such an opinion of my innocence that you was resolved to ruin me and what advantage have they brought me who have made me a prisoner and used as i have been between you and your housekeeper why pamela said he a little seriously why this behaviour for my goodness to you in the garden this is not of a piece with your conduct and softness there that quite charmed me in your favour and you must not give me cause to think that you will be the more insolent as you find me kinder ah sir said i you know best your own heart and designs but i fear i was too open-hearted then and that you still keep your resolution to undo me and have only changed the form of your proceedings when i tell you once again said he a little sternly that you cannot oblige me more than by placing some confidence in me i will let you know that these foolish and perverse doubts are the worst things you can be guilty of but said he i shall possibly account for the cause of them in these papers of yours for i doubt not you have been sincere to your father and mother though you begin to make me suspect you for i tell you perverse girl that it is impossible you should be thus cold and insensible after what has passed in the garden if you were not prepossessed in some other person's favour and let me add that if i find it so it shall be attended with such effects as will make every vein in your heart bleed he was going away in wrath and i said one word good sir one word before you read them since you will read them pray make allowances for all the harsh reflections that you will find in them on your own conduct to me and remember only that they were not written for your sight and were penned by a poor creature hardly used and who was in constant apprehension of receiving from you the worst treatment that you could inflict upon her if that be all said he and there be nothing of another nature that i cannot forgive you have no cause for uneasiness for i had as many instances of your saucy reflections upon me in your former letters as there were lines and yet you see i have never upbraided you on that score though perhaps i wish you had been more sparing of your epithets and your freedoms of that sort well sir said i since you will you must read them and i think i have no reason to be afraid of being found insincere or having in any respect told you a falsehood because though i don't remember all i wrote yet i know i wrote my heart and that is not deceitful and remember sir another thing that i always declared i thought myself right to endeavour to make my escape from this forced and illegal restraint and so you must not be angry that i would have done so if i could i'll judge you never fear said he as favourably as you deserve for you have too powerful a pleader within me and so went downstairs about nine o'clock he sent for me down into the parlour 
I went a little fearfully, and he held the paper in his hand, and said, Now, Pamela, you come upon your trial. Said I, I hope I have a just judge to hear my cause. Ay, said he, and you may hope for a merciful one, too, or else I know not what will become of you. I expect, continued he, that you will answer me directly and plainly to every question I shall ask you. In the first place, here are several love-letters between you and Williams. "'Love-letters, sir,' said I. "'Well, call them what you will,' said he. "'I don't entirely like them, I'll assure you, with all the allowances you desired me to make for you.' "'Do you find, sir,' said I, "'that I encourage his proposal, or do you not?' "'Why,' said he, "'you discourage his address and appearance, but no otherwise than all your cunning sects do to ours to make us more eager in pursuing you.' "'Well, sir,' said I, "'that is your comment, but it does not appear so in the text.' "'Smartly said,' says he, "'where a devil gottest thou at these years all this knowledge? "'And then thou hast a memory, as I see by your papers, that nothing escapes. "'Alas, sir,' said I, "'what poor abilities I have serve only to make me more miserable. "'I have no pleasure in my memory, which impresses things upon me "'that I could be glad never were, or everlastingly to forget. "'Well,' said he, "'so much for that. "'But where are the accounts, since you have kept so exact a journal "'of all that has befallen you, previous to these here in my hand?' "'My father has them, sir,' said I. "'By whose means?' said he. "'By Mr. Williams's,' said I. "'Well answered,' said he. "'But cannot you contrive to get me a sight of them?' "'That would be pretty,' said I. "'I wish I could have contrived to have kept those you have from your sight,' said he. "'I must see them, Pamela, or I shall never be easy, "'for I must know how this correspondence between you and Williams began, "'and if I can see them it shall be better for you "'if they answer what these give me hope they will.' I can tell you, sir, very faithfully, said I, what the beginning was, for I was bold enough to be the beginner. That won't do, said he, for though this may appear a punctilio to you, to me it is of high importance. Sir, said I, if you please to let me go to my father, I will send them to you by any messenger you shall send for them. Will you so? But I dare say, if you will write for them, they will send them to you, without the trouble of such a journey to yourself, and I beg you will. I think, sir, said I, as you have seen all my former letters through John's baseness, and now these, through your faithful housekeeper's officious watchfulness, you might see all the rest. But I hope you will not desire it, till I can see how much my pleasing you in this particular will be of use to myself. You must trust to my honour for that. But tell me, Pamela, said the sly gentleman, since I have seen these, would you have voluntarily shown me these, had they been in your possession? I was not aware of this inference, and said, Yes, truly, sir, I think I should, if you commanded it. Well, then, Pamela, said he, as I am sure you have found means to continue your journal, I desire, till the former part can come, that you will show me the succeeding. Oh, sir, sir, said I, have you caught me so? But indeed you must excuse me there. Why, said he, tell me truly, have you not continued your account till now? Don't ask me, sir, said I, but I insist upon your answer, replied he. "'Why, then, sir, I will not tell an untruth I have. "'That's my good girl,' said he. "'I love sincerity at my heart. "'In another, sir,' I said, "'I presume you mean. "'Well,' said he, "'I'll allow you to be a little witty upon me, "'because it is in you, and you cannot help it. "'But you will greatly oblige me "'to show me voluntarily what you have written. "'I long to see the particulars of your plot "'and your disappointment where your papers leave off, "'for you have so beautiful a manner "'that it is partly that, and partly my love for you, "'that has made me desirous of reading all you write.' though a great deal of it is against myself. For what you must expect to suffer a little, and as I have furnished you with the subject, I have a title to see the fruits of your pen. Besides, said he, there is such a pretty air of romance as you relate them in your plots and my plots, that I shall be better directed in what manner to wind up the catastrophe of the pretty novel. If I was your equal, sir, said I, I should say this is a very provoking way of jeering at the misfortunes you have brought upon me. Oh, said he, the liberties you have taken with my character in your letters— sets us upon a par, at least in that respect. Sir, I could not have taken those liberties if you had not given me the cause, and the cause, sir, you know, is before the effect. True, Pamela, said he, you chop logic very prettily. What the deuce do we men go to school for? If our wits were equal to women's, we might spare much time and pain in our education, for nature teaches your sex, what in a long course of labour and study ours can hardly attain to. But, indeed, every lady is not a Pamela." "'You delight to banter your poor servant,' said I. "'Nay,' continued he, "'I believe I must assume to myself half the merit of your wit, too, "'for the innocent exercises you have had for it, from me, "'have certainly sharpened your invention.' "'Sir,' said I, "'could I have been without those innocent exercises, "'as you are pleased to call them, "'I should have been glad to have been as dull as a beetle. 
"'But then, Pamela,' said he, "'I should not have loved you so well. "'But then, sir, I should have been safe, easy, and happy. "'I, maybe so, and maybe not, "'and the wife, too, of some clouderly ploughboy. "'But then, sir, I should have been content and innocent, "'and that's better than being a princess, and not so. "'And maybe not,' said he, "'for if you had had that pretty face, "'some of us keen fox-hunters should have found you out, "'and, in spite of your romantic notions, which then, too, perhaps would not have had so strong a place in your mind, might have been more happy with the ploughman's wife than I have been with my mother's Pamela. I hope, sir, said I, God would have given me more grace. Well, but, resumed he, as to these writings of yours that follow your fine plot, I must see them. Indeed, sir, you must not, if I can help it. Nothing, said he, pleases me better than that, in all your arts, shifts, and stratagems, you have had a great regard to truth, and have, in all your little pieces of deceit, told very few willful fibs. Now I expect you'll continue with this laudable rule in your conversation with me. Let me know, then, where you have found supplies of pen, ink, and paper, when Mrs. Jukes was so vigilant, and gave you but two sheets at a time. Tell me truth. Why, sir, little did I think I should have such occasion for them. But, when I went away from your house, I begged some of each of good Mr. Longman, who gave me plenty. "'Yes, yes,' said he, "'it must be good, Mr. Longman. "'All of your confederates are good, every one of them, "'but such of my servants as have done their duty "'and obeyed my orders are painted out by you as black as devils. "'Nay, so am I, too, for that matter.' "'Sir,' said I, "'I hope you won't be angry, "'but, saving yourself, do you think they are painted worse than they deserve, "'or worse than the parts they acted require? "'You say, saving myself, Pamela, "'but is not that saying a mere compliment to me, "'because I am present and you are in my hands? "'Tell me truly.' "'Good sir, excuse me, but I fancy I might ask you, why you should think it so, if there was not a little bit of conscience that told you there was but too much reason for it.' He kissed me, and said, "'I must either do thus, or be angry with you, for you are very saucy, Pamela. But, with your bewitching chit-chat and pretty impertinence, I will not lose my question. Where did you hide your papers, pen, and ink?' "'Some, sir, in one place, some in another, that I might have some left if others should be found.' "'That's a good girl,' said he. "'I love you for your sweet veracity. "'Now tell me where it is you hide your written papers, your saucy journal.' "'I must beg your excuse for that, sir,' said I. "'But indeed,' answered he, "'you will not have it, for I will know, and I will see them.' "'This is very hard, sir,' said I. "'But I must say you shall not, if I can help it.' "'We were standing most of this time, but he then sat down, "'and took me by both my hands, and said, "'Well said, my pretty Pamela, if you can help it, "'but I will not let you help it.' "'Tell me, are they in your pocket?' "'No, sir,' said I, my heart up at my mouth. Said he, "'I know you won't tell a downright fib for the world, "'but for equivocation, no Jesuit ever went beyond you. "'Answer me, then, are they in neither of your pockets?' "'No, sir,' said I. "'Are they not,' said he, "'about your stays?' "'No, sir,' replied I, "'but pray no more questions, "'for ask me ever so much, I will not tell you.' "'Oh,' said he, "'I have a way for that. "'I can do as they do abroad, "'when the criminals won't confess, "'torture them till they do.' "'But pray, sir,' said I, "'is this fair, just, or honest? "'I am no criminal, and I won't confess.' "'Oh, my girl,' said he, "'many an innocent person has been put to the torture. "'But let me know where they are, "'and you shall escape the question, as they call it abroad.' "'Sir,' said I, "'the torture is not used in England, "'and I hope you won't bring it up.' "'Admirably said,' said the naughty gentleman. "'But I can tell you of as good a punishment. "'If a criminal won't plead with us here in England, "'we press him to death, or till he does plead.' "'And so now, Pamela, that is a punishment that shall certainly be yours if you won't tell without.' Tears stood in my eyes, and I said, "'This, sir, is very cruel and barbarous.' "'No matter,' said he, "'it is but like your Lucifer, you know, in my shape. "'And, after I have done so many heinous things by you as you think, "'you have no great reason to judge so hardly of this, "'or at least it is but a piece with the rest.' "'But, sir,' said I, dreadfully afraid he had some notion they were about me, if you will be obeyed in this unreasonable manner, though it is sad tyranny to be sure, let me go up to them, and read them over again, and you shall see so far as to the end of the sad story that follows those you have. I'll see them all, said he, down to this time, if you have written so far, or, at least, till within this week. Then let me go up to them, said I, and see what I have written, and to what day, to show them to you, for you won't desire to see everything. But I will, replied he. But say, Pamela, tell me the truth, are they above? I was much affrighted. He saw my confusion. "'Tell me truth,' said he. "'Why, sir,' answered I, "'I have sometimes hid them under the dry mould in the garden, sometimes in one place, sometimes in another, 
and those you have in your hand, were several days under a rose-bush in the garden. Artful slut, said he, what's this to my question? Are they not about you? If, said I, I must pluck them out of my hiding-place behind the wainscot, won't you see me? Still more and more artful, said he, is this an answer to my question? I have searched every place above and in your closet for them, and cannot find them, so I will know where they are. Now, said he, it is my opinion that they are about you, and I never undressed a girl in my life, but I will now begin to strip my pretty Pamela, and I hope I shall not go far before I find them. I fell a-crying, and said, I will not be used in this manner. Pray, sir, said I, for he began to unpin my handkerchief, consider. Pray, sir, do, and pray, said he, do you consider, for I will see these papers. But maybe, said he, they are tied about your knees with your garters, and stooped. Was anything so vile and so wicked? I fell on my knees, and said, What can I do? What can I do? If you'll let me go up, I'll fetch them to you. Will you, said he, on your honour, let me see them uncurtailed, and not offer to make them away? No, not a single paper? I will, sir. On your honour? Yes, sir. And so he let me go upstairs, crying sadly for vexation to be so used. Surely nobody was ever so served as I am. I went to my closet, and there I sat me down, and could not bear the thought of giving up my papers. Besides, I must all undress me, in a manner, to untack them. So I writ thus. Sir, to expostulate with such an arbitrary gentleman I know will signify nothing, and most hardly do you use the power you so wickedly have got over me. I have heart enough, sir, to do a deed that would make you regret using me thus, and I can hardly bear it, and what I am further to undergo. But a superior consideration withholds me, thank God it does. I will, however, keep my word, if you insist upon it when you have read this. But, sir, let me beg of you to give me time till to-morrow morning, that I may just run them over, and see what I put into your hands against me, and I will then give my papers to you, without the least alteration, or adding, or diminishing. But I should beg still to be excused, if you please. But if not, spare them to me but till to-morrow morning, and this, so hardly am I used, shall be thought of a favour, which I shall be very thankful for. I guessed it would not be long before I heard from him, and he accordingly sent up Mrs. Jukes for what I had promised. So I gave her this note to carry to him, and he sent word that I must keep my promise, and he would give me till morning, but that I must bring them to him without his asking again. So I took off my undercoat, and with great trouble of mind unsued them from it. And there is a vast quantity of it. I will just slightly touch upon the subjects, because I may not, perhaps, get them again for you to see. They began with an account of my attempting to get away out of the window first, and then throwing my petticoat and handkerchief into the pond. How sadly I was disappointed, the lock of the back door being changed. How, in trying to climb over the door, I tumbled down, and was piteously bruised, the bricks giving way and tumbling upon me. How, finding I could not get off, and dreading the hard usage I should receive, I was so wicked as to think of throwing myself into the water. My sad reflections upon this matter. How Mrs. Jukes used me upon this occasion, when she found me. How my master had liked to have been drowned in hunting, and my concern for his danger, notwithstanding his usage of me. Mrs. Jukes' wicked reports, to frighten me that I was to be married to the ugly Swiss, who was to sell me on the wedding day to my master. Her vile way of talking to me, like a London prostitute. My apprehensions of seeing preparations made for my master's coming. Her causeless fears that I was trying to get away again, when I had no thoughts of it, and my bad usage upon it my master's dreadful arrival, and his hard, very hard treatment of me, and Mrs. Jukes' insulting of me, his jealousy of Mr. Williams and me, how Mrs. Jukes vilely instigated him to wickedness, and down to there I put into one parcel, hoping that would content him, but for fear it should not, I put into another parcel the following, viz. A copy of his proposals to me, of a great parcel of gold, and fine clothes and rings, and an estate of I can't tell what a year, and fifty pounds a year for the life of both of you, my dear parents, to be his mistress, with an insinuation that, maybe, he would marry me at the year's end, all sadly vile, with threatenings, if I did not comply, that he would ruin me without allowing me anything, a copy of my answer, refusing all, with just abhorrence, but begging at last his goodness towards me, and mercy on me, in the most moving manner I could think of, an account of his angry behaviour, and Mrs. Jukes' wicked advice hereupon, his trying to get me to his chamber, and my refusal to go. A deal of stuff and chit-chat between me and the odious Mrs. Jukes, in which she was very wicked and very insulting. Two notes I wrote, as if to be carried to church, to pray for his reclaiming and my safety, which Mrs. Jukes seized and officiously showed him. A confession of mine that, 
notwithstanding his bad usage i could not hate him my concern for mr williams a horrid contrivance of my master's to ruin me being in my room disguised in the clothes of the maid who lay with me and mrs jukes how narrowly i escaped it makes my heart ache to think of it still by falling into fits mrs jukes detestable part in this sad affair how he seemed moved at my danger and forbore his abominable designs and assured me he had offered no indecency how ill i was for a day or two after and how kind he seemed how he made me forgive mrs jukes how after this and great kindness pretended he made rude offers to me in the garden which i escaped how i resented them then i had written how kindly he behaved himself to me and how he praised me and gave me great hopes of his being good at last of the too tender impression this made upon me and how i began to be afraid of my own weakness and consideration for him though he had used me so ill how sadly jealous he was of mr williams and how i as justly could cleared myself as to his doubts on that score how just when he raised me up to the highest hope of his goodness he dashed me sadly again and went off more coldly my free reflections upon this trying occasion this brought matters down from thursday the twentieth day of my imprisonment to wednesday the forty first and here i was resolved to end let what would come for only thursday friday and saturday remained to give an account of and thursday he set out to a ball at stanford and friday was the gypsy story and this is saturday his return from stanford and truly i shall have but little heart to write if he is to see all so these two parcels of papers i have got ready for him against to-morrow morning to be sure i have always used him very freely in my writings and showed him no mercy but yet he must thank himself for it for i have only writ truth and i wish he had deserved a better character at my hands as well as for his own sake as mine so though i don't know whether ever you'll see what i write i must say that i will go to bed with remembering you in my prayers as i always do and as i know you do me and so my dear parents good night end of section sixteen section seventeen of pamela or virtue rewarded this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org pamela or virtue rewarded by samuel richardson section seventeen sunday morning i remembered what he said of not being obliged to ask again for my papers and what i should be forced to do and could not help i thought i might as well do in such a manner as might show i would not disoblige on purpose though i stomached this matter very heavily too i had therefore got in readiness my two parcels and he not going to church in the morning bid mrs jukes tell me he was gone into the garden i knew that was for me to go to him and so i went for how can i help being at his back which grieves me not a little though he is my master as i may say for i am so wholly in his power that it would do me no good to incense him and if i refused to obey him in little manners my refusal in greater would have the less weight so i went down to the garden but as he walked in one walk i took another that i might not seem too forward neither he soon spied me and said do you expect to be courted to come to me sir said i and crossed the walk to attend him i did not know but i should interrupt you in your meditations this good day was that the case said he truly and from your heart why sir said i i don't doubt but you have very good thoughts sometimes though not towards me i wish said he i could avoid thinking so well of you as i do but where are the papers i dare say you had them about you yesterday for you say in those i have that you will bury your writings in the garden for fear you should be searched if you did not escape this added he gave me a glorious pretense to search you and i had been vexing myself all night that i did not strip you garment by garment till i had found them oh fie sir said i let me not be scared with hearing that you had such a thought in earnest well said he i hope you have not now the papers to give me for i had rather find them myself i'll assure you i did not like this way of talk at all and thinking it best not to dwell upon it said well but sir you will excuse me i hope giving up my papers don't trifle with me said he where are they i think i was very good to you last night to humour you as i did if you had either added or diminished and have not strictly kept your promise woe be to you indeed sir said i i have neither added nor diminished but there is the parcel that goes with my sad attempt to escape and the terrible consequences it had like to have followed with and it goes down to the naughty articles you sent me and as you know all that has happened since i hope these will satisfy you 
He was going to speak, but I said, to drive him from thinking of any more, and I must beg you, sir, to read the matter favourably, if I have exceeded in any liberties of my pen. I think, said he, half smiling, you may wonder at my patience, that I can be so easy to read myself abused as I am by such a saucy slut. Sir, said I, I have wondered you should be so desirous to see my bold stuff, and, for that very reason, I have thought it a very good or a very bad sign. What, said he, is your good sign? that it may have an effect upon your temper at last in my favour when you see me so sincere your bad sign why that if you can read my reflections and observations upon your treatment of me with tranquillity and not be moved it is a sign of a very cruel and determined heart now pray sir don't be angry at my boldness in telling you so freely my thoughts you may perhaps said he be least mistaken when you think of your bad sign god forbid said i so i took out my papers and said here sir they are but if you please to return them without breaking the seal it will be very generous and i will take it for a great favour and a good omen he broke the seal instantly and opened them so much for your omen replied he i am sorry for it said i very seriously and was walking away whither now said he i was going in sir that you might have time to read them if you thought fit he put them into his pocket and said you have more than these yes sir but all they contain you know as well as i but i don't know said he the light you put things in and so give them to me if you have not a mind to be searched sir said i i can't stay if you won't forbear that ugly word give me then no reason for it where are the other papers why then unkind sir if it must be so here they are and so i gave him out of my pocket the second parcel sealed up as the former with this superscription from the naughty articles down through sad attempts to thursday the forty-second day of my imprisonment this is last thursday is it yes sir but now you will see what i write i will find some other way to employ my time for how can i write with any face what must be for your perusal and not for those i intended to read my melancholy stories yes said he i would have you continue your penmanship by all means and i assure you in the mind i am in i will not ask you for any after these except anything very extraordinary occurs and i have another thing to tell you added he that if you send for those from your father and let me read them i may very probably give them all back again to you and so i desire you will do it this a little encourages me to continue my scribbling but for fear of the worst i will when they come to any bulk contrive some way to hide them if i can that i may protest i have them not about me which before i could not say of a truth and that made him so resolutely bent to try to find them upon me for which i might have suffered frightful indecencies he led me then to the side of the pond and sitting down on the slope made me sit by him come said he this being the scene of part of your project and where you so artfully threw in some of your clothes i will just look upon that part of your relation sir said i let me then walk about at a little distance for i cannot bear the thought of it don't go far said he when he came as i suppose to the place where i mentioned the bricks falling upon me he got up and walked to the door and looked upon the broken part of the wall for it had not been mended and came back reading on to himself towards me and took my hand and put it under his arm why this said he my girl is a very moving tale it was a very desperate attempt and had you got out you might have been in great danger for you had a very bad and lonely way and i had taken such measures that that you have been where you would i should have had you you may see sir said i what i ventured rather than be ruined and you will be so good as hence to judge of the sincerity of my profession that my honesty is dearer to me than my life romantic girl said he and read on he was very serious at my reflections on what god had enabled me to escape and when he came to my reasonings about throwing myself into the water he said walk gently before and seemed so moved that he turned away his face from me and i blessed this good sign and began not so much to repent at his seeing this mournful part of my story he put the papers in his pocket when he had read my reflections and thanks for escaping from myself and said taking me about the waist oh my dear girl you have touched me sensibly with your mournful relation and your sweet reflections upon it i should truly have been very miserable had it taken effect i see you have been used too roughly and it is a mercy you stood proof in that fatal moment then he most kindly folded me in his arms let us say i too my pamela walk from this accursed piece of water for i shall not with pleasure look upon it again to think how near it was to have been fatal to my fair one i thought added he of terrifying you to my will since i could not move you by love and mrs jukes too well obeyed me when the terrors of your return after your disappointment were so great 
that you had hardly courage to withstand them but had like to have made so fatal a choice to escape the treatment you apprehended oh sir said i i have reason i am sure to bless my dear parents and my good lady your mother for giving me something of a religious education for but for that and god's grace i should more than upon one occasion have attempted at least a desperate act and the less i wonder how poor creatures who have not the fear of god before their eyes and give way to despondency cast themselves into perdition come kiss me said he and tell me you forgive me for pushing you into so much danger and distress if my mind hold and i can see those former papers of yours and these that are in my pocket give me no cause to alter my opinion i will endeavour to defy the world and the world's censures and make my pamela amends if it be in the power of my whole life for all the hardships i have made her undergo all this looked well but you shall see how strangely it was all turned for this sham marriage then came into my mind again and i said your poor servant is far unworthy of this great honour for what will it be but to create envy to herself and discredit to you therefore sir permit me to return to my poor parents and that is all i have to ask he was in a fearful passion then and is it thus said he in my fond conceding moments that i am to be despised and answered precise perverse unseasonable pamela be gone from my sight and know as well how to behave in a hopeful prospect as in a distressful state and then and not till then shalt thou attract the shadow of my notice i was startled and going to speak but he stamped with his foot and said be gone i tell you i cannot bear this stupid romantic folly one word said i but one word i beseech you sir he turned from me in great wrath and took down another alley and so i went with a very heavy heart and fear i was too unseasonable just at a time when he was so condescending but if it was a piece of art of his side as i apprehended to introduce the sham wedding and to be sure he is very full of stratagem and art i think i was not so much to blame so i went up to my closet and wrote thus far while he walked about till dinner was ready and he is now sat down to it as i hear by mrs jukes very sullen thoughtful and out of humour and she asks what have i done to him now again i dread to see him when will my fears be over three o'clock well he continues exceeding wrath he has ordered his travelling chariot to be got ready with all speed what is to come next i wonder sure i did not say so much but see the lordliness of a high condition a poor body must not put in a word when they take it into their heads to be angry what a fine time a person of an equal condition would have had of it if she were even to marry such a one his poor dear mother spoiled him at first nobody must speak to him or contradict him as i have heard when he was a child and so he has not been used to be controlled and cannot bear the least thing that crosses his violent will this is one of the blessings attending to men of high condition much good may do them with their pride of birth and pride of fortune say i all that it serves for as far as i can see is to multiply their disquiets and everybody's else that has to do with them so so where will this end mrs jukes has been with me from him and she says i must get out of the house this moment well said i but whither am i to be carried next why home said she to your father and mother and can it be said i no no i doubt i shall not be so happy as that to be sure some bad design is on foot again to be sure it is sure sure said i mrs jukes he has not found out some other housekeeper worse than you she was very angry you may well think but i know she can't be made worse than she is she came up again are you ready said she bless me said i you are very hasty i have heard of this not a quarter of an hour ago but i shall be soon ready for i have but little to take with me and no kind friends in this house to take leave of to delay me yet like a fool i can't help crying pray said i just step down and ask if i may not have my papers so i am quite ready now again she comes up with an answer and so i will put up these few writings in my bosom that i have left i don't know what to think nor how to judge but i shall never believe i am with you till i am on my knees before you begging both of your blessings yet i am sorry he is so angry with me i thought i did not say so much there is i see the chariot drawn out the horses too the grim colbrand going to get on horseback what will be the end of all this monday well where this will end i cannot say but here i am at a little poor village almost such a one as yours i shall learn the name of it by and by and robin assures me he has orders to carry me to you my dear father and mother oh that he may say truth and not deceive me again but having nothing else to do and i am sure i shall not sleep a wink to-night if i was to go to bed i will write my time away 
and take up my story where I left off on Sunday afternoon. Mrs. Jukes came up to me with this answer about my papers. My master says he will not read them yet, lest he should be moved by anything in them to alter his resolution. But if he should think it worth while to read them, he will send them to you afterwards, to your father's. But, said she, here are your guineas that I borrowed, for all is now over with you, I find. She saw me cry, and said, Do you repent? Of what? said I. Nay, I can't tell, replied she, but, to be sure, he has had a taste of your satirical flings, or he would not be so angry. Oh, continued she, and held up her hand, thou hast a spirit, but I hope it will now be brought down. I hope so, too, said I. Well, added I, I am ready. She lifted up the window, and said, I'll call Robin to take your portmanteau. Bag and baggage, proceeded she, I'm glad you're going. I have no words, said I, to throw away upon you, Mrs. Jukes, but, making her a very low curtsy, I most heartily thank you for all your virtuous civilities to me. And so I do, for I'll have no portmanteau, I'll assure you, nor anything but these few things that I brought with me in my handkerchief, besides what I have on. For I had all this time worn my own bought clothes, though my master would have had it otherwise often, but I had put up paper, ink, and pens, however. So down I went, and as I passed by the parlour she stepped in and said, Sir, you have nothing to say to the girl before she goes. I heard him reply, though I did not see him, Who bid you say the girl, Mrs. Jukes, in that manner? She has offended only me. I beg your honour's pardon, said the wretch, but if I was your honour, she should not, for all the trouble she has cost you, go away scot-free. No more of this, as I told you before, said he. What, when I have such proof that her virtue is all her pride, shall I rob her of that? No, added he, let her go, perverse and foolish as she is, but she deserves to go honest, and she shall go so. I was so transported with this unexpected goodness that I opened the door before I knew what I did, and said, falling on my knees at the door with my hands folded and lifted up, Oh, thank you, thank your honour, a million of times. May God bless you for this instance of your goodness to me. I will pray for you as long as I live, and so shall my dear father and mother. And, Mrs. Jukes, said I, I will pray for you too, poor wicked wretch that you are. He turned from me, and went into his closet and shut the door. He need not have done so, for I would not have gone nearer to him. Surely I did not say so much to incur all this displeasure. I think I was loath to leave the house. Can you believe it? What could be the matter with me, I wonder? I felt something so strange, and my heart was so lumpish. I wonder what ailed me. But this was so unexpected. I believe that was all. Yet I am very strange still. Surely, surely, I cannot be like the old murmuring Israelites, to long after the onions and garlic of Egypt, when they had suffered there such heavy bondage. I'll take thee, O lumpish, contradictory, ungovernable heart, to severe task for this thy strange impulse, when I get to my dear father's and mother's, and if I find anything in thee that should not be, depend upon it thou shalt be humbled, if strict abstinence, prayer, and mortification will do it. But yet, after all, this last goodness of his has touched me too sensibly. I wish I had not heard it almost, and yet, methinks, I am glad I did, for I should rejoice to think the best of him for his own sake. Well, and so I went out to the chariot, the same that had brought me down. So, Mr. Robert, said I, here I am again, a poor sporting piece for the great, a mere tennis ball of fortune. You have your orders, I hope. Yes, madame, said he. Pray now, said I, don't madame me, nor stand with your hat off to such a one as I. Had not my master, said he, ordered me to not be wanting in respect to you, I would have shown you all I could. Well, said I, with my heart very full, that's very kind, Mr. Robert. Mr. Colbrand, mounted on horseback with pistols before him, came up to me as soon as I got in, with his hat off too. "'What, monsieur?' said I. "'Are you to go with me?' "'Part of the way,' he said, to see you safe. "'I hope that's kind too in you, Mr. Colbrand,' said I. I had nobody to wave my handkerchief to now, nor to take leave of, and so I resigned myself to my contemplations, with this strange wayward heart of mine, that I never found so ungovernable and awkward before. So away drove the chariot— and when I had gotten out of the elm walk and into the great road, I could hardly think but I was in a dream all the time. A few hours before, in my master's arms almost, with twenty kind things said to me, and a generous concern for the misfortunes he had brought upon me, and only by one rash half-word exasperated against me, and turned out of doors at an hour's warning, and all his kindness changed to hate, and I now, from three o'clock to five, several miles off. But if I am going to you, all will be well again, I hope. 
Lackaday, what strange creatures are men, gentlemen, I should say, rather. For, my dear deserving good mother, though poverty be both your lots, has had better hap, and you are, and have always been, blessed in one another. Yet this pleases me, too. He was so good, he would not let Mrs. Jukes speak ill of me, and scorn to take her odious, unwomanly advice. Oh, what a black heart has this poor wretch! So I need not rail against men so much, for my master, bad as I have thought him, is not half so bad as this woman. To be sure she must be an atheist. Do you think she is not? We could not reach further than this little poor place in sad alehouse rather than inn, for it began to be dark, and Robin did not make so much haste as he might have done, and he was forced to make hard shift for his horses. Mr. Colbrand and Robert, too, are very civil. I see he has got my portmanteau lashed behind the coach. I did not desire it, but I shall not come quite empty. A thorough riddance of me, I see. Bag and baggage, as Mrs. Jukes says. Well, my story surely would furnish out a surprising kind of novel, if it was to be well told. Mr. Robert came up to me just now, and begged me to eat something. I thanked him, but said I could not eat. I bid him ask Mr. Colbrand to walk up, and he came, but neither of them would sit, nor put their hats on. What mock ado is this to such a poor soul as I? I asked them if they were at liberty to tell me the truth of what they were to do with me. If not, I would not desire it. They both said, Robin was ordered to carry me to my father's, and Mr. Colbrand was to leave me within ten miles, and then strike off for the other house and wait till my master arrived there. They both spoke so solemnly that I could not but believe them. But when Robin went down, the other said he had a letter to give me next day at noon when we baited, as we were to do, at Mrs. Duke's relations. May I not, said I, beg the favour to see it to-night? He seems so loath to deny me, that I have hopes I shall prevail on him by and by. Well, my dear father and mother, I have got the letter, on great promises of secrecy, and making no use of it. I will try, if I can, to open it without breaking the seal, and will take a copy of it by and by. For Robin is in and out. There is hardly any room in this little house for one to be long alone. Well, this is the letter. When these lines are delivered to you, you will be far on your way to your father and mother, where you have so long desired to be. And, I hope, I shall forbear thinking of you with the least shadow of that fondness my foolish heart has entertained for you. I bear you, however, no ill will. But the end of my detaining you being over, I would not that you should tarry with me an hour more than needed, after the ungenerous preference you gave, at that time that I was inclined to pass over all other considerations, for an honourable address to you. For well I found the tables entirely turned upon me, and that I was in far more danger from you than you were from me, for I was just upon resolving to defy all the censures of the world, and to make you my wife. I will acknowledge another truth, that, had I not parted with you as I did, but permitted you to stay till I had read your journal, reflecting, as I doubt not I shall find it, and till I had heard your bewitching pleas in your own behalf, I feared I could not trust myself with my own resolution. And this is the reason I frankly own, that I have determined not to see you, nor hear you speak, for I well know my weakness in your favour. But I will get the better of this fond folly. Nay, I hope I have already done it, since it was likely to cost me so dear. And I write this to tell you, that I wish you well with all my heart, though you have spread such mischief through my family. And yet I cannot but say that I could wish you would not think of marrying in haste, and particularly that you would not have this cursed Williams. But what is all this to me now? Only, my weakness makes me say, that as I had already looked upon you as mine, and you have so soon got rid of your first husband, so you will not refuse, to my memory, the decency that every common person observes to pay a twelve months compliment, though but a mere compliment, to my ashes. Your papers shall be faithfully returned to you, and I have paid so dear for my curiosity and the affection they have riveted upon me for you, that you would look upon yourself amply revenged if you knew what they have cost me. I thought of writing only a few lines, but I have run into length. I will now try to recollect my scattered thoughts, and resume my reason, and shall find trouble enough to replace my affairs, and my own family, and to supply the chasms you have made in it. For, let me tell you, though I can forgive you, I never can my sister, nor my domestics, for my vengeance must be wrecked somewhere. I doubt not your prudence in forbearing to expose me any more than is necessary for your own justification, and for that I will suffer myself to be accused by you, and will also accuse myself, if it be needful. For I am, and will ever be, your affectionate well-wisher. This letter, when I expected some new plot, has affected me more than anything of that sort could have done. For here is plainly his great value for me confessed, and his rigorous behaviour accounted for in such a manner as his tortures me much. 
and this wicked gypsy story is as it seems a forgery upon us both and has quite ruined me for oh my dear parents forgive me but i found to my grief before that my heart was too partial in his favour but now with so much openness so much affection nay so much honour too which was all i had before doubted and kept me on the reserve i am quite overcome this was a happiness however i had no reason to expect but to be sure i must own to you that i shall never be able to think of anybody in the world but him presumption you will say and so it is but love is not a voluntary thing love did i say but come i hope not at least it is not i hope gone so far as to make me very uneasy for i know not how it came nor when it began but crept crept it has like a thief upon me and before i knew what was the matter it looked like love i wish since it is too late and my lot determined that i had not had this letter nor i heard him take my part to that vile woman for then i should have blessed myself in having escaped so happily his designing arts upon my virtue but now my poor mind is all topsy-turvy and i have made an escape to become more a prisoner but i hope since thus it is that all will be for the best and i shall with your prudent advice and pious prayers be able to overcome this weakness but to be sure my dear sir i will keep a longer time than a twelvemonth as a true widow for a compliment and more than a compliment to your ashes oh the dear word how kind how moving how affectionate is the word oh why was i not a duchess to show my gratitude for it but must labour under the weight of an obligation even had this happiness befallen me that would have pressed me to death and which i could never return by a whole life of faithful love and cheerful obedience oh forgive your poor daughter i am sorry to find this trial so sore upon me and that all the weakness of my weak sex and tender years who never before knew what it was to be so touched is come upon me and too mighty to be withstood by me but time prayer and resignation to god's will and the benefit of your good lessons and examples i hope will enable me to get over this so heavy a trial oh my treacherous treacherous heart to serve me thus and give no notice to me of the mischiefs thou wast about to bring upon me but thus foolishly to give thyself up to the proud invader without ever consulting thy poor mistress in the least but thy punishment will be the first and the greatest and well deservest thou to smart o perfidious traitor for giving up so weakly thy whole self before a summons came and to one too who had used me so hardly and when likewise thou hast so well maintained thy post against the most violent and avowed and therefore as i thought more dangerous attacks after all i must either not show you this my weakness or tear it out of my writing memorandum to consider of this when i get home end of section seventeen section eighteen of pamela or virtue rewarded this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Pamela, or Virtue Rewarded, by Samuel Richardson. Section 18. Monday morning, eleven o'clock. We are just come in here, to the inn kept by Mrs. Jukes' relation. The first compliment I had was in a very imprudent manner. How I like the squire! I could not help saying, Bold, forward woman, is it for you who keep an inn to treat passengers at this rate? She was but in jest, she said, and asked pardon and she came and begged excuse again very submissively after robin and mr colburn had talked to her a little the latter here in great form gave me before robin the letter which i had given him back for that purpose and i retired as if to read it and so i did for i think i can't read it too often though for my peace of mind's sake i might better try to forget it i am sorry methinks i cannot bring you back a sound heart but indeed it is an honest one as to anybody but me for it has deceived nobody else wicked thing that it is more and more surprising things still just as i had sat down to try to eat a bit of victuals to get ready to pursue my journey came in mr colbrand in a mighty hurry oh madame madame said he here be a groom from de squire b all over in a lather man and horse oh how my heart went pit a pat what now thought i is to come next he went out and presently returned with a letter for me and another enclosed for mr colbrand this seemed odd and put me in all a trembling so i shut the door and never sure was the like known found the following agreeable contents in vain my pamela do i find it to struggle against my affection for you 
I must needs, after you were gone, venture to entertain myself with your journal, when I found Mrs. Jukes' bad usage of you after your dreadful temptations and hurts, and particularly your generous concern for me on hearing how narrowly I escaped drowning, though my death would have been your freedom, and I had made it your interest to wish it, and your most agreeable confession in, in another place, that, notwithstanding all my hard usage of you, you could not hate me, and that expressed in so sweet, so soft, and so innocent a manner, that I flatter myself you may be brought to love me, together with the other parts of your admirable journal. I began to repent my parting with you, but, God is my witness, for no unlawful end, as you would call it, but the very contrary, and the rather, as all this was improved in your favour by your behaviour at leaving my house. For, oh, that melodious voice praying for me at your departure, and thanking me for my rebuke to Mrs. Duke, still hangs upon my ears, and delights my memory. And though I went to bed I could not rest, but about two got up, and made Thomas get one of the best horses ready, in order to set out to overtake you, while I sat down to write this to you. Now, my dear Pamela, let me beg of you, on the receipt of this, to order Robin to drive you back again to my house. I would have set out myself for the pleasure of bearing you company back in the chariot, but am really indisposed, I believe, with vexation that I should part thus with my soul's delight, as I now find you are, and must be, in spite of the pride of my own heart. You cannot imagine the obligation your return will lay me under to your goodness, and yet, if you will not so far favour me, you shall be under no restraint, as you will see by my letter enclosed to Colbrand, which I have not sealed that you may read it. But spare me, my dearest girl, the confusion of following you to your father's, which I must do, if you persist to go on, for I find I cannot live a day without you. If you are the generous Pamela I imagine you to be, for hitherto you have been all goodness where it has not been merited, let me see by this new instance the further excellence of your disposition let me see you can forgive the man who loves you more than himself let me see by it that you are not prepossessed in any other person's favour and one instance more i would beg and then i am all gratitude and that is that you would dispatch monsieur colbrand with a letter to your father assuring him that all will end happily and to desire that he will send to you at my house the letters you found means by william's conveyance to send him and when I have all my proud and perhaps punctilious doubts answered, I shall have nothing to do but to make you happy and be so myself, for I must be yours and only yours. Monday morn, near three o'clock. O oh, my exulting heart, how it throbs in my bosom, as if it would reproach me for so lately upbraiding it for giving way to the love of so dear a gentleman. But take care thou art not too credulous neither, O oh, fond believer, Things that we wish are apt to gain a too ready credence with us. This sham marriage is not yet cleared up. Mrs. Jukes, the vile Mrs. Jukes, may yet instigate the mind of this master. His pride of heart and pride of condition may again take place. And a man that could in so little a space first love me, then hate, then banish me his house, and send me away disgracefully, and now send for me again in such affectionate terms, may still waver, may still deceive thee. Therefore I will not acquit thee yet, O credulous, fluttering, throbbing mischief, that art so ready to believe what thou wishest, and I charge thee to keep better guard than thou hast lately done, and lead me not to follow too implicitly thy flattering and desirable impulses. Thus foolishly dialogued I with my heart, and yet all the time this heart is Pamela. I opened the letter to Monsieur Colbrand, which was in these words. Monsieur, I am sure you'll excuse the trouble I give you. I have, for good reasons, changed my mind, and I have besought it as a favour that Mrs. Andrews will return to me the moment Tom reaches you. I hope, for the reasons I have given her, she will have the goodness to oblige me, but, if not, you are to order Robin to pursue his directions and set her down at her father's door. If she will oblige me in her return, perhaps she'll give you a letter to her father for some papers to be delivered to you for her, which will be so good in that case to bring to her here. But if she will not give you such a letter, you'll return with her to me, if she please to favour me so far, and that with all expedition, that her health and safety will permit, for I am pretty much indisposed, but hope it will be but slight, and soon go off. I am, yours, etc. On second thoughts, let Tom go forward with Mrs. Andrew's letter, if she please to give one, and you return with her, for her safety. Now this is a dear generous manner of treating me. Oh, how I love to be generously used! Now, my dear parents, I wish I could consult you for your opinions how I should act. Should I go back, or should I not? I doubt he has got too great a hold in my heart for me to be easy presently if I should refuse. And yet this gypsy information makes me fearful. 
while i will i think trust in his generosity yet is it not too great a trust especially considering how i have been used but then that was while he avowed his bad designs and now he gives me great hope of his good ones and i may be the means of making many happy as well as myself by placing a generous confidence in him and then i think he might have sent to colbrand or to robin to carry me back whether i would or not and how different is his behaviour to that and it would not look as if i was prepossessed as he calls it if i don't obliged him and as if it was a silly female piece of pride to make him follow me to my father's and as if i would use him hardly in my turn for his having used me ill in his upon the whole i resolve to obey him and if he uses me ill afterwards double will be his ungenerous guilt the hard will be my lot to have my credulity so justly blamable as it will seem then for to be sure the world the wise world that is never wrong itself judges always by events and if he should use me ill then i shall be blamed for trusting him if well oh then i did right to be sure but how would my censurers act in my case before the event justifies or condemns the action is the question then i have no notion of obliging by halves but of doing things with a grace as one may say where they are to be done and so i wrote the desired letter to you assuring you that i had before me happier prospects than i ever had and hoped all would end well and that i begged you would send me by the bearer mr thomas my master's groom those papers which i had sent to you by mr williams's conveyance for that they imported me much for clearing up a point in my conduct that my master was desirous to know before he resolved to favour me as he intended but you will have that letter before you can have this for i would not send you this without the proceeding which is now in my master's hands and so having given the letter to mr thomas for him to carry to you when he had baited and rested after his great fatigue i sent for monsieur colbrand and robin and gave to the former his letter and when he had read it i said you see how things stand i am resolved to return to our master and as he is not so well as were to be wished the more haste you make the better and don't mind my fatigue but consider only yourselves and the horses robin who guessed the matter by his conversation with thomas as i suppose said god bless you madam and reward you as your obligingness to my good master deserves and may we all live to see you triumph over mrs jukes i wondered to hear him say so for i was always careful of exposing my master or even that naughty woman before the common servants but yet i question whether robin would have said this if he had not guessed by thomas's message and my resolving to return that i might stand well with his master so selfish are the hearts of poor mortals that they are ready to change as favour goes so they were not long in getting ready and i am just setting out back again and i hope i shall have no reason to repent it robin put on very vehemently and when we came to the little town where we lay on sunday night he gave his horses a bait and said he would push for his masters that night as it would be moonlight if i should not be too much fatigued because there was no place between that and the town adjacent to his masters fit to put up at for the night but monsieur colbrand's horse beginning to give way made a doubt between them wherefore i said hating to be on the road if it could be done i should bear it well enough i hoped and that monsieur colbrand might leave his horse when it failed at some house and come into the chariot this pleased them both and about twelve miles short he left the horse and took off his spurs and holsters etc and with abundance of ceremonial excuses came into the chariot and i sat the easier for it for my bones ached sadly with the jolting and so many miles travelling in so few hours as i have done from sunday night five o'clock but for all this it was eleven o'clock at night when we came into the village adjacent to my master's and the horses began to be very much tired and robin too but i said it would be pity to put up only three miles short of the house so about one we reached the gate but everybody was abed but one of the helpers got the keys from mrs jukes and opened the gates and the horses could hardly crawl into the stable and i when i went to get out of the chariot fell down and thought i had lost the use of my limbs mrs jukes came down with her clothes huddled on and lifted up her hands and eyes at my return but showed more care of the horses than of me by that time the two maids came and i made shift to creep in as well as i could it seems my poor master was very ill indeed and had been upon the bed most part of the day and abraham who succeeded john sat up with him and he was got into a fine sleep and heard not the coach come in nor the noise he made for his chamber lies towards the garden on the other side of the house mrs jukes said he had a feverish complaint and had been blooded and very prudently ordered abraham when he awaked not to tell him i was come for fear of surprising him and augmenting his fever 
nor, indeed, to say anything of me till she herself broke it to him in the morning, as she should see how he was. So I went to bed with Mrs. Jukes, after she had caused me to drink almost half a pint of burnt wine, made very rich and cordial with spices, which I found very refreshing, and set me into a sleep I little hoped for. Tuesday morning. Getting up pretty early, I have written thus far, while Mrs. Jukes lies snoring in bed, fetching up her last night's disturbance. I long for her rising, to know how my poor master does. Tis well for her she can sleep so purely. No love, but for herself, will ever break her rest, I am sure. I am deadly sore all over, as if I had been soundly beaten. I did not think I could have lived under such fatigue. Mrs. Jukes, as soon as she got up, went to know how my master did, and he had had a good night, and, having drank plentifully of sackway, had sweated much, so that his fever had abated considerably. She said to him that he must not be surprised, and she would tell him news. He asked what? And she said, I was come. He raised himself up on his bed. Can it be? said he. What? Already? She told him I came last night. Monsieur Colbrand coming to inquire of his health, he ordered him to draw near him, and was highly pleased with the account he gave him of the journey, my readiness to come back, and my willingness to reach home that night. And he said, Why, these tender fair ones, I think, bear fatigue better than us men. But she is very good to give me such an instance of her readiness to oblige me. Pray, Mrs. Duke, said he, take great care of her health, and let her be a bed all day. She told him I had been up these two hours. Ask her, said he, if she will be so good as to make me a visit. If she won't, I'll rise and go to her. Indeed, sir, said she, you must be still, and I'll go to her. But don't urge her too much, said he, if she be unwilling. She came to me and told me all the above, and I said I would most willingly wait upon him, for, indeed, I longed to see him, and was much grieved he was so ill. So I went down with her. "'Will she come?' said he, as I entered the room. "'Yes, sir,' said we, and she said at the first word, most willingly. "'Sweet excellence,' said he. As soon as he saw me, he said, "'Oh, my beloved Pamela, you have made me quite well. I am concerned to return my acknowledgments to you in so unfit a place and manner, but will you give me your hand?' I did, and he kissed it with great eagerness. "'Sir,' said I, "'you do me too much honour. I am sorry you are so ill.' "'I can't be ill,' said he, "'while you are with me. "'I am very well already.' "'Well,' said he, and kissed my hand again, "'you shall not repent this goodness. "'My heart is too full of it to express myself as I ought. "'But I am sorry you have had such a fatiguing time of it. "'Life is no life without you. "'If you had refused me, "'and yet I had hardly hopes you would oblige me, "'I should have had a severe fit of it, I believe, "'for I was taken very oddly, "'and knew not what to make of myself. "'But now I shall be well instantly.' "'You need not, Mrs. Jukes,' added he, "'send for the doctor from Stamford, as we talked yesterday, "'for this lovely creature is my doctor, "'as her absence was my disease.' "'He begged me to sit down by his bedside, "'and asked me if I had obliged him "'with sending for my former packet. "'I said I had, and hoped it would be brought. "'He said it was doubly kind. "'I would not stay long because of disturbing him, "'and he got up in the afternoon "'and desired my company, "'and seemed quite pleased, easy, and much better.' He said, Mrs. Jukes, after this instance of my good Pamela's obligingness in her return, I am sure we ought to leave her entirely at her own liberty, and pray, if she pleases to take a turn in our chariot, or in the garden, or to the town, or wherever she will, let her be left at liberty, and ask no questions, and do you do all in your power to oblige her. She said she would, to be sure. He took my hand and said, One thing I will tell you, Pamela, because I know you will be glad to hear it, and yet not care to ask me. I had, before you went, taken Williams's bond for the money, for how the poor man had behaved I can't tell, but he could get no bail, and if I have no fresh reason given me, perhaps I shall not exact the payment, and he has been some time at liberty, and now follows his school, but, methinks, I could wish you would not see him at present. Sir, said I, I will not do anything to disoblige you willfully, and I am glad he is at liberty, because I was the occasion of his misfortunes. I dare say no more, though I wanted to plead for the poor gentleman, which in gratitude I thought I ought, when I could do him service. I said, I am sorry, sir, Lady Davers, who loves you so well, should have incurred your displeasure, and that there should be any variance between your honour and her. I hope it was not on my account. He took out of his waistcoat pocket, as he sat in his gown, his letter-case, and said, Here, Pamela, read that when you go upstairs, and let me have your thoughts upon it, and that will let you into the affair. He said he was very heavy of a sudden, and would lie down, and indulge for that day, and if he was better in the morning would take an airing in the chariot. And so I took my leave for the present, and went up to my closet, and read the letter he was pleased to put into my hands, which is as follows. 
Brother, I am very uneasy at what I hear of you, and must write, whether it please you or not, my full mind. I have had some people with me, desiring me to interpose with you, and they have a greater regard for your honour than, I am sorry to say it, you have yourself. Could I think that a brother of mine would so meanly run away with my late dear mother's waiting-maid, and keep her a prisoner from all her friends, and to the disgrace of your own? But I thought, when you would not let the wench come to me on my mother's death, that you meant no good. I blushed for you, I'll assure you. The girl was an innocent good girl, but I suppose that's over with her now, or soon will. What can you mean by this, let me ask you? Either you will have her for a kept mistress, or for a wife. If the former, there are enough to be had without ruining a poor wench that my mother loved, and who really was a very good girl, and of this you may be ashamed. As to the other, I dare say you don't think of it, but if you should you would be utterly inexcusable. Consider, brother, that ours is no upstart family, but is as ancient as the best in the kingdom, and, for several hundreds of years, it has never been known that the heirs of it have disgraced themselves by unequal matches. And you know you have been sought to by some of the best families in the nation for your alliance. It might be well enough, if you were descended of a family of yesterday, or but a remove or two from the dirt you seem so fond of. But, let me tell you, that I, and all mine, will renounce you for ever, if you can descend so meanly, and I shall be ashamed to be called your sister. A handsome man, as you are, in your person, so happy in the gifts of your mind, that everybody courts your company, and possessed of such a noble and clear estate, and very rich in money besides, left you by the best of fathers and mothers, with such ancient blood in your veins untainted. For you to throw away yourself thus is intolerable, and it would be very wicked in you to ruin the wench too, so that I beg you will restore her to her parents, and give her one hundred pounds or so, to make her happy in some honest fellow of her own degree, and that will be doing something, and will also oblige and pacify your much-grieved sister. If I have written too sharply, consider it is my love to you, and the shame you are bringing upon yourself, and I wish this may have the effect upon you, intended by your very loving sister. This is a sad letter, my dear father and mother, and one may see how poor people are despised by the proud and the rich, and yet we were all on a foot originally, and many of these gentry, that brag of their ancient blood, would be glad to have it as wholesome and as really untainted as ours. Surely these proud people never think what a short stage life is, and that, with all their vanity, a time is coming when they shall be obliged to submit to be on a level with us. And true said the philosopher, when he looked upon the skull of a king and that of a poor man, that he saw no difference between them. Besides, do they not know that the richest of princes and the poorest of beggars are to have one great and tremendous judge at the last day, who will not distinguish between them according to their circumstances in life? but, on the contrary, may make their condemnations the greater, as their neglected opportunities were the greater. Poor souls, how I do pity their pride! O oh, keep me, heaven, from their high condition, if my mind shall ever be tainted with their vice, or polluted with so cruel and inconsiderate a contempt of the humble estate which they behold with so much scorn. But, besides, how do these gentry know that, supposing they could trace back their ancestry for one, two, three, or even five hundred years, that then the original stems of these poor families, though they have not kept such elaborate records of their good-for-nothingness, as it often proves, were not still deeper rooted. And how can they be assured that one hundred years hence, or two, some of these now despised upstart families may not revel in their estates, while their descendants may be reduced to the others' dunghills? And perhaps such is the vanity, as well as the changeableness, of human estates, in their turn set up for pride of family, and despise the others. These reflections occurred to my thoughts, made serious by my master's indisposition, and this proud letter of the lowly Lady Davers against the high-minded Pamela. Lowly, I say, because she could stoop to such vain pride, and high-minded I, because I hope I am too proud to ever do the like. But, after all, poor wretches that we be, we scarce know what we are, much less what we shall be. But, once more pray I to be kept from the sinful pride of such a high estate." On this occasion I recall the following lines, which I have read, where the poet argues in a much better manner. Wise Providence Does various parts for various minds dispense, the meanest slaves, or those who hedge and ditch, are useful by their sweat to feed the rich. The rich in due return impart their store, which comfortably feeds the laboring poor. Nor let the rich the lowest slave disdain, he's equally a link of nature's chain. Labors to the same end joins in one view, and both alike the divine will pursue, and, at the last, are leveled king and slave, without distinction, in the silent grave. 
Wednesday morning. My master sent me a message just now that he was so much better that he would take a turn after breakfast in the chariot and would have me give him my company. I hope I shall know how to be humble and comport myself as I should do under all these favors. Mrs. Jukes is one of the most obliging creatures in the world, and I have such respect shown me by every one, as if I was as great as Lady Davers. But now, if this should all end in the sham marriage, it cannot be, I hope. Yet the pride of greatness and ancestry, and such like, is so strongly set out in Lady Davers' letter, that I cannot flatter myself to be so happy as all these desirable appearances make for me. Should I be now deceived, I should be worse off than ever. But I shall see what light this new honour will procure me. So I'll get ready. But I won't, I think, change my garb. Should I do it, it would look as if I would be nearer on a level with him, and yet, should I not, it might be thought a disgrace to him. But I will, I think, open the portmanteau, and, for the first time since I came hither, put on my best silk nightgown. But then that will be making myself a sort of right to the clothes I had renounced, and I am not yet quite sure I shall have no other crosses to encounter. So I will go as I am, for, though ordinary, I am as clean as a penny, though I say it. So I'll e'en go as I am, except he orders otherwise. Yet Mrs. Jukes says I ought to dress as fine as I can, but, I say, I think not. As my master is up and at breakfast, I will venture down to ask him how he will have me. Well, he is kinder and kinder, and, thank God, purely recovered. How charmingly he looks to what he did yesterday, blessed be God for it. He arose and came to me and took me by the hand and would set me down by him, and he said, my charming girl seems going to speak. What would you say? Sir, said I, a little ashamed, I think it is too great an honour to go into the chariot with you. No, my dear Pamela, said he, the pleasure of your company will be the greater than the honour of mine, and so say no more on that head. But, sir, said I, I shall disgrace you to go thus. You would grace a prince, my fair one, said the good, kind, kind gentleman, in that dress or any you shall choose. And you look so pretty that, if you shall not catch cold in that round-eared cap, you shall go just as you are. But, sir, said I, then you'll be pleased to go a by-way, that it mayn't be seen you do so much honour to your servant. Oh, my good girl, said he, I doubt you are afraid of yourself being talked of more than me, for I hope by degrees to take off the world's wonder, and teach them to expect what is to follow, as a do to my Pamela. Oh, the dear good man, there's for you, my dear father and mother, did I not do well now to come back? Oh, could I get rid of my fears of this sham marriage, for all this is not yet inconsistent with that frightful scheme, I should be too happy. So I came up with great pleasure for my gloves, and now wait his kind commands. Dear, dear, sir, said I to myself, as if I was speaking to him, for God's sake let me have no more trials and reverses, for I could not bear it now, I verily think. At last the welcome message came that my master was ready, and so I went down as fast as I could, and he, before all the servants, handed me in, as if I was a lady, and then came in himself. Mrs. Jukes begged he would take care he did not catch cold, as he had been ill. And I had the pride to hear his new coachman say, to one of his fellow-servants, They are a charming pair, I am sure. Tis pity they should be parted. Oh, my dear father and mother, I fear your girl will grow as proud as anything, and especially you will think I have reason to guard against it when you read the kind particulars I am going to relate. End of section 18「Section 19 of Pamela, or Virtue Rewarded. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pamela, or Virtue Rewarded, by Samuel Richardson. Section 19 he ordered dinner to be ready by two, and Abraham, who succeeds John, went behind the coach. He bid Robin drive gently, and told me he wanted to talk to me about his sister Davers and other matters. Indeed, at first setting out he kissed me a little too often, that he did, and I was afraid of Robin's looking back, through the foreglass, and people seeing us as they passed, but he was exceedingly kind to me in his words as well. At last he said, you have, I doubt not, read over and over my sister's saucy letter, and find, as I told you, that you are no more obliged to her than I am. You see, she intimates, that some people had been with her, and who should they be but the officious Mrs. Jervis and Mr. Longman and Jonathan? And so that has made me take the measures I did in dismissing them my service. I see, said he, you are going to speak on their behalves, but your time has not come to do that, if ever I shall permit it. My sister, says he, I have been beforehand with, for I have renounced her. 
I am sure I have been a kind brother to her, and gave her to the value of three thousand pounds more than her share came to buy my father's will, when I entered upon my estate. And the woman, surely, was beside herself with passion and insolence, when she wrote me such a letter, for while well she knew I would not bear it. But you must know, Pamela, that she is much incensed, that I will give no ear to a proposal of hers, of a daughter of my lord Blank, who, said he, n neither in person nor mind or acquirements, even with all her opportunities, is to be named in a day with my Pamela. But yet you see the plea, my girl, which I made to you before, of the pride of condition, and the world's censure, which, I own, sticks a little too close with me still. For a woman shines not forth to the public as man, and the world sees not your excellencies and perfections. If it did, I should entirely stand acquitted by the severest censures. But it will be taken in the lump, that here is Mr. B., with such and such an estate, has married his mother's waiting-maid, not considering there is not a lady in the kingdom that can outdo her, or better support the condition to which she will be raised if I should marry her. And, said he, putting his arm around me, and again kissing me, I pity my dear girl, too, for her part in the censure, for here she will have to combat the pride and slights of the neighbouring gentry all around us. Sister Davers, you see, will never be reconciled to you. The other ladies will not visit you, and you will, with a merit superior to them all, be treated as if unworthy their notice. Should I now marry my Pamela, how will my girl relish all this? Won't these be cutting things to my fair one? For, as to me, I shall have nothing to do, but, with a good estate in possession, to brazen out the manner of my former pleasantry on this subject, with my companions of the chase, the green, and the assembly. Stand the rude jest for once or twice, and my fortune will create me always respect enough, I warrant you. But, I say, what will my poor girl do as to her part with her own sex? For some company you must keep. My station will not admit it to be with my servants, and the ladies will fly your acquaintance, and still, though my wife, will treat you as my mother's waiting-maid. What says my girl to this? You may well guess, my dear father and mother, how transporting these kind, these generous and condescending sentiments were to me. I thought I had the harmony of the spheres all around me, and every word that dropped from his lips was as sweet as the honey of Hybla to me. "'Oh, sir,' said I, "'how inexpressibly kind and good is all this! Your poor servant has a much greater struggle to than this to go through, a more naughty difficulty to overcome.' "'What is that?' said he, a little impatiently. "'I will not forgive your doubts now.' "'No, sir,' said I, "'I cannot doubt, but it is. How shall I support, how shall I deserve your goodness to me?' "'Dear girl,' said he, and hugged me to his breast, "'I was afraid you would have made me angry again, "'but that I would not be, because I see you have a grateful heart, "'and this your kind and cheerful return, "'after such cruel usage as you have experienced in my house, "'enough to make you detest the place, "'has made me resolve to bear anything in you but doubts of my honour, "'at a time when I am pouring out my soul, "'with a true and affectionate ardour before you.' But, good sir, said I, my greatest concern will be for the rude jests you will have yourself to encounter with, for thus stooping beneath yourself. For, as to me, considering my lowly estate and little merit, even the slights and reflections of the ladies will be an honour to me, and I shall have the pride to place more than half their ill-will to their envy at my happiness. And if I can, by the most cheerful duty and resigned obedience, have the pleasure to be agreeable to you, I shall think myself but too happy, let the world say what it will." He said, You are very good, my dearest girl, but how will you bestow your time when you will have no visits to receive or pay, no parties of pleasure to join in, no card-tables to employ your winter evenings, and even, as the taste is, half the day, summer and winter? And you have often played with my mother, too, and so know how to perform a part there, as well as in the other diversions, and I'll assure you, my girl, I shall not desire you to live without such amusements as my wife might expect, were I to marry a lady of the first quality." oh sir said i you are all goodness how shall i bear it but do you think sir in such a family as yours a person whom you shall honour with the name of mistress of it will not find useful employments for her time without looking abroad for any others in the first place sir if you will give me leave i will myself into such parts of the family economy as may not be beneath the rank to which i shall have the honour of being exalted if any such there can be and this i hope without incurring the ill-will of any honest servant then, sir, I will ease you of as much of your family accounts as I possibly can, when I have convinced you that I am to be trusted with them, and you know, sir, my late good lady made me her treasurer, her almoner, and everything. 
then sir if i must needs be visiting or visited and the ladies won't honour me so much or even if they would now and then i will visit if your goodness will allow me so to do the sick poor in the neighbourhood around you and administer to their wants and necessities in such matters as may not be hurtful to your estate but comfortable to them and entail upon you their blessings and their prayers for your dear health and welfare then i will assist your housekeeper as i used to do in the making jellies comfits sweetmeats marmalades cordials and to pot and candy and preserve for the uses of the family and to make myself all the fine linen of it for yourself and me then sir if you will sometimes indulge me with your company i will take an airing in your chariot now and then and when you shall return home from your diversions on the green or from the chase or wherever you shall please to go i shall have the pleasure of receiving you with duty and a cheerful delight and in your absence count the moments till you return and you will maybe fill up some part of my time the sweetest by far with your agreeable conversation for an hour or two now and then and be indulgent to the impertinent overflowings of my grateful heart for all your goodness to me the breakfasting time the preparations for dinner and sometimes to entertain your chosen friends and the company you shall bring home with you gentlemen if not ladies and the supperings will fill up a great part of the day in a very necessary manner and maybe sir now and then a good-humoured lady will drop in and i hope if they do i shall so behave myself as to not add to the disgrace you will have brought upon yourself for indeed i will be very circumspect and try to be as discreet as i can and as humble too as shall be consistent with your honour cards tis true i can play at in all the usual games that our sex delight in but this i am not fond of nor shall ever desire to play unless to induce such ladies as you may wish to see not to abandon your house for want of an amusement they are accustomed to music which our good lady taught me will fill up some intervals if i should have any and then sir you know i love reading and scribbling and though the latter will be employed in the family accounts between the servants and me and me and your good self yet reading at proper times will be a pleasure to me which i shall be unwilling to give up for the best company in the world except yours and oh sir that will help to polish my mind and make me worthier of your company and conversation and with the explanations you will give me of what i shall not understand will be a sweet employment and improvement too but one thing sir i ought not to forget because it is the chief my duty to god will i hope always employ some good portion of my time with thanks for his superlative goodness to me and to pray for you and myself for you sir for a blessing on you for your great goodness to such an unworthy creature for myself that i may be enabled to discharge my duty to you and be found grateful for all the blessings i shall receive at the hands of providence by means of your generosity and condescension with all this sir said i can you think i shall be at a loss to pass my time but as i know that every slight to me if i come to be so happy will be in some measure a slight to you i will beg of you sir not to let me go very fine in dress but appear only so as that you may not be ashamed of it after the honour i shall have of being called by your worthy name for well i know sir that nothing so much excites the envy of my own sex as seeing a person above them in appearance and in dress and that would bring down upon me a hundred saucy things and low-born brats and i can't tell what there i stopped for i had prattled a great deal too much so early and he said clasping me to him why stops my dear pamela why does she not proceed i could dwell upon your words all the day long and you shall be the directress of your own pleasures and your own time so sweetly do you choose to employ it and thus shall i find some of my own bad actions atoned for by your exemplary goodness and god will bless me for your sake oh said he what pleasure you give me in this sweet foretaste of my happiness I will now defy the saucy, busy censures of the world, and bid them know your excellence and my happiness before they, with unhallowed lips, presume to judge of my actions and your merit. And let me tell you, my Pamela, that I can add my hopes of a still more pleasing amusement, and what your bashful modesty would not permit you to hint, and which I will no otherwise touch on, lest it should seem, to your nicety, to detract from the present purity of my good intentions, than to say— i hope to have superadded to all these such an employment as will give me a view of perpetuating my happy prospects and my family at the same time of which i am almost the only male i blushed i believe yet could not be displeased at the decent and charming manner which he insinuated this distant hope and oh judge for me how my heart was affected with all these things he was pleased to add another charming reflection which showed me the noble sincerity of his kind professions i do own to you my pamela said he that i love you with a purer flame than i ever knew in my whole life 
a flame to which I was a stranger, and which commenced for you in the garden, though you, unkindly by your unseasonable doubts, nipped the opening bud, while it was too tender to bear the cold blasts of slight or negligence. And I know more sincere joy and satisfaction in this sweet hour's conversation with you than all the guilty tumults of my former passion ever did, or, had even my attempt succeeded, ever could have afforded me. Oh, sir, said I, expect not words from your poor servant equal to these most generous professions. Both the means and the will I now see are given to you to lay me under an everlasting obligation. How happy shall I be, if, though I cannot be worthy of all this goodness and condescension, I can prove myself not entirely unworthy of it. But I can only answer for a grateful heart, and if ever I give you cause willfully, and you will generously allow for involuntary imperfections, to be disgusted with me, may I be an outcast from your house in favour, and as much repudiated as if the law had divorced me from you. But, sir, continued I, though I was so unseasonable as I was in the garden, you would, I flatter myself, had you then heard me, have parted my imprudence, and owned I had some cause to fear, and to wish to be with my poor father and mother, and this I the rather say, that you should not think me capable of returning insolence for your goodness, or appearing foolishly ungrateful to you when you was so kind to me. Indeed, Pamela, said he, you gave me great uneasiness for i love you too well not to be jealous of the least appearance of your indifference to me or preference to any other person not excepting your parents themselves this made me resolve not to hear you for i had not got over my reluctance to marriage and a little weight you know turns the scale when it hangs in an equal balance but yet you see that though i could part with you while my anger held yet the regard i had then newly professed for your virtue made me resolve not to offer to violate it and you have seen likewise that the painful struggle i underwent when i began to reflect and to read your moving journal between my desire to recall you and my doubt whether you would return though yet i resolved not to force you to it had like to have cost me a severe illness but your kind and cheerful return has dispelled all my fears and given me hope that i am not indifferent to you and you see how your presence has chased away my illness I bless God for it, said I, but since you are so good as to encourage me and will not despise my weakness, I will acknowledge that I suffered more than I could have imagined till I experienced it in being banished your presence in so much anger, and the more still I was affected when you answered the wicked Mrs. Jukes so generously in my favour at my leaving your house. For this, sir, awakened all my reverence for you, and you saw I could not forbear, not knowing what I did, to break boldly in upon you and acknowledge your goodness on my knees. "'Tis true, my dear Pamela," said he, "'we have sufficiently tortured one another, and the only comfort that can result from it will be, reflecting upon the matter coolly and with pleasure, when all these storms are overblown, as I hope they now are, and we sit together secured in each other's good opinion, recounting the uncommon gradations by which we have ascended to the summit of that felicity which I hope we shall shortly arrive at. Meantime, said the good gentleman, let me hear what my dear girl would have said in her justification, could I have trusted myself with her as to her fears, and the reason of her wishing herself from me, at a time that I had begun to show my fondness for her, in a manner that I thought would have been agreeable to her and her virtue. I pulled out of my pocket the gypsy letter, but I said, before I showed it to him, I have this letter, sir, to show you, as what, I believe, you will allow must have given me the greatest disturbance. But— First, as I know not who is the writer, and it seems to be in a disguised hand, I would beg it as a favour that, if you guess who it is, which I cannot, it may not turn to their prejudice, because it was written, very probably, with no other view than to serve me. He took it and read it, and it being signed somebody, he said, Yes, this is indeed from somebody, and disguised as the hand is, I know the writer. Don't you see, by the setness of some of these letters, and a little secretary cut here and there, especially in that C and that R, that it is the hand of a person bred in the law way? Why, Pamela, said he, to old Longman's hand, an officious rascal as he is. But I have done with him. Oh, sir, said I, it would be too insolent in me to offer, so much am I myself overwhelmed with your goodness, to defend anybody that you are angry with. Yet, sir, so far as they have incurred your displeasure for my sake, and for no other want of duty or respect, I could wish, but I dare not say more. But, said he, as to the letter and the information it contains, let me know, Pamela, when you received this. On the Friday, sir, said I, that you were gone to the wedding at Stamford. 
"'How could it be conveyed to you,' said he, "'unknown to Mrs. Jukes, when I gave her such a strict charge to attend you, "'and you had promised me that you would not throw yourself in the way of such intelligence? "'For,' said he, "'when I went to Stamford I knew, from a private intimation given me, "'that there would be an attempt made to see you, or to give you a letter, by somebody, "'if not to get you away. "'But it was not certain from what quarter, whether from my sister Davers, "'Mrs. Jervis, Mr. Longman, or John Arnold, or your father.' and as i was then but struggling with myself whether to give way to my honourable inclinations or to free you and to let you go to your father that i might avoid the danger i found myself in of the former for i had absolutely resolved never to wound again even your ears with any proposals of a contrary nature that was the reason i desired you to permit mrs jukes to be so much on her guard till i came back when i thought i should have decided this disputed point within myself between my pride and my inclinations this good sir said i accounts well to me for your conduct in that case and for what you said to me and mrs jukes on that occasion and i see more and more how much i may depend upon your honour and goodness to me but i will tell you all the truth and then i recounted to him the whole affair of the gipsy and how the letter was put among the loose grass etc and he said the man who thinks a thousand dragons sufficient to watch a woman when her inclination takes a contrary bent will find all too little and she will engage the stones in the street or the grass in the field to act for her and help on her correspondence if the mind said he be not engaged i see there is hardly any confinement sufficient for the body and you have told me a very pretty story and as you never gave me any reason to question your veracity even in your severest trials i make no doubt of the truth of what you have now mentioned and i will in my turn give you such a proof of mine that you shall find it carry a conviction with it you must know then my pamela that i had actually formed such a project so well informed was this old rascally somebody and the time was fixed for the very person described in this letter to be here and i had thought he should have read some part of the ceremony as little as was possible to deceive you in my chamber and so i hoped to have you mine upon terms that then would have been much more agreeable to me than real matrimony and i did not in haste intend you the mortification of being undeceived so that we might have lived for years perhaps very lovingly together and i had at the same time been at liberty to confirm or abrogate it as i pleased oh sir said i i am out of breath with the thoughts of my danger but what good angel prevented the execution of this deep laid design why your good angel pamela said he for when i began to consider that it would have made you miserable and me not happy that if you should have a dear little one it would be out of my own power to legitimate it if i should wish it to inherit my estate and that as i am almost the last of my family and most of what i possess must descend to a strange line and disagreeable and unworthy persons notwithstanding that i might in this case have issue of my own body when i further considered your untainted virtue what dangers and trials you had undergone by my means and what a world of troubles i had involved you in only because you were beautiful and virtuous which had excited all my passion for you and reflected also upon your tried prudence and truth i though i doubted not effecting this my last plot resolved to overcome myself and however i might suffer in struggling with my affection for you to part with you rather than to betray you under so black a veil besides said he i remember how much i had exclaimed against and censured an action of this kind that had been attributed to one of the first men of the law and of the kingdom as he afterwards became and that it was but treading in a path that another had marked out for me and as i was assured with no great satisfaction to himself when he came to reflect my foolish pride was a little piqued at this because i loved to be if i went out of the way my own original as i may call it on all these considerations it was that i rejected this project and sent word to the person that i had better considered of the matter and would not have him come till he had heard further from me and in this suspense i suppose some of your confederates pamela for we have been a couple of plotters though your virtue and merit have procured you faithful friends and partisans which my money and promises could hardly do one way or another got knowledge of it and gave you this notice but perhaps it would have come too late had not your white angel got the better of my black one and inspired me with resolutions to abandon the project just as it was to have been put into execution but yet i own that from these appearances you were but too well justified in your fears on this odd way of coming at this intelligence and i have only one thing to blame you for that though i was resolved not to hear you in your own defence yet as you have so ready a talent at your pen you might have cleared your part of this matter up to me by a line or two 
and when I had known what seeming good grounds you had for pouring cold water on a young flame that was just then rising to an honourable expansion, should not have imputed it, as I was apt to do, to unseasonable insult for my tenderness to you on one hand, to perverse nicety on the other, or to, what I was most alarmed by and concerned for, prepossession of for some other person. And this would have saved us both much fatigue, I of mind, you of body." And indeed, sir, said I, of mine too, and I could not better manifest this than by the cheerfulness with which I obeyed your recalling me to your presence. Ay, that, my dear Pamela, said he, and clasped me in his arms, was the kind, the inexpressibly kind action, that has riveted my affections to you, and obliges me, in this free and unreserved manner, to pour my whole soul into your bosom. I said, I had the less merit in this my return, because I was driven by an irresistible impulse to it, and could not help it if I would. This, said he, and honoured me by kissing my hand, is engaging indeed, if I may hope that my Pamela's gentle inclination for her persecutor was the strongest motive to her return, and I so much value a voluntary love in the person I would wish for my wife, that I would have even prudence and interest hardly named in comparison with it. And can you return me sincerely the honest compliment that I now make you? In the choice I have made, it is impossible I should have any view to my interest. Love, true love, is the only motive by which I am induced. And were I not what I am, could you give me the preference to any other you know in the world, notwithstanding what has passed between us? Why, said I, should your most obliged Pamela refuse to answer this kind question? Cruel as I have thought you, and dangerous as your views to my honesty have been, you, sir, are the only person living that ever was more than indifferent to me, and before I knew this to be what I blush now to call it, I could not hate you or wish you ill, though, from my soul, the attempts you made were shocking and most distasteful to me. I am satisfied, my Pamela, said he, nor shall I want to see those papers that you have kindly written for to your father, though I still wish to see them too, for the sake of the sweet manner in which you relate what has passed, and to have before me the whole series of your sufferings that I may learn what degree of kindness may be sufficient to recompense you for them. In this manner, my dear father and mother, did your happy daughter find herself blessed by her generous master. An ample recompense for all her sufferings did I think this sweet conversation only. A hundred tender things he expressed besides, that though they never can escape my memory, yet would be too tedious to write down. Oh, how I blessed God, and, I hope, ever shall, for all his gracious favours to his unworthy handmaid, what a happy change is this! And who knows but my kind, my generous master, may put it in my power, when he shall see me not quite unworthy of it, to be a means, without injuring him, to dispense around me, to many persons, the happy influences of the condition to which I shall be, by his kind favour, exalted? Doubly blessed shall I be, in particular, if I can return the hundredth part of the obligations I owe to such honest good parents, to whose pious instructions and examples, under God, I owe all my present happiness and future prospects. Oh, the joy that fills my mind on these proud hopes, on these delightful prospects! It is too mighty for me, and I must sit down to ponder all these things, and to admire and bless the goodness that providence, which has, through so many intricate mazes, made me tread the paths of innocence, and so amply rewarded me for what it has itself enabled me to do. All glory to God alone be ever given for it, by your poor and raptured daughter. I will now continue my most pleasing relation. As the chariot was returning home from this sweet airing, he said, From all that has passed between us in this pleasing turn, my Pamela will see, and will believe, that the trials of her virtue are all over from me. But, perhaps, there will be some few yet to come of her patience and humility for I have, at the earnest importunity of Lady Darnford and her daughters, promised them a sight of my beloved girl, and so I intend to have their whole family, and Lady Jones and Mrs. Peter's family, to dine with me once in a few days, and, since I believe you would hardly choose at present, to grace the table on the occasion till you can do it in your own right, I should be glad you would not refuse coming down to us if I should desire it, for I would preface our nuptials, said the dear gentleman. Oh, what a sweet word was that! with their good opinions of your merits, and to see you and your sweet manner will be enough for that purpose, and so, by degrees, prepare my neighbours for what is to follow, and they already have your character from me, and are disposed to admire you. Sir, said I, after all that has passed, I should be unworthy, if I could not say, that I can have no will but yours, and however awkwardly I shall behave in such company, weighed down with a sense of your obligations on one side and my own unworthiness, 
with their observations on the other, I will not scruple to obey you. I am obliged to you, Pamela, said he, and pray be only dressed as you are, for since they know your condition, and I have told them the story of your present dress, and how you came by it, one of the young ladies begs it as a favour, that they may see you just as you are, and I am the rather pleased it should be so, because they will perceive you owe nothing to dress, but make a much better figure with your own native stock of loveliness, than the greatest ladies arrayed in the most splendid attire, and adorned with the most glittering jewels. "'Oh, sir,' said I, "'your goodness beholds your poor servant in a light greatly beyond her merit. "'But it must not be expected that others, ladies especially, "'will look upon me with your favourable eyes. "'But, nevertheless, I should be best pleased to wear always this humble garb, "'till you, for your own sake, shall order it otherwise. "'For, oh, sir,' said I, "'I hope it will always be my pride to glory most in your goodness. "'And it will be a pleasure to me to show every one "'that, with respect to my happiness in this life, I am entirely the work of your bounty, and to let the world see from what a lowly original you have raised me to honours that the greatest ladies would rejoice in. Admirable Pamela, said he, excellent girl, surely thy sentiments are superior to those of all thy sex. I might have addressed a hundred fine ladies, but never, surely, could have had reason to admire one as I do you. As, my dear father and mother, I repeat these generous sayings, only because they are the effect of my master's goodness, being far from presuming to think I deserve one of them, so I hope you will not attribute it to my vanity, for I do assure you I think I ought rather to be more humble as I am more obliged, for it must always be a sign of a poor condition to receive obligations one cannot repay, as it is of a rich mind when it can confer them without expecting or needing a return. It is, on one side, the state of the human creature, compared, on the other, to the Creator, and so, with due deference, may his beneficence be said to be godlike, and that is the highest that can be said. The chariot brought us home at near the hour of two, and blessed be God, my master is pure well and cheerful, and that makes me hope he does not repent him of his late generous treatment of me. He handed me out of the chariot and to the parlour with the same goodness that he showed when he put me into it before several of the servants. Mrs. Jukes came to inquire how he did. "'Quite well, Mrs. Jukes,' said he, "'quite well. I thank God and this good girl for it.' "'I am glad of it,' said she, "'but I hope you are not the worse for my care and my doctoring of you.' "'No, but the better, Mrs. Jukes,' said he, "'you have much obliged me by both.' Then he said, "'Mrs. Jukes, you and I have used this good girl very hardly. I was afraid, sir,' said she, "'I should be the subject of her complaints. I assure you,' said he, "'she has not opened her lips about you.' We have had quite a different subject to talk of, and I hope she will forgive us both. You especially she must, because you have done nothing but by my orders. But I only mean that the necessary consequence of these orders has been very grievous to my Pamela, and now comes our parts to make her amends, if we can. Sir, said she, I always said to Madame, as she called me, that you was very good and very forgiving. No, said he, I have been stark not, and it is she, I hope, will be very forgiving. But all this preamble is to tell you, Mrs. Jukes, that now I desire you'll study to oblige her, as much as, to obey me, you was forced to disoblige her before, and you'll remember that in everything she is to be her own mistress. Yes, said she, and mine too, I suppose, sir. I, said the generous gentleman, I believe it will be so in a little time. Then, said she, I know how it will go with me, and so put her handkerchief to her eyes. Pamela, said my master, comfort poor Mrs. Jukes. This was very generous, already to seem to put her in my power, and I took her by the hand, and said, I shall never take upon me, Mrs. Jukes, to make a bad use of any opportunities that may be put into my hands by my generous master, nor shall I ever wish to do you any disservice if I might, for I shall consider that what you have done was in obedience to a will which it will become me also to submit to, and so, if the effects of our obedience may be different, yet as they proceed from one cause they must always be reverenced by me see there mrs jukes said my master we are both in generous hands and indeed if pamela did not pardon you i should think she but half forgave me because you acted by my instructions well said she god bless you both together since it must be so and i will double my diligence to oblige my lady as i find she will soon be oh my dear father and mother now pray for me on another score, for fear I should grow too proud and be giddy and foolish with all these promising things so soothing to the vanity of my years and sex. But even to this hour can I pray that God would remove from me all these delightful prospects, 
if they were likely so to corrupt my mind as to make me proud and vain, and not acknowledge, with thankful humility, the blessed providence which has so visibly conducted me through the dangerous paths I have trod to this happy moment. My master was pleased to say that he thought I might as well dine with him, since he was alone, but I begged he would excuse me for fear, as I said, such excess of goodness and condescension all at once should turn my head, and that he would, by slower degrees, bring on my happiness, lest I should not know how to bear it. Persons that doubt themselves, said he, seldom do amiss, and if there was any fear of what you say, you could not have it in your thoughts, for none but the presumptuous, the conceited, and the thoughtless err capitally. But, nevertheless, said he, I have such an opinion of your prudence, that I shall generally think what you do right, because it is you that do it. Sir, said I, your kind expressions shall not be thrown away upon me, if I can help it, for they will task me with the care of endeavouring to deserve your good opinion, and your approbation, as the best rule of my conduct. Being then about to go upstairs, permit me, sir, said I, looking about me with some confusion to see that nobody was there, thus on my knees to thank you, as I often wanted to do in the chariot, for all your goodness to me, which shall never, I hope, be cast away upon me, and so I had the boldness to kiss his hand. I wonder, since, how I came to be so forward. But what could I do? My poor grateful heart was like a too full river, which overflows its banks, and it carried away my fear and my shamefacedness, as that does all before it on the surface of its waters. He clasped me in his arms with transport, and condescendingly kneeled by me, and kissing me, said, O oh, my dear obliging good girl, on my knees, as you on yours, I vow to you everlasting truth and fidelity. And may God but bless us both with half the pleasures that seem to be before us, and we shall have no reason to envy the felicity of the greatest princes. O oh, sir, said I, how shall I support so much goodness? I am poor, indeed, in everything, compared to you, and how far, very far, do you, in every generous way, leave me behind you? He raised me, and, as I bent towards the door, led me to the stair's foot, and, saluting me there again, left me to go up to my closet, where I threw myself on my knees in raptures of joy, and blessed that gracious God, who had thus changed my distress to happiness, and so abundantly rewarded me for all the sufferings I had passed through. And, oh, how light, how very light, do all those sufferings that now appear, which then my repining mind made so grievous to me! Hence, in every state of life, and in all the changes and chances of it, for the future, I will trust in Providence, who knows what is best for us, and frequently turns the very evils we most dread to be the causes of our happiness, and of our deliverance from greater. My experiences, young as I am, as to this great point of reliance on God, are strong, though my judgment in general may be weak and uninformed. But you'll excuse these reflections, because they are your beloved daughters, and, as so far as they are not amiss, derive themselves from the benefit of yours and my late good lady's examples and instructions. I have written a vast deal in a little time, and shall only say, to conclude this delightful Wednesday, that in the afternoon my good master was so well that he rode out on horseback and came home about nine at night, and then stepped up to me, and, seeing me with pen and ink before me in my closet, said, I come only to tell you that I am very well, my Pamela, and since I have a letter or two to write, I will leave you to proceed in yours, as I suppose that was your employment, for I had put by my papers at his coming up. And so he saluted me, bid me good night, and went down, and I finished up to this place before I went to bed. Mrs. Jukes told me, if it was more agreeable to me, she would be in another room, but I said, No, thank you, Mrs. Jukes, pray let me have your company. And she made me a fine curtsy and thanked me. How times are altered! End of section 19《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》
I left everything to his good pleasure, only repeated my request, for the reasons aforegiven, that I might not be too fine. He said, I think, my dear, it shall be very private, I hope you are not afraid of a sham marriage, and pray get the service by heart, that you may see nothing is omitted. I glowed between shame and delight. Oh, how I felt my cheeks burn! I said, I feared nothing, I apprehended nothing, but my own unworthiness. Said he, I think it shall be done within these fourteen days, from this day, at this house. Oh, how I trembled, but not with grief, you may believe. What says my girl? Have you to object against any day of the next fourteen, because my affairs require me to go to my other house, and I think not to stir from this till I am happy with you? I have no will but yours, said I, all glowing like the fire as I could feel. But, sir, did you say in the house? Ay, said he, for I care not how privately it be done, and it must be very public if we go to church. It is a holy right, sir, said I, and would be better, methinks, in a holy place. I see, said he, most kindly, my lovely maid's confusion, and your trembling tenderness shows I ought to oblige you all I may. Therefore I will order my own little chapel, which has not been used for two generations for anything but a lumber-room, because our family seldom resided here long together, to be cleared and cleansed, and got ready for the ceremony, if you dislike your own chamber or mine. Sir, said I, that will be better than the chamber, and I hope it will never be lumbered again, but kept to the use for which, as I presume, it has been consecrated. Oh, yes, said he, it has been consecrated, and that several ages ago, in my great-great-grandfather's time, who built that and the good old house together. But now, my good girl, if I do not too much add to your sweet confusion, shall it be in the first seven days, or the second of this fortnight? I looked down, quite out of countenance. Tell me, said he. In the second, if you please, sir, said I. As you please, said he most kindly. But I should thank you, Pamela, if you would choose the first. I'd rather, sir, if you please, said I, have the second. Well, said he, be it so, but don't defer it till the last day of the fourteen. Pray, sir, said I, since you emboldened me to talk on this important subject, may I not send my dear father and mother word of my happiness? You may, said he, but charge them to keep it secret till you or I direct the contrary. And I told you I would see no more of your papers, but I meant I would not without your consent. But if you will show them to me, and now I have no other motive for my curiosity but the pleasure I take in reading what you write, I shall acknowledge it as a favour. If, sir, said I, you will be pleased to let me write over again one sheet, I will, though I had relied upon your word and not written them for your perusal. What is that? said he, though I cannot consent to it beforehand, for I more desire to see them, because they are your true sentiments at the time, and because they were not written for my perusal. Sir, said I, what I am loath you should see are very severe reflections on the letter I received by the gipsy, when I apprehended your design of the sham marriage, though there are other things I would not have you see, but that is the worst. It can't be worse, said he, my dear sauce-box, than I have seen already, and I will allow your treating me in ever so black a manner, on that occasion, because it must have a very black appearance to you. Well, sir, said I, I think I will obey you before night. But don't alter a word, said he. I won't, sir, replied I, since you order it. While we were talking, Mrs. Jukes came up, and said Thomas was returned. Oh, said my master, let him bring up the papers. For he hoped, and so did I, that you had sent them by him. But it was a great bulk when he came up and said, Sir, Mr. Andrews did not care to deliver them, and would have it that his daughter was forced to write that letter to him. And indeed, sir, said he, the old gentleman took on sadly, and would have it that his daughter was undone, or else, he said, she would not have turned back when on her way, as I told him she did, said Thomas, instead of coming to them. I began to be afraid now that all would be bad for me again. Well, Tom, said he, don't mince the matter. Tell me, before Mrs. Andrews, what they said. Why, sir, both he and Goody Andrews, after they had conferred together upon your letter, madame, came out, weeping bitterly, that grieved my very heart, and they said, Now all was over with their poor daughter, and either she had written that letter by compulsion, or had yielded to your honour, so they said, and was, or would be, ruined. My master seemed vexed, as I feared, and I said, Pray, sir, be so good as to excuse the fears of my honest parents. They cannot know your goodness to me. And so, said he, without answering me, they refused to deliver the papers. Yes, and please your honour, said Thomas, though I told them that you, madame, of your own accord, on a letter I had brought you, very cheerfully wrote what I carried. But the old gentleman said, Why, wife, there are in these papers twenty things nobody should see but ourselves, and especially not the squire. Oh, the poor girl has had so many stratagems to struggle with, and now, at last, she has met with one that has been too hard for her. And can it be possible for us to account for her setting out to come to us, and in such post-haste, and, 
when she had got above half way, to send us this letter, and to go back again of her own accord, as you say, when we know that all her delight would have been to come to us, and to escape from the peril she had been so long contending with. And then, and please your honour, he said, he could not bear this, for his daughter was ruined, to be sure, before now. And so, said Thomas, the good old couple sat themselves down, and, hand in hand, leaning upon each other's shoulder, did nothing but lament. I was piteously grieved, said he, but all I could say could not comfort them, nor would they give me the papers, though I told them I should deliver them only to Mrs. Andrews herself. And so, and please your honour, I was forced to come away without them. My good master saw me all bathed in tears at this description of your distress and fears for me, and he said, I would not have you take on so. I am not angry with your father in the main. He is a good man, and I would have you write out of hand, and it shall be sent by the post to Mr. Atkins, who lives within two miles of your father, and I'll enclose in it a cover of mine, in which I'll desire Mr. Atkins, the moment it comes to his hand, to convey it safely to your father or mother, and say nothing of their sending their papers, that it may not make them uneasy, for I want not now to see them on any other score than that of mere curiosity, and that will do at any time. And so saying, he saluted me before Thomas, and, with his own handkerchief wiped my eyes, and said to Thomas, The good old folks are not to be blamed in the main. They don't know my honourable intentions by their dear daughter, who, Tom, will, in a little time, be your mistress, though I shall keep the matter private some days, and will not have it spoken of by my servants out of my house. Thomas said, God bless your honour, you know best, and I said, Oh, sir, you are all goodness. How kind is this to forgive the disappointment, instead of being angry as I feared you would? Thomas then withdrew, and my master said, I need not remind you of writing out of hand to make the good folks easy, and I will leave you to yourself for that purpose. Only send me down such of your papers as you are willing I should see, with which I shall entertain myself for an hour or two. But one thing, added he, I forgot to tell you. The neighboring gentry I mentioned will be here to-morrow to dine with me, and I have ordered Mrs. Jukes to prepare for them. "'And must I, sir,' said I, "'be shown to them. "'Oh, yes,' said he, "'that's the chief reason of their coming. "'And you'll see nobody equal to yourself. "'Don't be concerned.' "'I opened my papers as soon as my master had left me, "'and laid out those beginning on the Thursday morning "'he set out for Stamford, "'with the morning visit he made me before I was up, "'and the injunctions of watchfulness, etc., to Mrs. Jukes, "'the next day's gypsy affair, and my reflections, in which I called him truly diabolical, and was otherwise very severe, on the strong appearances the matter had then against him. His return on Saturday, with the dread he put me in, on the offering to search me for my papers which followed those he had got by Mrs. Jukes's means, mine being forced to give them up. His carriage to me after he had read them, and questions to me. His great kindness to me on seeing the dangers I had escaped and the troubles I had undergone. And how I unseasonably, in the midst of his goodness, expressed my desire of being sent to you, having the intelligence of a sham marriage from the gypsy in my thoughts. How this enraged him, and made him turn me away that very Sunday out of his house, and send me on my way to you. The particulars of my journey, and my grief at parting with him, and my free acknowledgment to you, that I found, unknown to myself, I had begun to love him, and could not help it. His sending after me to beg my return, but yet generously leaving me at my liberty, when he might have forced me to return whether I was willing or not. My resolution to oblige him, and fatiguing journey back my concern for his illness on my return, his kind reception of me, and showing me his sister Daver's angry letter, against his behaviour to me, desiring him to set me free, and threatening to renounce him as a brother if he should degrade himself by marrying me, my serious reflections on this letter, etc., all of which I hope with the others you will shortly see. And this carried matters down to Tuesday night last. All that followed was so kind on his side, being our chariot conference, as above, on Wednesday morning, and how good he has been ever since, that I thought I would go no further, for I was a little ashamed to be so very open on that tender and most grateful subject, though his great goodness to me deserves all the acknowledgments I can possibly make. And when I had looked these out, I carried them down myself into the parlour to him, and said, putting them into his hands, Your allowance is good, sir, as heretofore, and if I have been too open and free in my reflections or declarations, let my fears on one side, and my sincerity on the other, be my excuse. "'You are very obliging, my good girl,' said he. "'You have nothing to apprehend from my thoughts, any more than from my actions. "'So I went up and wrote the letter to you, "'briefly acquainting you with my present happiness and my master's goodness, 
and expressing the gratitude of heart which i owe to the kindest gentleman in the world and assuring you that i should soon have the pleasure of sending back to you not only those papers but all that succeeded them to this time as i know you delight to amuse yourself in your leisure hours with my scribble and i said carrying it down to my master before i sealed it will you please sir to take the trouble of reading what i write to my dear parents thank you pamela said he and sent me on his knee while he read it and seems much pleased with it and giving it me again you are very happy said he my beloved girl in your style and expressions and the affectionate things you say of me are inexpressibly obliging and again with this kiss said he do i confirm for truth all that you have promised for my intentions in this letter oh what halicon days are these god continue them a change would kill me quite he went out in his chariot in the afternoon and in the evening returned and sent me word he would be glad of my company for a little walk in the garden and down i went that very moment he came to meet me so said he how does my dear girl do now whom do you think i have seen since i have been out i don't know sir said i why said he there is a turning in the road about five miles off that goes round a meadow that has a pleasant footway by the side of a little brook and a double row of limes on each side where now and then the gentry in the neighbourhood walk and angle and divert themselves i'll show it to you next opportunity and i stepped out of my chariot to walk across this meadow and bid robin meet me with it on the further part of it and whom should i spy there walking with a book in his hand reading but your humble servant mr williams don't blush pamela said he as his back was toward me i thought i would speak to the man and before he saw me i said how do you old acquaintance for said he you know we were of one college for a twelvemonth i thought the man would have jumped into the brook he gave such a start at hearing my voice and seeing me poor man said i ay said he but not too much of your poor man in that soft accent neither pamela said i i am sorry my voice is so startling to you mr williams what are you reading sir said he and stammered with the surprise it is the french telemachus for i am about perfecting myself if i can in the french tongue thought i i had rather so than perfecting my pamela in it you do well replied i don't you think that yonder cloud may give us a small shower and it did a little begin to wet he said he believed not much if said i you are for the village i'll give you a cast for i shall call at sir simon's in my return from the little round i am taking he asked me if it was not too great a favour no said i don't talk of that let us walk to the further opening there and we shall meet my chariot so pamela continued my master we fell into conversation as we walked he said he was very sorry he had incurred my displeasure and the more as he had been told by lady jones who had it from sir simon's family that i had a more honourable view than at first was apprehended i said we fellows of fortune mr williams take sometimes a little more liberty with the world than we ought to do wantoning very probably as you contemplative folks would say in the sunbeams of a dangerous affluence and cannot think of confining ourselves to the common paths though the safest and most eligible after all and you may believe i could not very well like to be supplanted in a view that lay next my heart and that by an old acquaintance whose good before this affair i was studious to promote i would only say sir said he that my first motive was entirely such as became my function and very politely said my master he added and i am very sure that however inexcusable i might seem in the progress of the matter you yourself sir would have been sorry to have it said you had cast your thoughts on a person that nobody could have wished for but yourself well mr williams said i i see you are a man of gallantry as well as religion but what i took most amiss was that if you thought me doing a wrong thing you did not expostulate with me upon it as your function might have allowed you to do but immediately determined to counterplot me and attempt to secure to yourself a prize you would have robbed me of and that from my own house but the matter is at an end and i retain not any malice upon it though you did not know but i might at last do honourably by her as i actually intend i am sorry for myself sir said he that i should so unhappily incur your displeasure but i rejoice for her sake in your honourable intentions give me leave only to say that if you make miss andrews your lady she will do credit to your choice with everybody that sees her or comes to know her and for person and mind both you may challenge the country in this manner said my master did the parson and i confabulate and i set him down at his lodgings in the village but he kept your secret pamela and would not own that you gave any encouragement to his addresses indeed sir said i he could not say that i did and i hope you believe me i do i do said he but tis still my opinion that if when i saw plots set up against my plots i had not discovered the parson as i did 
the correspondence between you might have gone to a length that would have put our present situation out of both our powers sir said i when you consider that my utmost presumption could not make me hope for the honour you now seem to design me that i was so hardly used and had no prospect before me but dishonour you will allow that i should have seen very little in earnest in my professions of honesty if i had not endeavoured to get away but yet i resolved not to think of marriage for i never saw the man i could love till your goodness emboldened me to look up to you i should my dear pamela said he make a very ill compliment to my vanity if i did not believe you though at the same time just as calls upon me to say that it is some things considered beyond my merit there was a sweet noble expression for your poor daughter my dear father and mother and from my master too i was glad to hear this account of the interview between mr williams and himself but i dare not to say so i hope in time he will be reinstated in his good graces he was so good as to tell me he had given orders for the chapel to be cleared oh how i look forward with inward joy yet with fear and trembling friday about twelve o'clock came sir simon and his lady and two daughters and lady jones and a sister-in-law of hers and mr peters and his spouse and niece mrs jukes who is more and more obliging was much concerned i was not dressed in some of my best clothes and made me many compliments they all went into the garden for a walk before dinner, and, I understood, were so impatient to see me that my master took them into the largest alcove, after they had walked two or three turns, and stepped himself to me. "'Come, my Pamela,' said he, "'the ladies can't be satisfied without seeing you, and I desire you'll come.' I said, "'I was ashamed, but I would obey him,' said he. "'The two ladies are dressed out in their best attire, but they make not such an appearance as my charming girl in this ordinary garb.' sirs said i shan't i follow you thither for i can't bear you should do me so much honour well said he i'll go before you and he bid mrs jukes bring a bottle of sack and some cake so he went down to them this alcove fronts the longest gravel walk in the garden so that they saw me all the way i came for a good way and my master told me afterwards with pleasure all they said of me will you forgive the little vain slut your daughter if i tell you all as he was pleased to tell me he said, spying me first, "'Look there, ladies, comes my pretty rustic.' They all, I saw, which dashed me, stood at the windows, and in the doorway, looking full at me. My master told me that Lady Jones said, "'She is a charming creature, I see that, at this distance.' And Sir Simon, it seems, who had been a sad rake in his younger days, swore he never saw so easy an air, so fine a shape, and so graceful a presence. The Lady Darnford said, "'I was a sweet girl,' and Mrs. Peter said very handsome things.' Even the parson said, I should be the pride of the county. Oh, dear sirs, all this was owing to the light my good master's favour placed me in, which made me shine out in their eyes beyond my deserts. He said the young ladies blushed, and envied me. When I came near, he saw me in a little confusion, and was so kind as to meet me. Give me your hand, said he, my poor girl, you walk too fast. For, indeed, I wanted to be out of their gazing. I did so with a curtsey and he led me up the steps of the alcove and in a most gentlemanlike manner presented me to the ladies and they all saluted me and said they hoped to be better acquainted with me and lady darnford was pleased to say i should be the flower of their neighbourhood sir simon said good neighbour by your leave and saluting me added now i will say that i have kissed the loveliest maiden in england but for all this methought i owed him a grudge for a tell-tale though all had turned out so happily Mr. Peters very gravely followed his example, and said, like a bishop, "'God bless you, fair excellence.' Said Lady Jones, "'Pray, dear madam, sit down by me.' And they all sat down, but I said I would stand if they pleased. "'No, Pamela,' said my master, "'pray sit down with these good ladies, my neighbours. They will indulge it to you for my sake till they know you better, and for your own when they are acquainted with you. "'Sir,' said I, "'I shall be proud to deserve their indulgence.' They all so gazed at me that I could not look up, for I think it is one of the distinctions of persons of condition and well-bred people to put bashful bodies out of countenance. Well, Sir Simon, said my master, what say you now to my pretty rustic? He swore a great oath that he should better know what to say to me if he was as young as himself. Lady Darnford said, You will never leave, Sir Simon. Said my master, You are a little confused, my good girl, and out of breath but i have told all my kind neighbours here a good deal of your story and your excellence yes said lady darnford my dear neighbour as i will call you we that are here present have all heard of your uncommon story madame i said you have heard then what must make your kind allowance for me very necessary 
no said mrs peters we have heard what will always make you valued as an honour to our sex and as a worthy pattern for all the young ladies in the county you are very good madam said i to make me able to look up and to be thankful for the honour you are pleased to do me mrs jukes came in with the canary brought by nan to the alcove and some cakes and a silver salver and i said mrs jukes let me be your assistant i will serve the ladies with the cake and so i took the salver and went round to the good company with it ending with my master the lady jones said she was never served with such a grace and it was giving me too much trouble oh madame said i i hope my good master's favour will never make me forget that it is my duty to wait upon his friends master sweet one said sir simon i hope you won't always call mr b by that name for fear it should become a fashion for all our ladies to do the like through the county ay sir said i shall have many reasons to continue this style which cannot affect your good ladies sir simon said lady jones you are very arch upon us but i see very well that it will be the interest of all the gentlemen to bring their ladies into an intimacy with one that can give them such a good example i am sure then madam said i it must be after i have been polished and improved by the honour of such an example as yours they were all very good and affable and the young lady darnford who had wished to see me in distress said i beg your pardon dear miss as she called me but i had heard how sweetly this garb became you and was told the history of it and i begged it as a favour that you might oblige us with your appearance in it i am much obliged to your ladyship said i that your kind prescription was so agreeable to my choice why said she was it your choice then i am glad of that though i am sure your person must give and not take ornament from any dress you are very kind madam said i but there will be less reason to fear i should forget the high obligations i should have to the kindest of gentlemen when i can delight to show the humble degree from which his goodness has raised me my dear pamela said my master if you proceed at this rate i must insist upon your first seven days you know what i mean sir said i you are all goodness they drank a glass of sack each and sir simon would make me do so too saying it will be a reflection madam upon all the ladies if you don't do as they no sir simon said i that can't be because the ladies journey hither makes a glass of canary a proper cordial for them but i won't refuse because i will do myself the honour of drinking good health to you and to all this worthy company said good lady darnford to my master i hope sir we shall have mrs andrews company at table he said very obligingly madam it is her time now and i will leave it to her choice if the good ladies then will forgive me sir said i i had rather be excused they all said i must not be excused i begged i might your reason for it my dear pamela said my master since the ladies request it i wish you would oblige them sir replied i your goodness will make me every day worthier of the honour the ladies do me and when i can persuade myself that i am more worthy of it than at present i shall with great joy embrace all the opportunities they will be pleased to give me mrs peters whispered lady jones as my master told me afterwards did you ever see such excellence such prudence and discretion never in my life said the other good lady she will adorn she was pleased to say her distinction ay says mrs peters she would adorn any station in life my good master was highly delighted generous gentleman as he is with the favourable opinion of the ladies and i took the more pleasure in it because their favour seemed to lessen the disgrace of his stooping so much beneath himself lady darnford said we will not oppress you though we can almost blame your too punctilious exactness but if we excuse miss andrews from dinner we must insist upon her company at the card-table and add a dish of tea for we intend to pass the whole day with you sir as we told you what say you to that pamela said my master sir replied i whatever you and the ladies please i will cheerfully do they said i was very obliging but sir simon rapped out an oath and said that they might dine together if they would but he would dine with me and nobody else for said he i say sir as parson williams said by which i found my master had told them the story you must not think you have chosen one that nobody can like but yourself the young lady said if i pleased they would take a turn about the garden with me i answered i would very gladly attend them and so we three and lady jones's sister-in-law and mr peter's niece walked together they were very affable kind and obliging and we soon entered into a good deal of familiarity and i found miss darnford a very agreeable person her sister was a little more on the reserve and i afterwards heard that about a year before she would fain have had my master make his addresses to her but though sir simon is reckoned rich she was not thought sufficient fortune for him and now to have him look down so low as to me must be a sort of mortification to a poor young lady and i pitied her indeed i did i wish all young persons of my sex could be as happy as i am like to be 
My master told me afterwards that I left the other ladies, and Sir Simon and Mr. Peters, full of my praises, so that they could hardly talk of anything else, one launching out upon my complexion, another upon my eyes, my hand, and, in short, for you'll think me sadly proud, upon my whole person and behaviour, and they all magnified my readiness and obligingness in my answers and the like. And I was glad of it, as I said, for my good master's sake, who seemed quite pleased and rejoiced. God bless him for his goodness to me. Dinner not being ready, the young ladies proposed a tune on the spinet. I said I believed it was not in tune. They said they knew it was but a few months ago. If it is, said I, I wish I had known it, though indeed, ladies, added I, since you know my story, I must own that my mind has not been long in tune to make use of it. So they would make me play upon it and sing to it, which I did, a song my dear good lady made me learn, and used to be pleased with, and which she had brought with her from Bath and the ladies were much taken with the song, and were so kind as to approve my performance. And Miss Darnford was pleased to compliment me, that I had all the accomplishments of my sex. I said I had had a good lady, in my master's mother, who had spared no pains nor cost to improve me. She said, she wished Mr. B. could be prevailed upon to give a ball on an approaching happy occasion, that we might have a dancing match, etc. But I can't say I do, though I did not say so. For these occasions, I think, are too solemn for the principles, at least of our sex, to take part in, especially if they have the same thoughts of that solemnity that I have. For, indeed, though I have before me a prospect of happiness, that may be envied by ladies of high rank, yet I must own to you, my dear parents, that I have something very awful upon my mind when I think of the matter, and shall more and more as it draws nearer and nearer. This is the song. 1. Go, happy paper, gently steal, and underneath her pillow lie. There in soft dreams my love reveal, that love which I must still conceal, and wrapped in awful silence die. 2. Should flames be doomed thy hapless fate, to atoms thou wouldst quickly turn, my pains may bear a longer date, for should I live, and should she hate, in endless torments I should burn. 3. Tell fair Aurelia she has charms, might in a hermit stir desire. To attain the heaven that's in her arms, I'd quit the world's alluring harms, and to a cell content retire. 4. Of all that pleased my ravished eye, her beauty should supply the place. Bold Raphael's strokes and Titian's dye, should but in vain presume to vie, with her inimitable face. 5. No more I'd wish her Phobius's rays To gild the object of my sight, Much less the taper's fainter blaze, Her eye should measure out my days, And when she slept it should be night. End of section 20「Section 21 of Pamela or Virtue Rewarded This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pamela, or Virtue Rewarded, by Samuel Richardson. Section 21 About four o'clock My master just came up to me and said, If you should see Mr. Williams below, do you think, Pamela, you should not be surprised? No, sir, said I, I hope not. Why should I? Expect, said he, a stranger, then, when you come down to us in the parlour, for the ladies are preparing themselves for the card-table, and they insist upon your company. You have a mind, sir, said I, I believe, to try all my courage. Why, said he, does it want courage to see him? No, sir, said I, not at all, but I was grievously dashed to see all those strange ladies and gentlemen, and now to see Mr. Williams before them, "'that some of them refused his application for me "'when I wanted to get away. "'It will a little shock me to see them smile "'in recollecting what has passed of that kind. "'Well,' said he, "'guard your heart against surprises, "'though you shall see when you come down "'a man that I can allow you to love dearly, "'though hardly preferably to me. "'This surprises me much. "'I am afraid he begins to be jealous of me, what will become of me, for he looked very seriously, if any turn should happen now? My heart aches. I know not what's the matter, but I will go down as brisk as I can, that nothing may be imputed to me. Yet I wish this Mr. Williams had not been there now, 
when they are all there, because of their fleers at me and him. Otherwise I should be glad to see the poor gentleman, for indeed I think him a good man, and he has suffered for my sake. So I am sent for down to cards. I'll go, but wish I may continue their good opinions of me, for I shall be very awkward. My master, by his serious question, and bidding me guard my heart against surprises, though I should see, when I came down, a man he can allow me to love dearly, though hardly better than himself, has quite alarmed me, and made me sad. I hope he loves me, but whether he does or not, I am in for it now, over head and ears. I doubt, and can't help loving him. "'Tis a folly to deny it, but to be sure I can't love any man preferably to him. "'I shall soon know what he means. "'Now, my dear mother, must I write to you? "'Well might my good master say so mysteriously as he did "'about guarding my heart against surprises. "'I was never so surprised in my life, "'and never could see a man I loved so dearly. "'Oh, my dear mother, it was my dear, dear father, "'and not Mr. Williams, that was below, "'ready to receive and to bless your daughter. "'And both my master and he enjoined me to write "'how the whole matter was, "'and what my thoughts were on this joyful occasion. "'I will take the matter from the beginning, "'that Providence directed his feet to the house to this time, "'as I have had it from Mrs. Jukes, "'from my master, my father, the ladies, "'and my own heart and conduct, "'as far as I know of both.' "'because they command it, and you will be pleased with my relation, "'and so, as you know how I came by the connection, "'will make one uniform relation of it. "'It seems, then, my dear father and you "'were so uneasy to know the truth of the story "'which Thomas had told you, "'that fearing I was betrayed and quite undone, "'he got leave of absence and set out that day "'after Thomas was there. "'And so, on Friday morning, he got to the neighbouring town, and there he heard that the gentry in the neighbourhood were at my master's at a great entertainment. He put on a clean shirt and neckcloth, which he bought in his pocket, at an alehouse there, and got shaved. And so, after he had eaten some bread and cheese, and drank a can of ale, he set out for my master's house with a heavy heart, dreading for me, and in much fear of being browbeaten. He had, it seems, asked at the alehouse what family the squire had down here, "'in hopes to hear something of me. "'And they said, a housekeeper, two maids, "'and at present two coachmen and two grooms, "'a footman and a helper. "'Was that all?' he said. "'They told him there was a young creature there belike "'who was, or was to be, his mistress, "'or somewhat of that nature, "'but had been his mother's waiting-maid. "'This, he said, grieved his heart and confirmed his fears.' So he went on, and about three o'clock in the afternoon came to the gate, and ringing there, Sir Simon's coachman went to the iron gate, and he asked for the housekeeper, though from what he had written, in his heart he could not abide her. She sent for him in, little thinking who he was, and asked him in the little hall what his business with her was. "'Only, madam,' he said, "'whether I cannot speak one word with the squire.' "'No, friend,' said she, "'He is engaged with several gentlemen and ladies. "'Said he, I have business with his honour "'of greater consequence to me than either life or death, "'and tears stood in his eyes. "'At that she went into the great parlour "'where my master was talking very pleasantly with the ladies, "'and she said, "'Sir, he is a good, tight old man "'that wants to see you on business of life and death,' he says, "'and is very earnest. "'Aye,' said he, "'who can that be?' "'Let him stay in the little hall, and I'll come to him presently.' "'They all seemed to stare, and Sir Simon said, "'No more or less, my dare say, my good friend, but a bastard child. "'If it is,' said Lady Jones, "'bring it in to us. I will,' said he. "'Mrs. Jukes tells me my master was much surprised when he saw who it was, "'and she much more, when my dear father said, "'Good God, give me patience.' "'But as great as you are, sir, I must ask for my child, and burst out into tears. "'Oh, what trouble have I given you both!' "'My master said, taking him by the hand, "'Don't be uneasy, Goodman Andrews. "'Your daughter was on the way to be happy.' "'This alarmed my dear father, and he said, "'What, then, is she dying?' "'And trembled, he could scarce stand. "'My master made him sit down, and sat down by him, and said, "'No,' God be praised, she is very well. 
and pray be comforted i cannot bear to see you thus apprehensive but she has written you a letter to assure you that she has reason to be well satisfied and happy ah sir i said he you told me once she was in london waiting on a bishop's lady when all the time she was a severe prisoner here well that's all over goodman andrews said my master but the times are altered for now the sweet girl has taken me prisoner and in a few days I shall put on the most agreeable fetters that ever man wore. "'Oh, sir,' said he, "'you are too pleasant for my griefs. My heart's almost broke. But may I not see my poor child? You shall presently,' said he, for is she coming down to us, and since you won't believe me, I hope you will her. "'I ask you, good sir,' said he, "'but one question until then, that I may know how to look upon her when I see her. Is she honest? Is she virtuous?' "'As a new-born babe, Mr. Andrews,' said my good master, "'and in twelve days' time, I hope, will be my wife.' "'Oh, flatter me not, good your honour," said he. "'It cannot be, it cannot be. "'I fear you have deluded her with strange hopes, "'and would make me believe impossibilities. "'Mrs. Jukes,' said he, "'do you tell my dear Pamela's good father, when I go out, "'all you know concerning me, and your mistress that is to be?' "'Meanwhile, make much of him, and set out what you have, "'and make him drink a glass of what he likes best. "'If this be wine,' added he, "'fill me a bumper.' "'She did so, and he took my father by the hand, and said, "'Believe me, good man, and be easy, "'for I can't bear to see you tortured in this cruel suspense. "'Your dear daughter is the beloved of my soul. "'I am so glad you are come, "'for you'll see us all in the same story.' "'and here's your dame's health, and God bless you both, "'for being the happy means of procuring for me so great a blessing.' "'And so he drank a bumper to this most obliging health. "'What do I hear? It cannot surely be,' said my father. "'And your honour is too good, I hope, to mock a poor old man. "'This ugly story of the bishop runs in my head. "'But you say I shall see my dear child, and I shall see her honest. "'If not, poor as I am, I would not own her. My master bid Mrs. Jukes not let me know yet that my father was come. I went to the company and said, I have been agreeably surprised. Here is honest old Goodman Andrews come full of grief to see his daughter, for he fears she is seduced, and tells me, good honest man, that poor as he is, he will not own her if she be not virtuous. Oh, said they all with one voice almost, dear sir, shall we not see the good man you have so praised for his plain good sense and honest heart? If, said he, I thought Pamela would not be too much affected with the surprise, I would make you all witness to their first interview. For never did daughter love a father, or father a daughter, as they two do one another. Miss Darnford and all the ladies and gentlemen too begged it might be so. "'But was this not very cruel, my dear mother? "'For well might they think I should not support myself "'in such an agreeable surprise.' "'He said kindly, I have but one fear, "'that the dear girl may be too much affected. "'Oh,' said Lady Darnford, "'we'll all help to keep up her spirits. "'Says he, I'll go up and prepare her, "'but I won't tell her of it. "'So he came up to me, as I have said, "'and amused me about Mr. Williams.' "'to half prepare me for some surprise, "'although they could not have said anything to this, "'and he left me, as I said, "'in that suspense at his mystical words, "'saying he would send to me "'when they were going to cards. "'My master went from me to my father "'and asked if he had eaten anything. "'No,' said Mrs. Jukes, "'the good man's heart is so full he cannot eat, "'nor do anything till he has seen his dear daughter. "'That shall be soon,' said my master.' "'I will have you come in with me, "'for she is going to sit down with my guests "'to a game at quadrille, "'and I will send for her down. "'Oh, sir,' said my father, "'don't, don't let me. "'I am not fit to appear before your guests. "'Let me see my daughter by myself, I beseech you.' "'Said he, "'They all know your honest character, "'Goodman Andrews, "'and long to see you for Pamela's sake.' "'So he took my father by the hand "'and led him in against his will to the company.' They were all very good. My master kindly said, Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you one of the honestest men in England, my good Pamela's father. Mr. Peters went to him and took him by the hand and said, We are all glad to see you, sir. 
"'You are the happiest man in the world in a daughter, "'whom we never saw before to-day, but cannot enough admire.' "'Said my master, "'This gentleman, Goodman Andrews, is the minister of the parish, "'but is not young enough for Mr. Williams.' This airy expression, my poor father said, made him fear for a moment that it was all a jest. Sir Simon also took him by the hand and said, Ay, you have a sweet daughter, honesty, we are all in love with her. And the ladies came and said very fine things, Lady Darnford particularly, that he might think himself the happiest man in England in such a daughter. If, and it please you, madam, said he, she be but virtuous, tis all in all. "'for all the rest is accident. "'But I doubt his honour had been too much upon the jest with me. "'No,' said Mrs. Peters, "'we are all witnesses that he intends very honourably by her. "'It is some comfort,' said he, and wiped his eyes, "'that such good ladies say so. "'But I wish I could see her.' "'They would have had him sit down by them, "'but he would only sit behind the door in a corner of the room, so that one could not soon see him as one came in, because the door opened against him and hid him almost. The ladies all sat down, and my master said, Desire Mrs. Jukes to step up, and tell Miss Andrews the ladies wait for her. So down I came. Miss Stanford rose and met me at the door, and said, Well, Miss Andrews, we longed for your company. I did not see my dear father, and it seems his heart was too full to speak and he got up and sat down three or four times successively, unable to come to me or to say anything. The ladies looked that way, but I would not, supposing it was Mr. Williams, and they made me sit down between Lady Darnford and Lady Jones, and asked me what we should play at. I said, at what your ladyships please. I wondered to see them smile, and look upon me, and to that corner of the room, "'but I was afraid of looking that way "'for fear of seeing Mr. Williams, "'though my face was that way too "'and the table before me. "'Said my master, "'Did you send your letter away to the post-house, "'my good girl, for your father? "'To be sure, sir,' said I, "'I did not forget that. "'I took the liberty to desire Mr. Thomas to carry it. "'What,' said he, "'I wonder, will the good old couple say to it? "'Oh, sir,' said I, "'your goodness will be a cordial "'to their dear honest hearts.' At that my dear father, not able to contain himself, nor yet to stir from the place, gushed out into a flood of tears, which he, good soul, had been struggling with, it seems, and cried out, "Oh, my dear child! I knew the voice, and lifting up my eyes, and seeing my father, gave a spring, overturned the table without regard to the company, and threw myself at his feet. "'Oh, my father, my father,' said I, "'can it be? Is it you?' "'Yes, it is, yes, it is. "'Oh, bless your happy daughter,' I would have said, "'and down I sunk. "'My master seemed concerned. "'I feared,' said he, "'that the surprise would be too much for her spirits, "'and all the ladies ran to me, "'and made me drink a glass of water. "'And I found myself encircled in the arms of my dearest father. "'Oh, tell me,' I said I, "'everything. "'How long have you been here? "'When did you come? "'How does my honoured mother?' "'and half a dozen questions more before he could answer one. "'They permitted me to retire with my father, "'and then I poured forth all my vows and thanksgivings to God "'for this additional blessing, "'and confirmed all my master's goodness "'to his scarce-believing amazement. "'And we kneeled together, blessing God and one another "'for several ecstatic minutes, "'and my master coming in soon after, "'my dear father said, "'Oh, sir, what a change is this!' May God reward and bless you, both in this world and the next. May God bless us all, said he. But how does my sweet girl? I have been in pain for you. I am sorry I did not apprise you beforehand. Oh, sir, said I, it was you, and all you do must be good, but this was a blessing so unexpected. Well, said he, you have given pain to all the company. They will be glad to see you when you can, for you have spoiled all their diversion and yet painfully delighted them at the same time. Mr. Andrews, added he, do you make this house your own, and the longer you stay, the more welcome you'll be. After you have a little composed yourself, my dear girl, step into us again. I'm glad to see you so well already. And so he left us. 
see you, my dear father, said I, what goodness there is in this once naughty master. Oh, pray for him, and pray for me that I may deserve it. How long has this happy change been wrought, my dear child? Oh, said I, several happy days. I have written down everything, and you'll see from the depth of misery what God has done for your happy daughter. Blessed be his name, said he. But do you say he will marry you? Can it be that such a brave gentleman will make a lady of the child of such a poor man as I? Oh, the divine goodness! How will your poor dear mother be able to support these happy tidings? I will set out to-morrow to acquaint her with them, for I am but half happy till the dear woman shares them with me. To be sure, my dear child, we ought to go to some far country to hide ourselves, that we may not disgrace you by our poverty. Oh, my dear father, said I, now you are unkind for the first time. Your poverty has been my glory and my riches. And I have nothing to brag of, but that I ever thought it was an honour, rather than a disgrace, because you were always so honest, that your child might well boast of such a parentage. In this manner, my dear mother, did we pass the happy moments, till Miss Darnford came to me and said, How do you do, dear madam? I rejoice to see you so well. Pray let us have your company, and yours too, good Mr. Andrews, taking his hand. This was very obliging, I told her, and we went to the great parlour, and my master took my father by the hand, and made him sit down by him, and drink a glass of wine with him. Meantime I made my excuses to the ladies as well as I could, which they readily granted me. But Sir Simon, after his comical manner, put his hands on my shoulders. "'Let me see, let me see,' said he, "'where your wings grow, for I never saw anybody fly like you. "'Why,' said he, "'you have broken Lady Joan's shins with the table. "'Show her else, madam.' "'His pleasantry made them laugh, and I said I was very sorry for my extravagancy, "'and if it had not been my master's doing, I should have said "'it was a fault to permit me to be so surprised.' "'and put out of myself before such good company. "'They said all was very excusable, "'and they were glad I had suffered no more by it. "'They were so kind as to excuse me at cards "'and played by themselves, "'and I went by my master's commands "'and sat on the other side, "'in the happiest place I was ever blessed with, "'between two of the dearest men in the world to me, "'and each holding one of my hands. "'My father, even... "'every now and then, with tears, lifting up his eyes and saying, "'Could I ever have hoped this?' "'I asked him if he had been so kind as to bring the papers with him. "'He said he had, and looked at me, as who should say, "'Must I give them to you now?' "'I said, Be pleased to let me have them. "'He pulled them from his pocket, and I stood up, "'and with my best duty gave them into my master's hands.' He said, Thank you, Pamela. Your father shall take all with him, so see what a sad fellow I have been, as well as the present happier alteration. But I must have them all again, for the writer's sake. The ladies and gentlemen would make me govern the tea-table, whatever I could do, and Abraham attended me to serve the company. My master and my father sat together, and drank a glass or two of wine instead of tea and Sir Simon joked with my master, saying, I warrant you would not be such a woman's man as to drink tea for ever so much with the ladies. But your time's coming, and I doubt not you'll be made as comfortable as I. My master was very urgent with them to stay supper, and at last they complied, on condition that I would grace the table, as they were pleased to call it. I begged to be excused. My master said, Don't be excused, Pamela, since the ladies desire it. "'And besides,' said he, "'we won't part with your father, "'and so you may as well stay with us.' "'I was in hopes that my father and I "'might sup by ourselves, or only with Mrs. Jukes, "'and Miss Darnford, who was a most obliging young lady, "'said, "'We will not part with you. "'Indeed we won't.' "'When supper was brought in, "'Lady Darnford took me by the hand "'and said to my master, "'Sir, by your leave, "'and would have placed me at the upper end of the table.' "'Pray, pray, madam,' said I, "'excuse me. "'I cannot do it. "'Indeed I cannot.' "'Pamela,' said my master, "'to the great delight of my good father, "'as I could see by his looks, "'oblige Lady Danford, since she desires it. 
"'It is but a little before your time, you know.' "'Dear good sir,' said I, "'pray don't command it. "'Let me sit by my father, pray.' "'Why,' said Sir Simon, "'here's a do indeed. "'Sit down at the upper end, as you should do, "'and your father shall sit beside you there. "'This put my dear father upon difficulties. "'And my master said, "'Come, I'll place you all.' "'and so put Lady Downford at the upper end, "'Lady Jones at her right hand, and Mrs. Peters on the other, "'and he placed me between the two young ladies, "'but very genteelly put Miss Downford below her younger sister, "'saying, Come, Miss, I put you here, "'because you shall hedge in this little cuckoo, "'for I take notice with pleasure of your goodness to her, "'and besides, all you very young ladies should sit together.' This seemed to please both sisters, for had the youngest miss been put there, it might have piqued her, as matters had been formerly to be placed below me, whereas Miss Darnford, giving place to her younger sister, made it less odd she should to me, especially with that handsome turn of the dear man, as if I were a cuckoo and to be hedged in. My master kindly said, Come, Mr. Andrews, you and I will sit together and so took his place at the bottom of the table, and set my father on his right hand, and Sir Simon would sit on his left. For, said he, Parson, I think the petticoat should sit together, and so do you sit down by that lady, his sister. A boiled turkey standing by me, my master said, Cut up the turkey, Pamela, if it be not too strong work for you, that Lady Downford may not have too much trouble. So I carved it in a trice, and helped the lady. Miss Stanford said, I would give something to be so dexterous a carver. Oh, madam, said I, my late good lady would always make me do these things, when she entertained her female friends, as she used to on particular days. Ah, said my master, I remember my poor mother would often say, if I or anybody at the table happened to be a little out in carving, I'll send up for my Pamela to show you how to carve. Said Lady Jones, Miss Andrews has every accomplishment of her sex. She is quite wonderful for her years. Miss Darnford said, and I can tell you, madam, that she plays sweetly upon the spinet, and sings as sweetly to it, for she has a fine voice. Foolish, said Sir Simon, who that hears her speak knows not that, and who that sees her fingers believes not that they were made to touch any key. Oh, parson, said he, tis well you're by, or I should have had a blush from the ladies. "'I hope not, Sir Simon,' said Lady Jones, "'for a gentleman of your politeness would not say anything that would make ladies blush.' "'No, no,' said he, "'for the world. "'But if I had, it would have been, as the poet says, "'they blush because they understood.' "'When the company went away, Lady Downford, Lady Jones, and Mrs. Peters "'severally invited my master and me with him to the houses.' "'and begged that he would permit me at least to come before we left those parts. "'And they said, we hope when the happy knot is tied, "'we will induce Mr. B. to reside more amongst us. "'We are always glad,' said Lady Darnford, when he was here, "'but now shall have double reason. "'Oh, what grateful things were these to the ears of my good father!' "'When the company was gone, my master asked my father if he smoked. "'He answered, no. "'He made us both sit down by him and said, I have been telling this sweet girl that in fourteen days, and two of them are gone, she must fix on one to make me happy, and have left it to her to choose either one of the first or the last seven. My father held up his hands and eyes. God bless your honour, said he, is all I can say. Now, Pamela, said my master, taking my hand, don't let a little wrong time bashfulness take place without any other reason. "'because I should be glad to go to Bedfordshire as soon as I could, "'and I would not return till I carry my servants there a mistress "'who would assist me to repair the mischief she has made in it.' "'I could not look up for confusion, and my father said, "'My dear child, I need not, I am sure, prompt your obedience "'at whatever will most oblige so good a gentleman.' "'What says my Pamela?' says my master. "'She does not used to be at a loss for expressions.' "'Sir,' said I, "'was I too sudden? "'It would look as if I doubted whether you would hold in your mind, "'and was not willing to give you time for reflection. "'But otherwise, to be sure, I ought to resign myself implicitly to your will.' "'Said he, "'I want not time for reflection, "'for I have often told you, and that long ago, "'I could not live without you. 
and my pride of condition made me both tempt and terrify you to other terms. But your virtue was proof against all temptations, and was not to be awed by terrors. Wherefore, as I could not conquer my passion for you, I corrected myself, and resolved, since you would not be mine upon my terms, you should be upon your own. And now I desire you not on any other, I assure you, and I think the sooner it is done, the better. What say you, Mr. Andrews? Sir, said he, there is so much goodness on your side, and blessed be God, so much prudence on my daughter's, that I must be quite silent. But when it is done, I and my poor wife shall have nothing to do but to pray for you both, and to look back with wonder and joy on the ways of Providence. This, said my master, is Friday night, and supposing my girl it be next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday morning. Say, my Pamela, Will you, sir, said I, excuse me till to-morrow for an answer? I will, said he, and touched the bell and called for Mrs. Jukes. Where, said he, does Mr. Andrews lie to-night? You'll take care of him. He's a very good man, and will bring a blessing upon every house he sets foot in. My dear father wept for joy, and I could not refrain keeping him company. And my master, saluting me, bid us good-night, and retired. And I waited upon my dear father, and was so full of prattle of my master's goodness and my future prospects, that I believed after that I was turned all into tongue. But he indulged me, and was transported with joy, and went to bed, and dreamed of nothing but Jacob's ladder, and angels ascending and descending to bless him and his daughter. End of section 21《Section 22 of Pamela, or Virtue Rewarded. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — Pamela, or Virtue Rewarded by Samuel Richardson. — Section 22 — Saturday. I arose early in the morning, but found my father was up before me, and was gone to walk in the garden. I went to him and with what delight with what thankfulness did we go over every scene of it that had before been so dreadful to me the fish-pond the back door and every place oh what reason had we for thankfulness and gratitude about seven o'clock my good master joined us in his morning-gown and slippers and looking a little heavy i said sir i fear you had not good rest last night that is your fault pamela said he after i went from you i must needs look into your papers and could not leave them till i had read them through and so twas three o'clock before i went to sleep i wish sir said i you had had better entertainment the worst part of it said he was what i had brought upon myself and you have not spared me sir said i he interrupting me said well i forgive you you had too much reason for it, but I find plainly enough that if you had got away you would soon have been William's wife, and I can't see how it could well have been otherwise. Indeed, sir, said I, I had no notion of it, or of being anybody's. I believe so, said he, but it must have come as a thing, of course, and I see your father was for it. Sir, said he, I little thought of the honour your goodness would confer upon her, and I thought that would be a match above what we could do for her, a great deal. But when I found she was not for it, I resolved not to urge her, but leave all to her own prudence. I see, said he, all was sincere, honest, and open, and I speak of it, if it had been done, as a thing that could hardly well be avoided, and I am quite satisfied. But, said he, I must observe, as I have a hundred times, with admiration what a prodigious memory and easy and happy manner of narration this excellent girl has, and though she is full of her pretty tricks and artifices, to escape the snares I had laid for her, yet all is innocent, lovely, and uniformly beautiful. You are exceedingly happy in a daughter, and I hope I shall be so in a wife or said my father may she not have that honour i fear it not said he and i hope 
I shall deserve it of her. But Pamela, said my master, I am sorry to find in some parts of your journal that Mrs. Jukes carried her orders a little too far, and I the more take notice of it, because you have not complained to me of her behaviour as she might have expected for some parts of it, though a good deal was occasioned by my strict orders. But she had the insolence to strike my girl, I find. Sir, said I, I was a little provoking, I believe, but as we forgave one another, I was the less entitled to complain of her. Well, said he, you are very good, but if you have any particular resentment, I will indulge it so far as that she shall hereafter have nothing to do where you are. Sir, said I, you are so kind, that I ought to forgive everybody, and when I see that my happiness is brought about by the very means that I thought then my greatest grievance, I ought to bless those means and forgive all that was disagreeable to me at the same time, for the great good that hath issued from it. That, said he, and kissed me, is sweetly considered, and it shall be my part to make you amends for what you have suffered, that you may still think lighter of the one, and have cause to rejoice in the other. My dear father's heart was full, and he said with his hands folded and lifted up, Pray, sir, let me go, let me go to my dear wife, and tell her all these blessed things, while my heart holds, for it is ready to burst with joy. Good man, said my master, I hope to hear this honest heart of yours speaking at your lips. I enjoin you, Pamela, to continue your relation as you have opportunity, and though your father be here, write to your mother that this wondrous story be perfect, and we, your friends, may read and admire you more and more. Ay, pray, pray do, my child, said my father, and this is the reason that I write on, my dear mother, when I thought not to do it, because my father could tell you all that passed while he was here. My master took notice of my psalm, and was pleased to commend it, and said that I had very charitably turned the last verses, which in the original were full of heavy curses, to a wish that showed I was not of an implacable disposition, though my then usage might have excused it if I had. But, said he, I think you shall sing it to me to-morrow. After we have breakfasted, added he, if you have no objection, Pamela, we'll take an airing together, and it shall be in the coach, because we'll have your father's company. He would have excused himself, but my master would have it so, but he was much ashamed because of the meanness of his appearance. My master would make us both breakfast with him on chocolate, and he said, I would have you, Pamela, begin to dress as you used to do, for now, at least, you may call your two other bundles your own, and if you want anything against the approaching occasion, private as I design it, I'll send to Lincoln for it, by a special messenger. I said, my good lady's bounty, and his own, had set me much above my degree, and I had very good things of all sorts, and I did not desire any other, because I would not excite the censure of the ladies, that would be a different thing, he was pleased to say, when he publicly owned his nuptials, after we came to the other house. But at present, if I was satisfied, he would not make words with me. I hope, Mr. Andrews, said he to my father, you'll not leave us till you see the affair over, and then you'll be sure I mean honourably. And besides, Pamela will be induced to set the day sooner. Oh, sir, said he, I bless God I have no reason to doubt your meaning honourably, and I hope you'll excuse me if I set out on Monday morning, very early, to my dear wife, and make her as happy as I am. Why, Pamela, says my good master, may it not be performed on Tuesday, and then your father, maybe, will stay. I should have been glad to have had it to-morrow, added he, but I have sent Monsieur Colbrand for a license that you may have no scruple unanswered, and he can't very well be back before to-morrow night, or Monday morning. This was most agreeable news. I said, Sir, I know my dear father will want to be at home, and as you was so good to give me a fortnight from last Thursday, I should be glad you would be pleased to indulge me still to some day in the second seven. Well, said he, 
i will not be too urgent but the sooner you fix the better mr andrews we must leave something to these jephthah's daughters in these cases he was pleased to say i suppose the little bashful folly which in the happiest circumstances may give a kind of regret to quit the maiden state and an awkwardness at the entrance into a new one is a reason with pamela and so she shall name her day sir said he you are all goodness i went up soon after and new dressed myself taking possession in a happy moment i hope of my two bundles as my good master was pleased to call them alluding to my former division of those good things my lady and himself bestowed upon me and so put on fine linen silk shoes and fine white cotton stockings a fine quilted coat a delicate green mantilla silk gown and coat a french necklace and a laced cambric handkerchief with clean gloves and taking my fan in my hand i like a little proud hussy looked in the glass and thought myself a gentlewoman once more but i forgot not to return due thanks for being able to put on this dress with so much comfort mrs jukes would help to dress me and complimented me highly saying among other things that now i looked like a lady indeed and as she said the little chapel was ready and divine service would be read in it to-morrow she wished the happy knot might then be tied said she have you not seen the chapel madam since it has been cleaned out no said i but are we to have service in it to-morrow do you say i am glad of that for i have been a sad heathen lately sore against my will but who is to officiate somebody replied she mr peters will send you tell me very good news said i mrs jukes i hope it will never be a lumber-room again i said she i can tell you more good news for the two misses darnford and lady jones are to be here at the opening of it and will stay and dine with you my master said i has not told me that you must alter your style madam said she it must not be master now sure oh returned i this is a language i shall never forget he shall always be my master and i shall think myself more and more his servant my poor father did not know i went up to dress myself and he said his heart misgave him when he saw me first for fear i was made a fool of and that here was some fine lady that was to be my master's true wife and he stood in admiration and said oh my dear child how well will you become your happy condition why you look like a lady already i hope my dear father said i and boldly kissed him i shall always be your dutiful daughter whatever my condition be my master sent me word he was ready and when he saw me said dress as you will pamela you're a charming girl and so handed me to the coach and would make my father and me sit both on the foreside and sat backwards over against me and bid the coachman drive to the meadow that is where he once met mr williams the conversation was most agreeable to me and to my dear father as we went and he more and more exceeded in goodness and generosity and while i was gone up to dress he had presented my father with twenty guineas desiring him to buy himself and my mother such apparel as they should think proper and lay it all out but i knew not this till after we came home my father having had no opportunity to tell me of it he was pleased to inform me of the chapel being got in tolerable order and said it looked very well and against he came down next it should be all new whitewashed and painted and lined and a new pulpit cloth cushion desk etc and that it should always be kept in order for the future he told me the two misses darnford and lady jones would dine with him on sunday and with their servants and mine said he we shall make a tolerable congregation and added he have i not well contrived to show you that the chapel is really a little house of god and has been consecrated before we solemnize our nuptials in it oh sir replied i your goodness to me is inexpressible mr peters said he offered to come and officiate in it but would not stay to dine with me because he has company at his own house 
and so I intend that divine service shall be performed in it by one to whom I shall make some yearly allowance, as a sort of chaplain. You look serious, Pamela, added he. I know you think of your friend Williams. Indeed, sir, said I, if you won't be angry, I did. Poor man, I am sorry I have been the cause of his disobliging you. When we came to the meadow, where the gentry have their walk sometimes, the coach stopped and my master alighted, and led me to the brookside, and it is a very pretty summer walk. He asked my father if he chose to walk out, or go on in the coach to the farther end. He, poor man, chose to go on in the coach, for fear, he said, any gentry should be walking there, and he told me he was most of the way upon his knees in the coach, thanking God for his gracious mercies and goodness, and begging a blessing upon my good master and me. I was quite astonished when we came into the shady walk to see Mr. Williams there. See there, said my master, there's poor Williams taking his solitary walk again with his book, and it seems it was so contrived for Mr. Peters had been, as I since find, desired to tell him to be in that walk at such an hour in the morning. So, old acquaintance, said my master, again have I met you in this place? What book are you now reading? He said it was Boileau's Lutran. Said my master, you see I have brought with me my little fugitive that would have been. While you are perfecting yourself in French, I am trying to learn English and hope soon to be master of it. Mine, sir, said he, is a very beautiful piece of French, but your English has no equal. You are very polite, Mr. Williams, said my master, and he that does not think as you do deserves no share in her. Why, Pamela, added he, very generously, why so strange, where you have once been so familiar? I do assure you both, that I mean not by this interview to insult Mr. Williams, or confound you. Then I said, Mr. Williams, I am very glad to see you well, and though the generous favour of my good master has happily changed the scene, since you and I last saw one another, I am nevertheless very glad of an opportunity to acknowledge, with gratitude, your good intentions, not so much to serve me as me, but as a person that then had great reason to believe herself in distress. And I hope, sir, added I, to my master, your goodness will permit me to say this. You, Pamela, said he, may make what acknowledgments you please to Mr. William's good intentions, and I would have you speak as you think, but I do not apprehend myself to be quite so much obliged to those intentions. Sir, said Mr. Williams, I beg leave to say, I knew well that, by education, you was no libertine, nor had I reason to think you so by inclination. And when you came to reflect, I hoped you would not be displeased with me, and this was no small motive to me, at first, to do as I did. I, but Mr. Williams, said my master, could you think I should have had reason to thank you, if loving one person above all her sex you had robbed me of her, and married her yourself? And then, said he, you are to consider that she was an old acquaintance of mine, and a quite new one to you, that I had sent her down to my own house for better securing her, and that you, who had access to my house, could not effect your purpose without being guilty in some sort of a breach of the laws of hospitality and friendship. As to my designs upon her, I own they had not the best appearance, but still I was not answerable to Mr. Williams for those. Much less could you be excused to invade a property so very dear to me, and to endeavour to gain an interest in her affections, when you could not be certain that matters would not turn out as they have actually done. I own, said he, that some parts of my conduct seem exceptionable, as you state it. But, sir, I am but a young man. I meant no harm. I had no interest, I am sure, to incur your displeasure. And when you think of everything, and the inimitable graces of person, and perfections of mind, that adorn this excellent lady, so he called me, you will, perhaps, find your generosity allow something as an extenuation of a fault, which your anger would not permit as an excuse. 
I have done, said my master, nor did I meet you here to be angry with you. Pamela knew not that she should see you, and now you are both present, I would ask you, Mr. Williams, if now you know my honourable designs towards this good girl, you can really be almost, I will not say quite, as well pleased with the friendship of my wife as you could be with the favour of Mrs. Andrews. Sir, said he, I will answer you truly. I think I could have preferred with her any condition that could have befallen me, had I considered only myself. But, sir, I was very far from having any encouragement to expect her favour, and I had much more reason to believe that, if she could have hoped for your goodness, her heart would have been too much pre-engaged to think of anybody else. And give me leave further to say, sir, that though I tell you sincerely my thoughts, were I only to consider myself, yet, when I consider her good and her merit, I should be highly ungenerous were it put to my choice, if I could not wish her in a condition so much superior to what I could raise her to, and so very answerable to her merit. Pamela, said my master, you are obliged to Mr. Williams, and ought to thank him. He has distinguished well, but as for me, who had liked to have lost you by his means, I am glad the matter was not left to his choice. Mr. Williams, added he, I give you Pamela's hand, because I know it will be pleasing to her, in token of her friendship and esteem for you, and I give you mine, that I will not be your enemy. But yet I must say, that I think I owe this proper manner of your thinking more to your disappointment than to the generosity you talk of. Mr. Williams kissed my hand, as my master gave it him, and my master said, Sir, you will go home and dine with me, and I'll show you my little chapel. And do you, Pamela, look upon yourself at liberty to number Mr. Williams in the list of your friends? How generous, how noble was this! Mr. Williams, and so had I, had tears of pleasure in his eyes. I was silent, but Mr. Williams said, Sir, I shall be taught by your generosity to think myself inexcusably wrong in every step I took that could give you offence, and my future life shall show my respectful gratitude. We walked on till we came to the coach where was my dear father. Pamela, said my master, tell Mr. Williams who that good man is. Oh, Mr. Williams, said I, it is my dear father, and my master was pleased to say, one of the honestest men in England. Pamela owes everything that she is to be, as well as her being, to him, for I think she would not have brought me to this, nor made so great resistance, but for the good lessons and religious education she had imbibed from him. Mr. Williams said, taking father's hand, You see, good Mr. Andrews, with inexpressible pleasure, no doubt, the fruits of your pious care, and now are in a way with your beloved daughter, to reap the happy effects of it. I am overcome, said my dear father, with his honour's goodness, but I can only say, I bless God and bless him. Mr. Williams and I being nearer the coach than my master, and he offering to draw back, to give way to him, he kindly said, Pray, Mr. Williams, oblige Pamela with your hand, and step in yourself. He bowed and took my hand, and my master made him step in and sit next me, all that ever he could do, and set himself over against him, next my father, who sat against me. And he said, Mr. Andrews, I told you yesterday that the divine you saw was not Mr. Williams. I now tell you this gentleman is. And though I have been telling him I think not myself obliged to his intentions, yet I will own that Pamela and you are. And though I won't promise to love him, I would have you. Sir, said Mr. Williams, you have a way of overcoming that hardly all my reading affords an instance of and it is the more noble, as it is on this side, as I presume, the happy ceremony, which, great as your fortune is, will lay you under an obligation to so much virtue and beauty, when the lady becomes yours, for you will then have a treasure that princes might envy you, said my generous master, God bless him, 
Mr. Williams, it is impossible that you and I should long live at variance, when our sentiments agree so well together on subjects the most material. I was quite confounded, and my master, seeing it, took my hand and said, Look up, my good girl, and collect yourself. Don't injure Mr. Williams and me so much as to think we are capping compliments, as we used to do verses at school. I dare answer for us both that we say not a syllable we don't think. Oh, sir, said I, how unequal am I to all this goodness. Every moment that passes adds to the weight of the obligations you oppress me with. Think not too much of that, said he most generously. Mr. Williams' compliments to you have great advantage of mine, for though equally sincere, I have a great deal to say, and to do, to compensate the sufferings I have made you undergo, and at last must sit down dissatisfied, because those will never be balanced by all I can do for you. He saw my dear father quite unable to support these affecting instances of his goodness, and he let go my hand, and took his, and said, seeing his tears, I wonder not, my dear Pamela's father, that your honest heart springs thus to your eyes, to see all her trials at an end. I will not pretend to say that I had formerly either power or will to act thus, but since I began to resolve on the change you see, I have reaped so much pleasure in it that my own interest will keep me steady, for till within these few days I knew not what it was to be happy. Poor Mr. Williams, with tears of joy in his eyes, said, How happily, sir, have you been touched by the divine grace, before you have been hurried into the commission of sins, that the deepest penitence could hardly have atoned for. God has enabled you to stop short of the evil, and you have nothing to do but to rejoice in the good, which now will be doubly so, because you can receive it without the least inward reproach. You do well, said he, to remind me, that I owe all this to the grace of God. I bless him for it, and I thank this good man for his excellent lessons to his daughter. I thank her for following them, and I hope from her good example, and your friendship, Mr. Williams, in time to be half as good as my tutoress. And that, said he, I believe you'll own, will make me, without disparagement to any man, the best fox-hunter in England. Mr. Williams was going to speak, and he said, You put on so grave a look, Mr. Williams, that I believe what I have said with you practical good folks is liable to exception. But I see we are become quite grave, and we must not be too serious neither. What a happy creature, my dear mother, is your Pamela! Oh, may my thankful heart and the good use I may be enabled to make of the blessings before me be a means to continue this delightful prospect to a long date for the sake of the dear good gentleman who thus becomes the happy instrument in the hand of providence to bless all he smiles upon. To be sure, I shall never enough acknowledge the value he is pleased to express for my unworthiness in that he has prevented my wishes, and unasked sought the occasion of being reconciled to a good man, who for my sake had incurred his displeasure, and whose name he could not, a few days before, permit to pass through my lips. But see the wonderful ways of providence, the very things that I most dreaded his seeing or knowing, the contents of my papers, have, as I hope, satisfied all his scruples, and been a means to promote my happiness. Henceforth let not us poor short-sighted mortals pretend to rely on our own wisdom, or vainly think that we are absolutely to direct for ourselves. I have abundant reason, I am sure, to say that, when I was most disappointed, I was nearer my happiness. For had I made my escape, which was so often my chief point in view, and what I had placed my heart upon, I had escaped the blessings now before me, and fallen, perhaps headlong, into the miseries I would have avoided. And yet, after all, it was necessary I should take the steps I did to bring on this wonderful turn. Oh, the unsearchable wisdom of God! 
and how much ought i to adore the divine goodness and humble myself who am made a poor instrument as i hope not only to magnify his graciousness to this fine gentleman and myself but also to dispense benefits to others which god of his mercy grant in the agreeable manner i have mentioned did we pass the time in our second happy tour and i thought mrs jukes would have sunk into the ground when she saw mr williams brought in the coach with us and treated so kindly we dined together in a most pleasant easy and frank manner and i found i need not from my master's generosity to be under any restraint as to my conduct to this good clergyman for he so often as he fancied i was reserved moved me to be free with him and to him and several times called upon me to help my father and mr williams and seemed to take great delight in seeing me carve as indeed he does in everything i do after dinner we went and looked into the chapel which is a very pretty one and very decent and when finished as he designs it against his next coming down will be a very pretty place my heart my dear mother when i first set my foot in it throbbed a good deal with awful joy at the thoughts of the solemnity which i hope will in a few days be performed here and when i came up towards the little pretty altar-piece while they were looking at a communion picture and saying it was prettily done i gently stepped into a corner out of sight and poured out my soul to god on my knees in supplication and thankfulness that after having been so long absent from divine service the first time i entered into a house dedicated to his honour should be with such blessed prospects before me and begging of god to continue me humble and to make me not unworthy of his mercies and that he would be pleased to bless the next author of my happiness my good master i heard my master say where's pamela and so i broke off sooner than i would and went up to him he said mr williams i hope i have not so offended you by my conduct past for really it is what i ought to be ashamed of as that you will refuse to officiate and to give us your instructions here to-morrow mr peters was so kind for the first time to offer it but i knew it would be inconvenient for him and besides i was willing to make this request to you an introduction to our reconciliation sir said he most willingly and most gratefully will i obey you though if you expect a discourse i am wholly unprepared for the occasion i would not have it replied he pointed to any particular occasion but if you have one upon the text there is more joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth than over ninety-nine just persons that need no repentance and if it makes me not such a sad fellow as to be pointed at by mine and the ladies servants we shall have here i shall be well content tis a general subject added he makes me speak of that but any one you please will do for you cannot make a bad choice i am sure sir said he i have one upon that text but i am ready to think that a thanksgiving one which i made on a great mercy to myself if i may be permitted to make my own acknowledgments of your favour the subject of a discourse will be suitable to my grateful sentiments it is on the text now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace for mine eyes have seen thy salvation that text said i will be a very suitable one for me not so pamela said my master because i don't let you depart in peace but i hope you will stay here with content oh but sir said i i have seen god's salvation i am sure added i if anybody ever had reason i have to say with the blessed virgin my soul doth magnify the lord for he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden and exalted one of low degree said my good father i am sure if there were time for it the book of ruth would afford a fine subject for the honour done my dear child why good mr andrews said my master should you say so i know that story and mr williams will confirm what i say 
that my good girl here will confer at least as much honour as she will receive sir said i you are inexpressibly generous but i shall never think so why my pamela said he that's another thing it will be best for me to think you will and it will be kind in you to think you shan't and then we shall always have an excellent rule to regulate our conduct by to one another was not this finely nobly wisely said my dear mother oh what a blessed thing it is to be matched to a man of sense and generosity how edifying how but what shall i say i am at a loss for words mr williams said when we came out of the little chapel he would go home and look over his discourses for one for the next day my master said i have one thing to say before you go when my jealousy on account of this good girl put me upon such a vindictive conduct to you you know i took a bond for the money i had caused you to be troubled for i really am ashamed of the matter because i never intended when i presented it to you to have it again you may be sure but i knew not what might happen between you and her nor how far matters might have gone between you and so i was willing to have that in awe over you and i think it is no extraordinary present therefore to give you up your bond again cancelled and so he took it from his pocket and gave it him i think added he all the charges attending it and the trouble you had were defrayed by my attorney i ordered that they should they were sir said he and ten thousand thanks to you for this goodness and the kind manner in which you do it if you will go mr williams said he shall my chariot carry you home no sir answered he i thank you my time will be so well employed all the way in thinking of your favours that i choose to meditate upon them as i walk home my dear father was a little uneasy about his habit for appearing at chapel next day because of mrs darnford and the servants for fear poor man he should disgrace my master and he told me when he was mentioning this of my master's kind present of twenty guineas for clothes for you both which made my heart truly joyful but oh to be sure i can never deserve the hundredth part of his goodness it is almost a hard thing to be under the weight of such deep obligations on one side and such a sense of one's own unworthiness on the other oh what a godlike power is that of doing good i envy the rich and the great for nothing else my master coming to us just then i said oh sir will your bounty know no limits my dear father has told me what you have given him a trifle pamela said he a little earnest only of my kindness say no more of it but did i not hear the good man expressing some sort of concern for somewhat hide nothing from me pamela only sir said i he knew not how to absent himself from divine service and yet is afraid of disgracing you by appearing fie mr andrews said he i thought you knew that the outward appearance was nothing i wish i had as good a habit inwardly as you have but i'll tell you pamela your father is not so much thinner than i am nor much shorter he and i will walk up together to my wardrobe though it is not so well stored here as in bedfordshire and so said he pleasantly don't you pretend to come near us till i call for you for you must not yet see how men dress and undress themselves oh sir said my father i beg to be excused i am sorry you were told so am not i said my master pray come along with me he carried him upstairs and showed him several suits and would have had him take his choice my poor father was quite confounded for my master saw not any he thought too good and my father none that he thought bad enough and my good master at last he fixed his eye upon a fine drab which he thought looked the plainest would help him to try the coat and waistcoat on himself and indeed one would not have thought it because my master is taller and rather plumper as i thought but as i saw afterwards they fitted him very well and being plain and lined with the same colour and made for travelling in a coach pleased my poor father much he gave him the whole suit and calling up mrs jukes said 
let these clothes be well aired against to-morrow morning mr andrews brought only with him his common apparel not thinking to stay sunday with us and pray see for some of my stockings and whether any of my shoes will fit him and see also for some of my linen for we have put the good man quite out of his course by keeping him sunday over he was then pleased to give him the silver buckles out of his own shoes so my good mother you must expect to see my dear father a great beau wig said my master he wants none for his own venerable white locks are better than all the perukes in england but i am sure i have hats enough somewhere i'll take care of everything sir said mrs jukes and my poor father when he came to me could not refrain tears i know not how said he to comport myself under these great favours oh my child it is all owing to the divine goodness and your virtue end of section twenty two Section twenty three of Pamela or Virtue Rewarded. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pamela or Virtue Rewarded by Samuel Richardson. Section twenty three. Sunday. This blessed day, all the family seem to take delight to equip themselves for the celebration of the Sabbath in the little chapel and lady jones and mr williams came in her chariot and the two misses darnford in their own and we breakfasted together in a most agreeable manner my dear father appeared quite spruce and neat and was quite caressed by the three ladies as we were at breakfast my master told mr williams we must let the psalms alone he doubted for want of a clerk but mr williams said no nothing should be wanting that he could supply my father said if it might be permitted him he would as well as he was able perform that office for it was always what he had taken delight in and as i knew he had learnt psalmody formally in his youth and had constantly practised it in private at home on sunday evenings as well as endeavoured to teach it in the little school he so unsuccessfully set up at the beginning of his misfortunes before he took to hard labour I was in no pain for his undertaking it in this little congregation. They seemed much pleased with this, and so we went to chapel, and made a pretty tolerable appearance. Mrs. Jukes and all the servants attending but the cook, and I never saw divine service performed with more solemnity, nor assisted at with greater devotion and decency, my master, Lady Jones, and the two misses setting a lovely example. My good father performed his part with great applause making the responses as if he had been a practised parish clerk, and giving the twenty-third psalm. The Lord is only my support, and he that doth me feed. How can I then lack anything, whereof I stand in need? In pastures green he feedeth me, where I do safely lie, and after leads me to the streams, which run most pleasantly. And when I find myself near lost, then home he doth me take, Conducting me in his right paths, I'n for his own name's sake. And though I were I'n at death's door, Yet would I fear no ill, For both thy rod and shepherd's crook Afford me comfort still. Thou hast my table richly spread In presence of my foe, Thou hast my head with balm refreshed, My cup doth overflow. And finally, while breath doth last, Thy grace shall me defend, And in the house of God will I My life for ever spend. Which consisted of but three staves, We had it all, and he read the line, And began the tune with a heart So entirely affected with the duty, That he went through it distinctly, Calmly and fervently at the same time, So that Lady Jones whispered me, that good man were fit for all companies, and present to every laudable occasion. And Miss Darnford said, God bless the dear good man. You must think how I rejoiced in my mind. I know, my dear mother, you can say most of the shortest psalms by heart, 
so I need not transcribe it, especially as your chief treasure is a Bible, and a worthy treasure it is. I know nobody makes more or better use of it. Mr. Williams gave us an excellent discourse on liberality and generosity, and the blessings attending the right use of riches from the eleventh chapter of Proverbs, verses twenty-four and twenty-five. There is that scattereth, and yet increaseth, and there is that withholdeth more than is meet, but it tendeth to poverty. The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. And he treated the subject in so handsome a manner, that my master's delicacy, who at first was afraid of some personal compliments, was not offended, Mr. Williams judiciously keeping to generals, and it was an elegant and sensible discourse, as my master said. My father was in the clerk's place, just under the desk, and Lady Jones, by her footman, whispered him to favour us with another psalm, when the sermon was ended. He, thinking, as he said afterwards, that the former was rather of the longest, chose the shortest in the book, which you know is the one hundred seventeenth. O all ye nations of the world, praise ye the Lord always, and all ye people everywhere set forth his noble praise, for great his kindness is to us, his truth doth not decay. Wherefore praise ye the Lord our God, praise ye the Lord alway. My master thanked Mr. Williams for his excellent discourse, and so did the ladies, as also did I most heartily and he was pleased to take my dear father by the hand, as did also Mr. Williams, and thanked him. The ladies likewise made him their compliments, and the servants all looked upon him with countenances of respect and pleasure. At dinner, do what I could, I was forced to take the upper end of the table, and my master sat at the lower end, between Mr. Williams and my father. And he said, Pamela, you are so dexterous, that I think you may help the ladies yourself, and I will help my two good friends. I should have told you, though, that I dressed myself in a flowered satin that was my lady's, and looked quite fresh and good, and which was given me at first by my master, and the ladies who had not seen me out of my homespun before, made me abundance of fine compliments as soon as they saw me first. Talking of the psalms just after dinner, my master was very naughty, if I may say so, for he said to my father, Mr. Andrews, I think in the afternoon, as we shall have only prayers, we may have one longer psalm, and what think you of the 137th? Oh, good sir, said I, pray, pray, not a word more. Say what you will, Pamela, said he. You shall sing it to us, according to your own version, before these good ladies go away. My father smiled, but was half concerned for me, and said, Will it bear and please your honour? Oh, I, said he, never fear it, so long as Mrs. Jukes is not in the hearing. This excited all the ladies' curiosity, and Lady Joan said, She would be loath to desire to hear anything that would give me concern but should be glad I would give leave for it. Indeed, madam, said I, I must beg you won't insist upon it. I cannot bear it. You shall see it indeed, ladies, said my master, and pray, Pamela, not always as you please, neither. Then pray, sir, said I, not in my hearing, I hope. Sure, Pamela, returned he, you would not write what is not fit to be heard. But, sir, said I, there are particular cases, times, and occasions that may make a thing passable at one time that would not be tolerable at another. Oh, said he, let me judge of that as well as you, Pamela. These ladies know a good part of your story, and let me tell you what they know is more to your credit than mine, so that if I have no averseness to reviving the occasion, you may very well bear it said he, I will put you out of your pain, Pamela, here it is, and took it out of his pocket. I stood up and said, Indeed, sir, I can't bear it. I hope you'll allow me to leave the room a minute, 
if you will read it. Indeed, but I won't, answered he. Lady Joan said, Pray, good sir, don't let us hear it, if Mrs. Andrews be so unwilling. Well, Pamela, said my master, I will put it to your choice whether I shall read it now, or you will sing it by and by. That's very hard, sir, said I. It must be one, I assure you, said he. Why then, sir, replied I, you must do as you please, for I cannot sing it. Well, then, said my master, I find I must read it, and yet, added he, after all, I had as well let it alone, for it is no great reputation to myself. Oh, then, said Miss Darnford, pray let us hear it, to choose. Why, then, proceeded he, the case was this. Pamela, I find, when she was in the time of her confinement, that is, added he, when she was taken prisoner in order to make me one, for that is the upshot of the matter, in the journal she kept, which was intended for nobody's perusal but her parents, tells them that she was importuned one Sunday by Mrs. Jukes to sing a psalm, but her spirits not permitting, she declined it. But after Mrs. Jukes was gone down, she says, she recollected that the 137th psalm was applicable to her own case, Mrs. Jukes having often on other days in vain besought her to sing a song that thereupon she turned it more to her own supposed case, and believing Mrs. Jukes had a design against her honour, and looking upon her as her jailer, she thus gives her version of this psalm. But pray, Mr. Williams, do you read one verse of the common translation, and I will read one of Pamela's. Then Mr. Williams, pulling out his little pocket common prayer book, read the first two stanzas when we did sit in babylon the rivers round about then in remembrance of sion the tears for grief burst out we hanged our harps and instruments the willow trees upon for in that place men for that use had planted many a one my master then read when sad i sat in b in hall all guarded round about and thought of every absent friend, the tears for grief burst out. My joys and hopes all overthrown, my heart-strings almost broke, unfit my mind for melody, much more to bear a joke. The lady said, it was very pretty, and Miss Darnford, that somebody else had more need to be concerned than the versifier. I knew, said my master, I should get no credit by showing this, but let us read on, Mr. Williams. So Mr. Williams read. Then they, to whom we prisoners were, said to us tauntingly, Now let us hear your Hebrew songs and pleasant melody. Now this, said my master, is very near, and read. Then she, to whom I prisoner was, said to me tauntingly, Now cheer your heart, and sing a song, and tune your mind to joy. Mighty sweet, said Mr. Williams, but let us see how the next verse is turned. It is this. Alas, said we, who can once frame his heavy heart to sing the praises of our living God, thus under a strange king? Why, said my master, it is turned with beautiful simplicity. Thus. Alas, said I, how can I frame my heavy heart to sing? or tune my mind while thus enthralled by such a wicked thing? Very pretty, said Mr. Williams. Lady Joan said, Oh, dear madam, could you wish that we should be deprived of this new instance of your genius and accomplishments? Oh, said my dear father, you will make my good child proud. No, said my master very generously, Pamela can't be proud for no one is proud to hear themselves praised but those who are not used to it. But proceed, Mr. Williams. He read, But yet, if I, Jerusalem, out of my heart let slide, then let my fingers quite forget the warbling harp to guide. Well now, said my master, for Pamela's version, but yet, if from my innocence I even and thought should slide, then let my fingers quite forget the sweet spinet to guide. 
Mr. Williams read, And let my tongue within my mouth Be tied for ever fast, If I rejoice before I see Thy full deliverance past. This also, said my master, is very near. And let my tongue within my mouth Be locked for ever fast, If I rejoice before I see My full deliverance past. Now, good sir, said I, oblige me, don't read any further, pray don't. Oh, pray, madam, said Mr. Williams, let me beg to have the rest read, for I long to know whom you make the sons of Edom, and how you turn the psalmist's execrations against the insulting Babylonians. Well, Mr. Williams, replied I, you should not have said so. Oh, said my master, that is one of the best things of all. Poor Mrs. Jukes stands for Edom's sons, and we must not lose this, because I think it one of my Pamela's excellencies that, though thus oppressed, she prays for no harm upon the oppressor. Read, Mr. Williams, the next stanza. So he read, Therefore, O Lord, remember now the cursed noise and cry that Edom's sons against us made, when they raised our city. Remember, Lord, their cruel words, when with a mighty sound they cried, Down, yea, down with it, unto the very ground. Well, said my master, here seems, in what I am going to read, a little bit of a curse indeed, but I think it makes no ill figure in the comparison. And thou, Almighty, recompense the evils I endure, from those who seek my sad disgrace so costless to procure. And now, said he, for Edom's sons, though a little severe in the imputation, Remember, Lord, this Mrs. Jukes, when with a mighty sound she cries down with her chastity, down to the very ground. Sure, sir, said I, this might have been spared. But the ladies and Mr. Williams said, No, by no means. And I see the poor wicked woman has no favorers among them. Now, said my master, read the psalmist's heavy curses. And Mr. Williams read, Even so shalt thou, O Babylon, at length to dust be brought, And happy shall that man be called, that our revenge hath wrought. Yea, blessed shall the man be called, that takes thy little ones, And dashes them in pieces small against the very stones. Thus, he said, very kindly, has my Pamela turned these lines. Even so shalt thou, O wicked one, at length to shame be brought, And happy shall all those be called that my deliverance wrought. Yea, blessed shall the man be called that shames thee of thy evil, And saves me from thy vile attempts, and thee, too, from the devil. I fancy this blessed man, said my master, smiling, was at that time hoped to be you, Mr. Williams, if the truth was known. Sir, said he, whoever it was intended for then, it can be nobody but your good self now. I could hardly hold up my head for the praises the kind ladies were pleased to heap upon me. I am sure by this they are very partial in my favor. All because my master is so good to me, and loves to hear me praised. For I see no such excellence in these lines as they would make me believe, besides what is borrowed from the psalmist. We all, as before, and the cook-maid too, attended the prayers of the church in the afternoon, and my dear father concluded with the following stanzas of the 165th psalm, suitably magnifying the holy name of God for all mercies, but did not observe altogether the method in which they stand which was the less necessary, he thought, as he gave out the lines. The Lord is just in all his ways, his works are holy all, and he is near all those that do, in truth, upon him call. He the desires of all them that fear him will fulfill, and he will hear them when they cry, and save them all he will. The eyes of all do wait on thee, thou dost them all relieve, and thou to each sufficient food in season do dost give. Thou openest thy plenteous hand, and bounteously dost fill 
all things whatever that do live with gifts of thy good will my thankful mouth shall gladly speak the praises of the lord all flesh to praise his holy name for ever shall accord we walked in the garden till tea was ready and as he went by the back door my master said to me of all the flowers in the garden the sunflower is the fairest oh sir said i let that be now forgot mr williams heard him say so and seemed a little out of countenance whereupon my master said i mean not to make you serious mr williams but we see how strangely things are brought about i see other scenes hereabouts that in my pamela's dangers give me more cause of concern than anything you ever did should give you sir said he you are very generous my master and mr williams afterwards walked together for a quarter of an hour and talked about general things and some scholastic subjects and joined us very well pleased with one another's conversation lady joan said putting herself on one side of me as my master was on the other but pray sir when is the happy time to be we want it over that we may have you with us as long afterwards as you can said my master i would have it to-morrow or next day at farthest if pamela will for i have sent for a license and the messenger will be here to-night or early in the morning i hope but added he pray pamela do not take beyond thursday she was pleased to say sure it will not be delayed by you madam more than needs well said he now you are on my side i will leave you with her to settle it and i hope she will not let little bashful niceties be important with her and so he joined the two misses lady jones told me i was to blame she would take upon her to say if i delayed it a moment because she understood lady davers was very uneasy at the prospect that it would be so and if anything should happen it would be a sad thing madam said i when he was pleased to mention it to me first he said it should be in fourteen days and afterwards asked me if i would have it in the first or the second seven i answered for how could i do otherwise in the second he desired it might not be the last day of the second seven now madam said i as he was then pleased to speak his mind no doubt i would not for anything seem too forward well but said she as he now urges you in so genteel and gentlemanly a manner for a shorter day i think if i was in your place i would agree to it she saw me hesitate and blush and said well you know best but i say only what i would do i said i would consider of it and if i saw he was very earnest to be sure i should think i ought to oblige him mrs darnford were begging to be at the wedding and to have a ball and they said pray mrs andrews second our requests and we shall be greatly obliged to you indeed ladies said i i cannot promise that if i might why so said they because answered i i know not what but i think one may with pleasure celebrate an anniversary of one's nuptials but the day itself indeed ladies i think it is too solemn a business for the parties of our sex to be very gay upon it is a quite serious and awful affair and i am sure in your own cases you would be of my mind why then said miss darnford the more need one has to be as light-hearted and merry as one can i told you said my master what sort of an answer you'd have from pamela the younger miss said she never heard of such grave folks in her life on such an occasion why sir said she i hope you'll sing psalms all day and miss will fast and pray such sackcloth and ashes doings for a wedding did i never hear of she spoke a little spitefully i thought 
and I returned no answer. I shall have enough to do, I reckon, in a while, if I am to answer every one that will envy me. We went in to tea, and all that the ladies could prevail upon my master for was a dancing match before he left this county. But Miss Darnford said it should then be at their house, for truly, if she might not be at the wedding, she would be affronted, and come no more hither till we had been there. When they were gone, my master would have had my father stay till the affair was over, but he begged he might set out as soon as it was light in the morning, for, he said, my mother would be doubly uneasy at his stay, and he burned with impatience to let her know all the happy things that had befallen her daughter. When my master found him so desirous to go, he called Mr. Thomas, and ordered him to get a particular bay-horse ready betimes in the morning for my father and a portmanteau to put his things in, and to attend him a day's journey, and if, said he, Mr. Andrews chooses it, see him safe to his own home, and, added he, since that horse will serve you, Mr. Andrews, to ride backwards and forwards to see us, when we go into Bedfordshire, I make you a present of it, with the accountments. And, seeing my father going to speak, he added, I won't be said nay. Oh, how good was this! He also said a great many kind things at supper-time, and gave him all the papers he had of mine, but desired, when he and my mother had read them, that he would return them to him again. And then he said, So affectionate a father and daughter may, perhaps be glad to be alone together. Therefore remember me to your good wife, and tell her, it will not be long, I hope, before I see you together, on a visit to your daughter, at my other house. And so I wish you good night, and a good journey, if you go before I see you. And then he shook hands, and left my dear father almost unable to speak, through the sense of his favours and goodness. You may believe, my dear mother, how loath I was to part with my good father, and he was also unwilling to part with me but he was so impatient to see you and tell you the blessed tidings with which his heart overflowed that I could hardly wish to detain him. Mrs. Jukes brought two bottles of cherry brandy and two of cinnamon water and some cake, and they were put up in the portman too, with my father's newly presented clothes, for he said he would not for anything be seen in them in his neighbourhood till I was actually known by everybody to be married nor would he lay out any part of the twenty guineas till then neither, for fear of reflections, and then he would consult me as to what he would buy. Well, said I, as you please, my dear father, and I hope now we shall often have the pleasure of hearing from one another without needing any art or contrivances. He said he would go to bed betimes, that he might be up as soon as it was light, and so he took leave of me and said, he would not love me if I got up in the morning to see him go, which would but make us both loath to part, and grieve us both all day. Mr. Thomas brought him a pair of boots, and told him he would call him up at the peep of day, and put up everything overnight, and so I received his blessing and his prayers, and his kind promises of procuring the same from you, my dear mother, and went up to my closet with a heavy heart, and yet a half-pleased one, if I may so say, for that, as he must go, he was going to the best of wives, and with the best of tidings. But I begged he would not work so hard as he had done, for I was sure my master would not have given him twenty guineas for clothes, if he had not designed to do something else for him, and that he should be the less concerned at receiving benefits from my good master, because he, who had so many persons to employ in his large possessions, could make him serviceable, to a degree equivalent, without hurting anybody else. He promised me fair, and, pray, dear mother, see he performs. I hope my master will not see this, for I will not send it you, at present, till I can send you the best of news, and the rather, as my dear father can supply the greatest part of what I have written, since the papers he carries you by his own observation. So good night, my dear mother, and God send my father a safe journey and a happy meeting to you both. Monday. 
Mr. Colbrand being returned, my master came up to me to my closet, and brought me the license. Oh, how my heart fluttered at the sight of it! Now, Pamela, said he, tell me, if you can oblige me with the day. Your word is all that's wanting. I made bold to kiss his dear hand, and, though unable to look up, said, I know not what to say, sir, to all your goodness. I would not, for any consideration, that you should believe me capable of receiving negligently an honour, that all the duty of a long life, were it to be lent me, will not be sufficient to enable me to be grateful for. I ought to resign myself in everything I may or can, implicitly to your will. But, but what? said he, with a kind impatience. Why, sir, said I, when from last Thursday you mentioned four days, I had reason to think that term your choice, and my heart is so wholly yours, that I am afraid of nothing, but that I may be forwarder than you wish. Impossible, my dear creature, said he, and folded me in his arms. Impossible! If this be all, it shall be set about this moment, and this happy day shall make you mine. I'll send away instantly, said the dear gentleman, and was going. I said, No, pray, sir, pray, sir, hear me. Indeed, it cannot be to-day. Cannot? said he. No, indeed, sir, said I, and was ready to sink to see his generous impatience. Why flattered you, then, my fond heart, replied he, with the hope that it might? Sir, said I, I will tell you what I had thought, if you'll vouchsafe me your attention. Do, then, said he. I have, sir, proceeded I, a great desire that, whenever the day is, it may be on a Thursday. On a Thursday my dear father and mother were married, and though poor, they are a very happy pair. On a Thursday your poor Pamela was born. On a Thursday my dear good lady took me from my parents into her protection. On a Thursday, sir, you caused me to be carried away to this place, to which I now by God's goodness and your favour, owe so amazingly all my present prospects. And on a Thursday it was, you named to me, that fourteen days from that you would confirm my happiness. Now, sir, if you please to indulge my superstitious folly, you will greatly oblige me. I was sorry, sir, for this reason, when you bid me not defer till the last day of the fourteen, that Thursday in next week was that last day. This, Pamela, is a little superstitious, I must needs say, and I think you should begin now to make another day in the week a happy one, as, for example, on a Monday, may you say, my father and mother concluded to be married on the Thursday following. On a Monday, so many years ago, my mother was preparing all her matters to be brought to bed on the Thursday following. On a Monday, several weeks ago, it was that you had but two days more to stay, till you was carried away on Thursday. On a Monday, I myself, said he, well remember, it was that I wrote you the letter that prevailed on you so kindly to return to me, and on the same day you did return to my house here which I hope, my girl, will be as propitious an error as any you have named. And now, lastly, will you say which will crown the work? And on a Monday I was married. Come, come, my dear, added he, Thursday has reigned long enough a conscience. Let us now set Monday in its place, or at least on an equality with it, since you see it has a very good title and as we now stand in the week before us, claims priority. And then, I hope, we shall make Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday as happy days as Monday and Thursday, and so, by God's blessing, move round as the days move, in a delightful circle, till we are at a loss what day to prefer to the rest. Oh, how charmingly was this said, and how sweetly kind! Indeed, sir, said I, 
you rally my folly very agreeably but don't let a little matter stand in the way when you are so generously obliging and a greater indeed i like thursday best if i may choose well then said he if you can say you have a better reason than this i will oblige you else i'll send away for the parson this moment and so i protest he was going dear sirs how i trembled stay stay sir said i we have a great deal to say first i have a deal of silly prat to trouble you with well say then in a minute replied he the most material for all we have to say may be talked of while the parson is coming oh but indeed and indeed said i it cannot be to-day well then shall it be to-morrow said he why sir if it must not be on a thursday you have given so many pleasant distinctions for a monday that let it then be next monday what a week still said he sir answered i if you please for that will be as you enjoined within the second seven days why girl said he twill be seven months till next monday let it said he if not to-morrow be on wednesday i protest i will stay no longer then sir returned i please to defer it however for one day more and it will be my beloved thursday if i consent to defer it till then may i hope my pamela said he that next thursday shall certainly be the happy day yes sir said i and i am sure i looked very foolishly and yet my dear father and mother why should i with such a fine gentleman and whom i so dearly love and so much to my honour too but there is something greatly awful upon my mind in the solemn circumstance and a change of condition never to be recalled though all the prospects are so desirable and i can but wonder at the thoughtless precipitancy with which most young folks run into this important change of life so now my dear parents have i been brought to fix so near a day as next thursday and this is monday oh dear it makes one out of breath almost to think of it this though was a great cut-off a whole week out of ten days i hope i am not too forward i am sure if it obliges my dear master i am justified for he deserves of me all things in my poor power after this he rode out on horseback attended by abraham and did not return till night how by degrees things steal upon one i thought even this small absence tedious and the more as we expected him home to dinner i wish i may not be too fond and make him indifferent but yet my dear father and mother you were always fond of one another and never indifferent let the world run as it would when he returned he said he had had a pleasant ride and was led out to a greater distance than he intended at supper he told me that he had a great mind mr williams should marry us because he said it would show a thorough reconciliation on his part but said he most generously i am apprehensive from what passed between you that the poor man will take it hardly and as a sort of insult which i am not capable of what says my girl do you think he would i hope not sir said i as to what he may think i can't answer but as to any reason for his thoughts i can for indeed sir said i you have been already so generous that he cannot i think mistake your goodness he then spoke with some resentment of lady davers behaviour and i asked if anything new had occurred yes said he i have had a letter delivered me from her impertinent husband professedly at her instigation that amounted to little less than a piece of insolent bravery on supposing i was about to marry you i was so provoked added he that after i had read it i tore it in a hundred pieces and scattered them in the air and bid the man who brought it let his master know 
what I had done with his letter, and so would not permit him to speak to me, as he would fain have done. I think the fellow talked somewhat of his lady coming hither, but she shall not set her foot within my doors, and I suppose this treatment will hinder her. I was much concerned at this, and he said, Had I a hundred sisters, Pamela, their opposition should have no weight with me, and I did not intend you should know it, but you can't but expect a little difficulty from the pride of my sister, who hath suffered so much from that of her brother, and we are too nearly allied in mind, as well as blood, I find. But this is not her business, and if she would have made it so, she should have done it with more decency. Little occasion had she to boast of her birth, that knows not what belongs to good manners. I said, I am very sorry, sir, to be the unhappy occasion of a misunderstanding between so good a brother and so worthy a sister. Don't say so, Pamela, because this is an unavoidable consequence of the happy prospect before us. Only bear it well yourself, because she is my sister, and leave it to me to make her sensible of her own rashness. If, sir, said I, the most lowly behaviour and humble deportment, and in everything showing a dutiful regard to good Lady Davers, will have any weight with her ladyship, assure yourself of all in my power to mollify her. No, Pamela, returned he, don't imagine, when you are my wife, I will suffer you to do anything unworthy of that character. I know the duty of a husband, and will protect your gentleness to the utmost, as much as if you were a princess by descent. You are inexpressibly good, sir, said I, but I am far from taking a gentle disposition to show a meanness of spirit, and this is a trial I ought to expect, and well I may bear it, that have so many benefits to set against it which all spring from the same cause. Well, said he, all the matter shall be this. We will talk of our marriage as a thing to be done next week. I find I have spies upon me wherever I go, and whatever I do. But now I am on so laudable a pursuit, that I value them not, nor those who employ them. I have already ordered my servants to have no conference with anybody for ten or twelve days to come. And Mrs. Jukes tells me every one names Thursday come same night for our nuptials. So I will get Mr. Peters, who wants to see my little chapel, to assist Mr. Williams under the notion of breakfasting with me next Thursday morning, since you won't have it sooner, and there will nobody else be wanting. And I will beg of Mr. Peters to keep it private, even from his own family, for a few days. Has my girl any objection? "'Oh, sir,' answered I, "'you are so generous in all your ways. "'I can have no objections. "'But I hope Lady Davers and you will not proceed to irreconcilable links. "'And when her ladyship comes to see you, and to tarry with you, two or three weeks, as she used to do, "'I will keep close up, so as not to disgust her with the sight of me.' "'Well, Pamela,' said he, "'we will talk of that afterwards.' You must do, then, as I shall think fit, and I should be able to judge what both you and I ought to do. But what still aggravates the matter is that she should instigate the titled ape her husband to write to me, after she had so little succeeded herself. I wish I had kept his letter, that I might have shown you how a man that generally acts like a fool can take upon him to write like a lord. But I suppose it is of my sister's pinning and he, poor man, is the humble copier. End of section 23。section 24 of Pamela or Virtue Rewarded This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pamela or Virtue Rewarded by Samuel Richardson. Section 24. Tuesday. Mr. Thomas is returned from you, my dear father, with the good news of your health, and your proceeding in your journey to my dear mother, where I hope to hear soon you are arrived. My master has just now been making me play upon the spinet, 
and sing to it, and was pleased to commend me for both. But he does so for everything I do. So partial does his goodness make him to me. One o'clock. We are just returned from an airing in the chariot, and I have been delighted with his conversation upon English authors, poets particularly. He entertained me also with a description of some of the curiosities he had seen in Italy and France, when he made what the polite world call the grand tour. He said he wanted to be at his other seat, for he knew not well how to employ himself here, having not proposed to stay half the time. And when I get there, Pamela, said he, you will hardly be troubled with so much of my company, after we have settled, for I have a great many things to adjust, and I must go to London, for I have accounts that have run on longer than ordinary with my banker there. And I don't know, added he, but the ensuing winter I may give you a little taste of the diversions of the town for a month or so. I said, his will and pleasure should determine mine, and I never would, as near as I could, have a desire after those or any other entertainments that were not in his own choice. He was pleased to say, I make no doubt, but that I shall be very happy in you, and hope you will be so in me. For, said he, I have no very enormous vices to gratify, though I pretend not to the greatest purity, neither, my girl. Sir, said I, if you can account to your own mind, I shall always be easy in whatever you do. But our greatest happiness here, sir, continued I, is of very short duration, and this life, at the longest, is a poor transitory one, and I hope we shall be so happy as to be enabled to look forward, with comfort, to another, where our pleasures will be everlasting. You say well, Pamela, and I shall, by degrees, be more habituated to this way of thinking, as I more and more converse with you. But, at present, you must not be over-serious with me all at once, though I charge you never forbear to mingle your sweet divinity in our conversation, whenever it can be brought in a propose, and with such a cheerfulness of temper, as shall not throw a gloomy cloud over our innocent enjoyments. I was abashed at this, and silent, fearing I had offended. But he said, If you attend rightly to what I said, I need not tell you again, Pamela, not to be discouraged from suggesting to me, on every proper occasion, the pious impulses of your own amiable mind. Sir, said I, you will be always indulgent, I make no doubt, to my imperfections, so long as I mean well. My master made me dine with him, and would eat nothing but what I helped him to and my heart is, every hour, more and more enlarged with his goodness and condescension. But still, what ails me, I wonder. A strange sort of weight hangs upon my mind, as Thursday draws on, which makes me often sigh involuntarily, and damps, at times, the pleasures of my delightful prospects. I hope this is not ominous, but only the foolish weakness of an over-thoughtful mind, on an occasion the most solemn and important of one's life, next to the last scene, which shuts up all. I could be very serious, but I will commit all my ways to that blessed providence, which hitherto has so wonderfully conducted me through real evils to this hopeful situation. I only fear, and surely I have great reason, that I shall be too unworthy to hold the affections of so dear a gentleman. God teach me humility, and to know my own demerit and this will be, next to his grace, my surest guard, in the state of life to which, though most unworthy, I am going to be exalted. And don't cease your prayers for me, my dear parents, for perhaps this new condition may be subject to still worse hazards than those I have escaped, as would be the case were conceitedness, vanity, and pride to take hold of my frail heart. And if I was, for my sins, to be left to my own conduct, a frail bark in a tempestuous ocean, without ballast, or other pilot than my own inconsiderate will. But my master said, on another occasion, that those who doubted most, always erred least, and I hope I shall always doubt my own strength, my own worthiness. I will not trouble you with twenty sweet agreeable things that passed in conversation with my excellent benefactor, nor with the civilities of M. Colbrand, 
Mrs. Jukes, and all the servants, who seemed to be highly pleased with me, and with my conduct to them. And as my master, hitherto, finds no fault that I go too low, nor they that I carry it too high, I hope I shall continue to have everybody's good will. But yet will I not seek to gain any one's by little meannesses or debasements, but aim at a uniform and regular conduct, willing to conceal involuntary errors, as I would have my own forgiven, and not too industrious to discover real ones, or to hide such, if any such should appear, as might encourage bad hearts, or unclean hands, in material cases, where my master should receive damage, or where the morals of the transgressors should appear willfully and habitually corrupt. In short, I will endeavour, as much as I can, that good servants shall find in me a kind encourager, indifferent ones be made better, by inspiring them with a laudable emulation, and bad ones, if not too bad in nature, and quite irreclaimable, reformed by kindness, expostulation, and even proper menaces, if necessary, but most by a good example. All this, if God pleases. Wednesday. Now, my dear parents, I have but this one day between me and the most solemn rite that can be performed. My heart cannot yet shake off this heavy weight. Sure I am ungrateful to the divine goodness and the favor of the best of benefactors. Yet I hope I am not, for at times my mind is all exultation, with the prospect of what good to-morrow's happy somnity may possibly, by the leave of my generous master, put it in my power to do. Oh, how shall I find words to express, as I ought, my thankfulness, for all the mercies before me! Wednesday evening. My dear master is all love and tenderness. He sees my weakness, and generously pities and comforts me. I begged to be excused to supper, but he brought me down himself from my closet, and placed me by him, bidding Abraham not wait. I could not eat, and yet I tried, for fear he should be angry. He kindly forbore to hint anything of the dreadful yet delightful to-morrow, and put now and then a little bit on my plate and guided it to my mouth. I was concerned to receive his goodness with so ill a grace. Well, said he, if you won't eat with me, drink at least with me. I drank two glasses by his over-persuasions, and said, I am really ashamed of myself. Why, indeed, said he, my dear girl, I am not a very dreadful enemy, I hope. I cannot bear anything that is the least concerning to you. Oh, sir, said I, all is owing to the sense I have of my own unworthiness. To be sure, it cannot be anything else. He rung for the things to be taken away, and then reached a chair, and sat down by me, and put his kind arms about me, and said the most generous and affecting things that ever dropped from the honey-flowing mouth of love. All I have not time to repeat, some I will. And, oh, indulge your foolish daughter, who troubles you with her weak nonsense, because what she has to say is so affecting to her, and because, if she went to bed, instead of scribbling, she could not sleep. This sweet confusion and thoughtfulness in my beloved Pamela, said the kind man, on the near approach of our happy union, when I hope all doubts are cleared up, and nothing of dishonour is apprehended, show me most abundantly what a wretch I was to attempt such purity with a worse intention. No wonder that one so virtuous should find herself deserted of life itself on a violence so dreadful to her honour, and seek a refuge in the shadow of death. But now, my dearest Pamela, that you have seen a purity on my side, as nearly imitating your own, as our sex can show to yours, and since I have, all the day long, suppressed even the least intimation of the coming days, that I might not alarm your tender mind. Why all this concern? Why all this affecting, yet sweet confusion? You have a generous friend, my dear girl, in me, a protector now, not a violator of your innocence. Why, then, 
once more I ask, this strange perplexity, this sweet confusion. Oh, sir, said I, and hid my face on his arm. Expect not reason from a foolish creature. You should have still indulged me in my closet. I am ready to beat myself for this ungrateful return to your goodness, but I know not what. I am, to be sure, a silly creature. Oh, had you but suffered me to stay by myself above, I should have made myself ashamed of so culpable a behavior. But goodness added to goodness every moment, and the sense of my own unworthiness quite overcome my spirits. Now, said the generous man, will I, though reluctantly, make a proposal to my sweet girl. If I have been too pressing for the day, if another day will still be more obliging, if you have fears you will not then have, you shall say but the word, and I'll submit. Yes, my Pamela, for though I have these three days past, thought every tedious hour a day till Thursday comes, if you earnestly desire it, I will postpone it. Say, my dear girl, freely say, but accept not my proposal without great reason, which yet I will not ask for. Sir, said I, I can expect nothing but superlative goodness. I have been so long used to it from you. This is a most generous instance of it, but I fear, yes, I fear it will be too much the same thing, some days hence, when the happy yet fool that I am, dreaded time shall be equally near. Kind, lovely charmer, said he, now do I see you are to be trusted with power, from the generous use you make of it. Not one offensive word or look from me shall wound your nicest thoughts, but pray try to subdue this over-scrupulousness and unseasonable timidity. I persuade myself you will if you can. Indeed, sir, I will, said I, for I am quite ashamed of myself, with all these lovely views before me. The honors you do me, the kindness you show me. I cannot forgive myself, for, oh, if I know the least of this idle, foolish heart of mine, it has not a misgiving thought of your goodness, and I should abhor it if it were capable of the least affectation. But, dear good sir, leave me a little to myself, and I will take myself to a severer task than your goodness will let you do, and I will present my heart before you, a worthier offering to you, than at present its wayward follies will let it seem to be. But one thing is, one has no kind friend of one's own sex to communicate one's foolish thoughts to, and to be strengthened by their comfortings. But I am left to myself, and, oh, what a weak, silly thing I am! He kindly withdrew, to give me time to recollect myself, and in about half an hour returned, and then, that he might not begin at once upon the subject, and say at the same time something agreeable to me, said, Your father and mother have had a great deal of talk by this time about you, Pamela. Oh, sir, returned I, your goodness has made them quite happy. But I can't help being concerned about Lady Davers. He said, I am vexed I did not hear the footman out, because it runs in my head he talked somewhat about her coming hither. She will meet with but an indifferent reception from me, unless she comes resolved to behave better than she writes. Pray, sir, said I, be pleased to bear with my good lady. For two reasons. What are they? said he. Why, first, sir, answered I, because she is your sister, and, to be sure, may very well think, what all the world will, that you have much undervalued yourself in making me happy, and next, because if her ladyship finds you out of temper with her, it will still aggravate her more against me, and every time that any warm words you may have between you come into her mind, she will disdain me more. Don't concern yourself about it, said he, for we have more proud ladies than she in our other neighborhood, who perhaps have still less reason to be punctilious about their descent, and yet will form themselves upon her example, and say why his own sister will not forgive him, nor visit him. And so, if I can subdue her spirit, which is more than her husband ever could, or indeed anybody else, it is a great point gained, and, if she gives me reason, I'll try for it, I assure you. 
"'Well, but, my dear girl,' continued he, "'since the subject is so important, "'may I not say one word about it to-morrow?' "'Sir,' said I, "'I hope I shall be less a fool. "'I have talked as harshly to my heart "'as Lady Davers can do, "'and the naughty thing suggests to me "'a better and more grateful behaviour. "'He smiled, and, kissing me, said, "'I took notice, Pamela, of what you observed, "'that you have none of your own sex with you. "'I think it is a little hard upon you, "'and I should have liked you should have had Miss Darnford, "'but then her sister must have been asked, "'and I might as well make a public wedding, "'which, you know, would have required clothes and other preparations. "'Besides,' added he, "'a foolish proposal was once made me of that second sister, "'who has two or three thousand pounds more than the other, "'left her by a godmother.' and she can't help being a little piqued, though, said he, it was a proposal they could not expect should succeed, for there is nothing in her person nor mind, and her fortune, as that must have been the only inducement, would not do by any means, and so I discouraged it at once. I am thinking, sir, said I, of another mortifying thing, too, that were you to marry a lady of birth and fortune answerable to your own, all the eve to the day would be taken up in reading, signing, and sealing of settlements, and portion, and such like. But now the poor Pamela brings you nothing at all, and the very clothes she wears, so very low as she, are entirely the effects of your bounty, and that of your good mother. This makes me a little sad, for, alas, sir, I am so much oppressed by your favours, and the sense of the obligations I lie under, that I cannot look up with the confidence that I otherwise should on this awful occasion. There is, my dear Pamela, said he, where the power is wanting as much generosity in the will as in the action. To all that know your story and your merit, it will appear that I cannot recompense you for what I have made you suffer. You have had too many hard struggles and exercises, and have nobly overcome, and who shall grudge you the reward of the hard-bought victory? This affair is so much the act of my own will, that I glory in being capable of distinguishing so much excellence, and my fortune is the more pleasurable to me, as it gives me hope that I may make you some part of satisfaction for what you have undergone. This, sir, said I, is all goodness, unmerited on my side, and makes my obligations the greater. I can only wish for more worthiness." but how poor is it to offer nothing but words for such generous deeds, and to say, I wish, for what is a wish, but the acknowledged want of power to oblige, and a demonstration of one's poverty in everything but will. And that, my dear girl, said he, is everything, tis all I want, tis all that heaven itself requires of us. But no more of these little doubts, though they are the natural impulses of a generous and grateful heart. I want not to be employed in settlements. Those are for such to regard, who make convenience and fortune the prime considerations. I have possessions ample enough for us both, and you deserve to share them with me, and you shall do it, with as little reserve as if you had brought me what the world reckons an equivalent. For, as to my own opinion, you bring me what is infinitely more valuable, an experienced truth, a well-tried virtue, and a wit and behavior more than equal to the station you will be placed in. To say nothing of this sweet person that itself might captivate a monarch, and of the meekness of temper and sweetness of disposition which make you superior to all the women I ever saw. Thus kind and soothing and honorably affectionate was the dear gentleman to the unworthy, doubting, yet assured Pamela, and thus patiently did he indulge and generously pardon my impertinent weakness. He offered to go up himself to Lady Jones in the morning, and reveal the matter to her, and desire her secrecy and presence. But I said, that would disoblige the young lady's Danford. No, sir, said I, I will cast myself upon your generous kindness, for why should I fear the kind protector of my weakness, and the guide and director of my future steps? You cannot, said he, forgive Mrs. Jukes, for she must know it, and suffer her to be with you? Yes, sir, said I, I can. She is very civil to me now, and her former wickedness I will forgive, for the sake of the happy fruits that have attended it, and because you mention her. 
Well, said he, I will call her in, if you please. As you please, sir, said I, and he rung for her. And when she came in, he said, Mrs. Jukes, I am going to entrust you with a secret. Sir, answered she, I will be sure to keep it as such. Why, said he, we intend to-morrow privately as possible, for our wedding day, and Mr. Peters and Mr. Williams are to be here, as to breakfast with me, and to show Mr. Peters my little chapel. As soon as the ceremony is over, we will take a little airing in the chariot, as we have done at other times, and so it will not be wondered that we are dressed, and the two parsons have promised secrecy, and will go home. I believe you can't well avoid letting one of the maids into the secret, but that I'll leave to you. Sir, replied she, we all concluded it would be in a few days, and I doubt it won't be long a secret. No, said he, I don't desire it should, but you know we are not provided for a public wedding, and I shall declare it when we go to Bedfordshire, which won't be long. But the men, who lie in the outhouses, need not know it, for, by some means or other, my sister Davers knows all that passes. Do you know, sir, said she, that her ladyship intends to be down here with you in a few days? Her servant told me so, who brought you the letter you were angry at. I hope, said he, we shall be set out for t'other house first, and shall be pleased she loses her labour. Sir, continued she, her ladyship proposes to be here time enough to hinder your nuptials, which she takes, as we did, will be the latter end of next week. Well, said he, let her come, but yet I desire not to see her. Mrs. Jukes said to me, Give me leave, madam, to wish you all manner of happiness, but I am afraid I have too well obeyed his honour to be forgiven by you. Indeed, Mrs. Jukes, returned I, you will be more your own enemy than I will be. I will look all forward, and shall not presume, so much as by a whisper, to set my good master against any one he pleases to approve of. And as to his old servants, I shall always value them, and never offer to dictate to his choice, or influence it by my own caprices. Mrs. Jukes, said my master, you find you have no cause to apprehend anything. My Pamela is very placable, and as we have both been sinners together, we must both be included in one act of grace. Such an example of condescension as I have before me, Mrs. Jukes, said I, may make you very easy, for I must be highly unworthy, if I did not forgo all my little resentments, if I had any, for the sake of so much goodness to myself. You are very kind, madam, said she and you may depend upon it. I will atone for all my faults, by my future duty and respect to you, as well as to my master. That's well said on both sides, said he. But, Mrs. Jukes, to assure you that my good girl here has no malice, she chooses you to attend her in the morning at the ceremony, and you must keep up her spirits. I shall, replied she, be very proud of the honour. But I cannot, madam, but wonder to see you so very low-spirited, as you have been these two or three days past, with so much happiness before you. Why, Mrs. Jukes, answered I, there can be but one reason given, and that is, that I am a sad fool. But, indeed, I am not ungrateful neither, nor would I put on a foolish affectation. But my heart at times sinks within me. I know not why, except at my own unworthiness and because the honour done me is too high for me to support myself under, as I should do. It is an honour, Mrs. Jukes, added I, I was not born to, and no wonder, then, I behave so awkwardly. She made me a fine compliment upon it, and withdrew, repeating her promises of care, secrecy, etc. He parted from me with very great tenderness, and I came up and set to writing, to amuse my thoughts, and wrote thus far. And Mrs. Jukes being come up, and it being past twelve, I will go to bed, but not one wink, I fear, shall I get this night. I could beat myself for anger. Sure there is nothing ominous in this strange folly, but I suppose all young maidens are the same, so near, so great a change of condition, 
though they carry it off more discreetly than I. Thursday, six o'clock in the morning. I might as well have not gone to bed last night, for what sleep I had. Mrs. Jukes often was talking to me, and said several things that would have been well enough from anybody else of our sex, but the poor woman has so little purity of heart that it is all safe from her, and goes no farther than the ear. I fancy my master has not slept much neither, for I heard him up and walking about his chamber ever since break of day. To be sure, good gentleman, he must have some concern, as well as I, for here he is going to marry a poor, foolish, unworthy girl, brought up on the charity, as one may say, at least bounty, of his worthy family. And this foolish girl must be, to all intents and purposes, after twelve o'clock this day, as much his wife, as if he were to marry a duchess. And here he must stand the shocks of common reflection. The great Mr. B. has done finely, he has married his poor servant wench, will some say. The ridicule and rude jests of his equals and companions, too, he must stand, and the disdain of his relations and indignation of Lady Davers, his lofty sister. Dear good gentleman, he will have enough to do, to be sure. Oh, how shall I merit all these things at his hand? I can only do the best I can, and pray to God to reward him, and resolve to love him with a pure heart, and serve him with a sincere obedience. I hope the dear gentleman will continue to love me for this, for, alas, I have nothing else to offer. But, as I can hardly expect so great a blessing, if I can be secure from his contempt, I shall not be unfortunate, and must bear his indifference, if his rich friends should inspire him with it, and proceed with doing my duty with cheerfulness. Half an hour past eight o'clock. My good dear master, my kind friend, my generous benefactor, my worthy protector, and, oh, all the good words in one, my affectionate husband, that is soon to be. Be curbed in, my proud heart, know thyself, and be conscious of thy unworthiness, has just left me with the kindest, tenderest expressions, and gentlest behavior that ever blessed a happy maiden. He approached me with a sort of reined-in rapture. My Pamela, said he, may I just ask after your employment? Don't let me chide my dear girl this day, however. The two parsons will be here to breakfast with us at nine, and yet you are not a bit dressed. Why this absence of mind and sweet irresolution? Why, indeed, sir, said I, I will set about a reformation this instant. He saw the common prayer-book lying in the window. I hope, said he, my lovely maiden has been coning the lessons she is by and by to repeat. Have you not, Pamela? And clasped his arms about me, and kissed me. Indeed, sir, said I, I have been reading over the solemn service. And what thinks my fairest, for so he called me, of it? Oh, sir, tis very awful. It makes one shudder to reflect upon it. No wonder, said he, it should affect my sweet Pamela. I have been looking into it this morning, and I can't say, but I think it a solemn but very suitable service. But this I tell, my dear love, continued he, and again clasped me to him. There is not a tittle in it that I cannot joyfully subscribe to, and that, my dear Pamela, should make you easy and join cheerfully in it with me. I kissed his dear hand. Oh, my generous, kind protector, said I, how gracious is it! to confirm thus the doubting mind of your poor servant, which apprehends nothing so much as her own unworthiness of the honour and blessing that await her. He was pleased to say, I know well, my dearest creature, that according to the liberties we people of fortune generally give ourselves, I have promised a great deal when I say so. But I would not have said it, if, deliberately, I could not with all my heart. So banish from your mind all doubt and uneasiness, let a generous confidence in me take place, and let me see it does by your cheerfulness in this day's solemn business, and then I will love you for ever. May God Almighty, sir, said I, reward all your goodness to me. That is all I can say. But, oh, how kind it is in you to supply the want of the presence and comfortings of a dear mother, of a loving sister, or of the kind companions of my own sex, 
which most maidens have, to soothe their anxieties on the so near approach of so awful a somnity. You, sir, are all these tender relations in one to me. Your condescensions and kindness shall, if possible, embolden me to look up to you without that sweet terror that must confound poor bashful maidens on such an occasion, when they are surrendered up to a more doubtful happiness, and to half-strange men, whose good faith and good usage of them must be less experienced, and is all involved in the dark bosom of futurity, and only to be proved by the event. This, my dear Pamela, said he, is most kindly said. It shows me that you enter gratefully into my intention, for I would, by my conduct, supply all these dear relations to you, and I voluntarily promise from my heart to you what I think I could not, with such assured resolutions of performance, to the highest-born lady in the kingdom. For let me tell my sweet girl that after having been long tossed by the boisterous winds of a more culpable passion, I have now conquered it and am not so much the victim of your beauty, all charming as you are, as of your virtue, and therefore may more boldly promise for myself, having so stable a foundation for my affection, which, should this outward beauty fail, will increase with your virtue and shine forth the brighter as that is more illustriously displayed by the augmented opportunities which the condition you are now entering into will afford you. Oh, the dear charming man, how nobly, how encouragingly kind was all this! I could not suitably express myself, and he said, I see my girl is at a loss for words. I doubt not your kind acceptance of my declarations, and when I have acted too much the part of a libertine formerly, for you to look back without some anxiety, I ought not, being now happily convicted, to say less. But why loses my girl her time? I will now only add that I hope for many happy years to make good by my conduct what so willingly flows from my lips. He kissed me again and said, But whatever you do, Pamela, be cheerful, for else, maybe, of the small company we shall have, some one, not knowing how to account for your too nice modesty, will think there is some other person in the world whose addresses would be still more agreeable to you. This he said with an air of sweetness and pleasantry, but it alarmed me exceedingly, and made me resolve to appear as calm and cheerful as possible, for this was, indeed, a most affecting expression, and enough to make me, if anything can, behave as I ought and to force my idle fears to give way to hopes so much better grounded. And I began almost, on this occasion, to wish Mr. Williams were not to marry me, lest I should behave like a fool, and so be liable to an imputation which I should be most unworthy, if I deserved. So I set about dressing me instantly, and he sent Mrs. Jukes to assist me. But I am never long a dressing when I set about it, and my master has now given me a hint, that will, for half an hour more, at least, keep my spirits in a brisk circulation. Yet it concerns me a little, too, lest he should have any the least shadow of a doubt that I am not, mind and person, entirely his. And so being now ready and not called to breakfast, I sat down and wrote thus far. I might have mentioned that I dressed myself in a rich white satin nightgown that had been my good lady's, and my best head-clothes, etc., I have got such a knack of writing, that when I am by myself I cannot sit without a pen in my hand. But I am now called to breakfast. I suppose the gentlemen are come. Now, courage, Pamela! Remember thou art upon thy good behavior. Fie upon it! My heart begins to flutter again. Foolish heart, be still! Never, sure, was any maiden's perverse heart under so little command as mine. It gave itself away, at first, without my leave. It has been for weeks pressing me with its wishes, and yet now, when it should be happy itself, and make me so, it is throb, 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 like a little fool, and filling me with such unseasonable misgivings as abate the rising comforts of all my better prospects. End of section 24